Hi everyone, I'm Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to the Excel 2019 Visual Basic for Applications video course. This course is for beginning users looking to automate repetitive and recurring tasks in Microsoft Excel. VBA is Microsoft's programming language and it's built into the Office applications. Our focus during this course is on Excel specifically. You'll be equipped with the basics to start writing your own VBA code, modify the code behind macros you've already recorded, and have an understanding of how VBA lends itself to creating efficiency in your daily tasks. We'll start with the basics where you'll learn the types of things you can do with VBA versus recording macros in Excel, as well as some key terminology, which will help in your VBA journey. And you will get to edit VBA code. You'll learn the importance of macro enabled workbooks and how to save them, as well as how to modify some security settings. We'll move on to understanding the Excel object model, collections, and how to reference objects in VBA code. Once these basics are covered, you'll be ready to move on, learning about the different types of procedures, creating procedures, learning the scope of procedures, and working with methods. You'll also learn how to get VBA context-specific help from within the Visual Basic Editor. If you're enjoying these videos, please like and subscribe. If you want to earn certificates and digital badges, please become a member of our Patreon. The link is in our video description. If you have any questions you want answered by one of our instructors, please join our offsite community. The link is in the description as well. As always, if this course has exercise files, you'll find them in the video description below. In our first lesson, getting started, you're going to be learning about an overview of VBA that includes what type of language it is, why you would want to use Visual Basic for applications versus recording macros, and advantages that it can give you in terms of efficiency. We'll move into recording a macro and running it in Excel, and then we'll go into the Visual Basic Editor environment and you'll get an overview of the environment before we start editing a macro in VBA. You'll learn how to save a macro enabled workbook and the importance of doing so. You'll learn a little bit about macro security. Now in this lesson, we're gonna be using two files that are in the video description. They're both Excel files. One is named vehicles and the other one vehicles two. We will be creating a vehicles macro enabled workbook during this lesson. And the name of that workbook is shown on the slide. You will not find it in the video description at this time. So what you would wanna do is grab those two Excel files, vehicles and vehicles two from the video description and put them somewhere on your system where you have easy access to them. Before we get hands on, let's go ahead and get an overview of VBA. So as mentioned in the introduction, VBA is a Microsoft programming language that is currently built into the Excel, Word, PowerPoint, Outlook, and Access applications. It's one of the many programming languages that evolved from the basic programming language, which was developed in the 1960s. It was first released in Excel 5, and that was in the Office 1995 suite. Since then, it evolved to encompass the applications that are mentioned in this slide. VBA is known as an object-oriented programming language, OOP. This means that everything within an application is an object, including the application itself. Objects have their own set of features and uses known as properties and methods, respectively. Here's an example of object-oriented programming. So the example using Excel would be that Excel is an object that contains other objects. For example, cells, worksheets, charts, pivot tables, shapes, etc. Each object has its own properties. For example, a worksheet has a name. 
a workbook can be opened and closed. And these are a couple of a workbook's methods. So methods are like actions. You will work with objects and manipulate them via their properties and methods throughout this course. So why VBA? It can give you the ability to run macros automatically, create user-defined functions, which can be used in the Excel application. You can use VBA to control other office applications and mostly to automate recurring and repetitive tasks. Don't get me wrong, the power of macros is excellent in Excel, but VBA does have some advantages. So for example, there are no limitations. When you're recording macros, you are limited to those tasks that you can perform in the Excel interface. With VBA, you can attach code to events, so that it runs automatically when the event occurs. For example, activating a worksheet would be an event. VBA allows for decision-making and it has several decision-making structures ensuring code only runs when certain conditions are met. The looping structures in VBA ensure code runs multiple times based on a condition. And then there's forms and boxes. You can use VBA to create user input forms, dialog boxes, and message boxes in Excel. So we're gonna get started. I have the vehicles Excel file open from the video description. And we are going to be recording a macro in this file. Now, the thing is, we want to prepare Excel for recording a macro. There are several ways that you can start a macro recording, but we want to add the developer tab to the ribbon, as that is one of the ways that you can record your macros, review your macros, so on and so forth. So the first thing we're going to do is right click on any ribbon tab, home, insert, page layout, whatever, And when you right click on a ribbon tab, you're going to choose customize the ribbon. In the customize the ribbon options box on the right side, everything that has a check mark is a tab that's showing on your ribbon. We want to check the box in front of developer. And then at the bottom, you're going to click OK. And now you have the developer tab on your ribbon. And let's navigate to that tab. So for parts of this course, we're going to be using this make believe vehicle information. So we have make believe VIN numbers, we have year, we have make model classification, color, dealer cost, and manufacturer suggested retail price columns in here. And we're going to record a macro that is going to apply the column headings and also a little bit of formatting. So on the developer tab of the ribbon, in the first group, the code group, you're gonna click on the record macro button. And don't worry, it's not gonna be recording until after we clear the dialog box. So when you click that button, the record macro dialog box opens and you have to give your macro a name. Well, you don't want your macros to have generic names, so make them as descriptive as possible. Now, of course, there are rules to naming macros. Macro names must begin with a letter, can be alphanumeric, and can contain the underscore character, no spaces. So we're gonna name this macro capital A add capital F formatting all mushed together. So it follows the naming convention. We're not gonna assign a shortcut key to the macro to make it run later. We don't need to do that here. And you have choices as to where the macro is going to be stored. So by default, it's gonna just be in this workbook, the file that it's going to be recorded in, this workbook. Your other choices are a new workbook 
or your personal macro workbook. If you store it in the personal macro workbook, that workbook opens in the background every time you open Excel. And so the macro is available to any and all Excel files. We're gonna leave it on this workbook and there's another way that you can access it from another file that you'll see a little bit later. I like to add a description to a macro so that if anyone comes behind me and they need information about what the macro is going to do, the description will cover that. So we're gonna type in a description box, add column headers, comma, bold and centered, period, apply accounting format to column G, period, auto fit columns A through H. So that is the intent of the macro that we're going to record. So at this point, once we click OK, everything we do until we stop the recording is going to be recorded. And I like to say this, while you're recording the macro, if you make a mistake and you correct the mistake, you don't have to start all over again because it's recording both the mistake and the correction. So go ahead and click OK. You'll notice on the developer tab now, where it used to say record macro, we now have our stop recording icon there. And we'll use that when we're completely done going through all the steps that we're saving in our macro. So for right now, the first thing that we want to do here is right click on row heading one and choose insert. So we get a blank row, a new row one, and that's the row that we're gonna be adding our column headers in. And so we're gonna click in cell A1 and we're gonna type VIN, V-I-N, and I'm doing it in all capital letters for so vehicle identification number. I'm gonna press my tab key to get over to B1 and I'm gonna type year, tab, make, tab, model, tab again, classification. The next one is color. The next one is dealer, cost, two separate words. And lastly, in all caps, MSRP for manufacturer's suggested retail price. After that one, I'm gonna just press enter. So we have our headers in where they need to be. And then we're gonna select row heading one again. And we're gonna go to the home tab of the ribbon. In the font group, we're gonna make it bold. And in the paragraph group, we're gonna use the center alignment button. So the headers are centered within their cells. Now, we're also gonna add in adjusting column width in here, so don't worry about that right now. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna select column G by clicking on its column heading. So the entire column is selected. And on the home tab in the number group, we're gonna click on the dollar sign for the accounting number format. And then the last thing we're gonna do is we are gonna select column headings A through H and I just clicked on A and dragged across. And we want to auto fit these columns width, right? So that's what we wanna do. We wanna auto fit. And we do that by going to the cells group over to the right on the home tab of the ribbon. And in the cells group, you're gonna select the format drop down. And from that drop down, you're gonna select auto fit column width. So now every column is wide enough to display everything in the column. And if we were to make entries and they were wider than what they are now, it would automatically adjust the column width. Now, typically 
when I'm done recording my macro, before I click stop recording, I just like to click on any blank cell just to make sure that nothing is selected. We're gonna go back to the developer tab and choose stop recording in the code group. Typically, you cannot undo the effects of a macro. So we just recorded this macro. While we were recording it, we were doing the steps. Now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to press Control Z, which is undo. And the only thing it undid was the column auto width. Everything else, our headings are there. They're bold and centered. We have our accounting format and column G and it just undid the column auto fit. So we want to redo that step. So we're going to do, do control Y, which is redo. And we end up again with the result of our macro. You will learn some workarounds for undoing the effects of a macro later on. But for right now, we want to test this macro on a different sheet. So we're on the inventory sheet tab in this file. We have two other sheets. Let's go to sheet two. Sheet two has the same data that was on sheet one initially when we came in here. And this is a good sheet to test our macro on. So we can go on the developer tab in the code group. This is where you can use the macros button to access any macros that you may have in this file. So we're going to click on macros and we only have one add formatting. It's already selected. And on the right side, you're going to click the run button. So at the end of the day, you should have those column headings. They should be centered and bolded and the auto width, the column auto width is in effect and you have the accounting number format in column G. So while we were recording our macro, it was generating Visual Basic code in the background, Visual Basic for Applications code in the background. Now on the Developer tab, we can get to Visual Basic. You will learn other ways of starting macro recording without using the Developer tab. You'll learn shortcuts throughout the course on how to switch back and forth between Visual Basic for Applications and the Excel interface. But for right now, on the Developer tab, the first button in the code group is Visual Basic. Let's go ahead and click on it. Visual Basic for Application opens in its own separate window. And so you literally have this window and your Excel window open at the same time. And we're just going to focus on the VBA window right now. And so before we get started in here, we're ultimately going to edit the code behind the macro we just recorded. But I just want you to get acclimated to this environment. This is known as the Visual Basic Editor or VBE. Just so you know, um, it doesn't have a ribbon interface. It never updated. It still has the old school menu bar where you have file edit view and everything. And then underneath it, it has some toolbars that we use. This was like pre ribbon days, how Excel itself and all the other office applications used to be on the left side of your screen. You may have two different panels open. You have a project Explorer window at the top and a properties window at the bottom. If you don't have both of those panes showing, you can go up to the view menu and you can click on project Explorer and then come back to view and click on properties window. And you can see the shortcut keys for both of them, or you could do control R to bring up project Explorer and F four to bring up the properties window. Let's talk about the project Explorer window first. For every Excel file that you have open, you will have a separate project. So right now I only have one Excel file open. It's the vehicles.xlsx file. So it creates its own VBA project 
and it has the name of the file afterwards. Now I may have a few things here because I have some add-ins that create projects as well. Um, if you don't have them, you're fine. But this is a cautionary tale here because there have been times when I've had like five Excel files open and I find myself doing some coding and then I look and see that I'm doing it in the wrong files project. So I can always cut and paste it to the right project. But you do want to be aware of what project you're working in. When you click on VBA project vehicles.xlsx, it expands and you can look up at the title bar and it lets you know that it is in that project now. So just kind of get in the habit of making sure you're in the right project. It has two folders in that project, Microsoft Excel objects. Those are your sheet tabs. So we had the inventory sheet, we had a sheet two and a sheet three, and then the entire workbook is an object as well. So it lists that. Then you have another folder called modules. That folder was created when we started recording our macro. Actually, when we finished recording our macro, it created that modules folder. Your code is stored in modules. So expand the modules folder and it created a default module. It names it module one. And if we were to go back over to Excel now and record another macro, it would also put it in module one. If we were to close Excel, saving it properly, and then reopen it and start recording a macro, it would create module two. It would always give it the next number, module two, module three. You can also rename modules in here, which you'll see in a little bit. So if you click on module one, you will actually see the code window and that is everything that it created while we were recording our macro. So it converted our steps into VBA code. And we're gonna edit this in just a little bit, but I want you to have your editor window be as comfortable an environment for you to be working in. So one of the things we're gonna do is we're gonna go up to the tools menu and click on options. We will revisit some of these settings later in the course, but when you go into options, you have four tabs, editor, editor format, general, and docking. One thing, one setting that I want to make sure that you have checked, well, like make sure all of the code settings have a check mark in front of them. And as we work in the course, I'll explain what these settings mean. Your window settings, you can actually have all of those checked as well. Go to the editor format tab. And this is where you can set your font size. So I have my font set to 14 point, which is comfortable for me. I can bump it up to 16. And then at the bottom, I'm gonna click OK. So font size, and if you wanna go back in and change the font, I'm cool with the code looking font, courier font. Um, that works for me, I'm just so comfortable with it, it doesn't bother me. So I just wanted you to know that you can change some of those settings in the environment for yourself. And for the ones that we are gonna be utilizing in the course, we'll go back in there and talk about what those settings are actually doing. The other thing we want to customize before we edit our code is we wanna add three icons to the toolbar that we'll be using frequently throughout this course. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just right click in a blank area of any toolbar and go to customize. And the customize dialog box opens. You wanna make sure you're on the commands tab at the top, and then you'll see a list of categories that mimic the menus that are up there, file, edit, view, insert. So basically you're gonna to have to tell it where it resides on the menu in order to add it to your toolbar. So under categories, we're gonna select edit, and then all the commands from the edit menu show on the right side of your screen. And on the right side of your screen, you're gonna scroll down. 
we're looking for two commands. The first one is comment block, and the second is uncomment block. So what I'm gonna do when I find comment block, I'm gonna click and hold on it, and I'm gonna drag it right after the question mark on my toolbar. And then I'm gonna grab uncomment block and drag it right after comment block. Now we have one more command that we're gonna add up there. Under categories, we're gonna click on debug, and the command at the top of the list is compile project. I'm gonna grab that and drag it right after uncomment block. So I have comment block, uncomment block, and compile project. When we get ready to use those commands, I will explain what they're gonna do for us. They're gonna be kind of helpers for you. Let's examine the code that was generated while we were recording our macro. First of all, let's look at the information starting from the top. We'll talk about the option explicit statement a little bit later in the course. Don't worry about that right now. What I want you to focus on is the name of our code, add formatting. It comes after the word sub. And you'll notice that both option explicit and sub are in blue. That means those are visual basic for application keywords. They mean a specific thing in this code and should only be used for their intended purpose. It creates what's called a sub procedure to contain our code. So it starts with the sub statement and if you scroll down at the very bottom, it concludes with an end sub statement. You have to have both. If you have a sub and not an end sub, you're gonna get an error message. But it did this automatically while we were recording our macro. It gave it the name that we named it, add formatting, and then after it, it put a set of parentheses. Some procedures, have parameters that need to be defined. And that would happen inside the parentheses. We're not there yet, but that's why they're there and they need to be there. Then you'll notice several lines that are in green beginning with apostrophes. Those are comment lines. So when we were filling out the record macro dialog box, right? We named it add formatting and we put a description in, add column headers, bold and centered, apply accounting format, blah, blah, blah. Comments are meant to describe your code. It's a good idea to comment your code liberally. I've written code before and didn't comment it, and six months later, I had to figure out what the intent of the code that I wrote was. So comments are really good. And so when you put a description in the record macro box, it comes in as comments, they're informational. When you run your code or execute your code, the comments do not execute. And we can do a little bit of cleanup there. Um, we don't need that blank apostrophe at the top, so I'm gonna just delete it. And then I'm gonna delete the two underneath because they're not necessary either. And then it starts our code. Well, the first thing we did is we right clicked on row one and inserted a new row. So that's rows one colon one dot select and then selection dot insert, right? And so it moved everything, it shifted everything down and gave us the blank row at the top. And then we clicked in cell A1 and we typed a VIN. So that's range, even though it's a cell, range a one dot select. Notice the quote, the double quotes inside the parentheses there surrounding A1. And an active cell, which is now cell A1, don't worry about formula R1C1 right now, but active cell dot formula R1C1 equals whatever we typed in that cell. Then B1, C1, D1, E1, F1, G1, H1, same thing. And then we selected row one again. So at this point, we're all the way down here in the code. 
when we selected row one again, and once we selected it, we made it bold. So before that, selection.font.bold would equal false. When we made it bold, it changed the false to true. And then you have what's known as a with end with block. Starts with the word with, and if you go down several rows, it ends with an end with statement. And this is an interesting thing. You'll learn more. It's known as a construct, right? You'll learn more about this construct as we go in the course. But this allows you anything that you do in the paragraph group on the home tab is included in this with block. Bold is not in the paragraph group on the Excel ribbon, right? But your alignments are, the ability to wrap text, your orientation, whether you're gonna indent, merging cells, all of that is included in the paragraph group on the home tab in Excel. So all of these settings here are those things that mimic the paragraph group. And what we did is we centered those headings. So what happened is when we did that, the dot horizontal alignment equals Excel center. It was changed from Excel left because typically things are left aligned in a cell. So all of these other settings are the default settings. The only thing that changed was Excel Center. One of the things you, you want in your code is for it to be as concise as possible. We don't need everything that's in that width block. We, we really would just keep the horizontal and vertical alignment, but we didn't do any wrap text orientation, indenting, any of that kind of stuff. So we're gonna select the lines from wrap text all the way down to the dot merge cells equals false statement. We need to leave that end with statement underneath that. So once you have dot wrap text through dot merge cells lines selected, go ahead and press delete. And then I'm a little OCD, so I'm gonna shift tab to get the end with statement back in line with the with statement. So if I have to troubleshoot code, I want to make sure that I can see with and end with at the same margin, if that makes sense. And when we start putting our code together, I'll be walking you through how it should be formulated. So when we were recording our macro, we formatted column G as currency. Column G is the dealer cost column, and we should have formatted the manufacturer's suggested retail price column, column H, well, it says currency in here, but it's actually accounting, okay? So we want both of those columns to be formatted in accounting. Underneath your end with statements, you'll see columns, and then in parentheses and double quotes, G colon G dot select. The second G, you're gonna change to an H. So now we're telling it when this macro runs, select both of those columns and apply the format on both of those columns. And that's what we want to do. And then we have where we selected columns A through H and we did our columns auto fit. And then I said, at the end, before we stop recording, click on any blank cell. Whatever cell you clicked on, it will say range and then in parentheses and double quotes, that cell dot select. We're gonna change whatever that cell is, that cell reference, we want it to be A1. And so we just modified the code that was generated for our macros. Now we're just going to modify our comment, our second comment line here to make it accurate. So apply accounting format to columns, we're gonna make that plural, columns G and then and H. And when you move away from that line, it will turn green again, indicating that it's a comment.
now that we've edited our code, and we'll test it shortly, um, we want to change the name of module one. You want your module names to be as descriptive as possible. Um, it's kind of like folders that you're organizing your code in. So we're gonna have several modules throughout this course and we don't want them to be module one, module two, module three, module four. So we're gonna use the properties window to make some changes to properties. So we're gonna start with renaming module one. In your Project Explorer window, click on Module 1. And then if you look down at your Properties window, it says Properties for Module 1, the object that we have selected. And the only property a module has is the name property. So if you double click on Name, it highlights Module 1 for you. And we're going to talk about a prefix that we're going to use here. To identify it in a list as a module, we're gonna use lowercase mod, M-O-D, to indicate that it is a module. And then we're gonna give it its name, and that's gonna be capital F and the rest of the word first. So mod first. If we're looking at a bunch of stuff in a list, we'll know that it's a module because it has that three character prefix of mod. And then when you press enter, you'll notice that it updated the name of the module in the Project Explorer window. You can change the names of sheet tabs in here as well. So in your Project Explorer, you have that Microsoft Excel objects folder where you're seeing your three sheet tabs. We have one and it's called sheet one and then in parentheses inventory. Sheet one is how Excel knows that sheet. Inventory is what it was renamed to, but the system identifies it as sheet one. And then we have sheet two and we have sheet three. We're gonna click on sheet three and in the properties window, you'll notice that there are two name properties. The one at the top is indicative of the system name, right? So what Excel knows is that name is the name property at the top. My arrow got a little skewed there. And then you have a name property lower down in your properties window. And the one that's lower down is whatever you decide to name that sheet. So the second name property, the one that is not in parentheses, you can double click right on name and it selects sheet three. And we're gonna type new vehicles, two separate words, just like you would do it in Excel if you were renaming the sheet tab and press enter. So notice in your Project Explorer now, you have your sheet one, which had already been renamed to inventory, sheet three, which we just named new vehicles. We added the compile project icon to our toolbar and what that does is it kind of goes through your code for you and it checks to make sure that everything is okay. If there's a problem, it will let you know by highlighting that problem. So what we're gonna do is make sure you're clicked anywhere between your sub and in sub statements. You can be anywhere between those two statements and go up to your toolbar and find your compile VBA project icon that we added there and just give it a click and it dims out and you didn't get any notifications of anything wrong. So your code is good. Good habit to get into, good icon to have on your toolbar. So now that we've modified our code, we wanna save this file. And if you look up at the top, you know, your title bar, it's vehicles.xlsx, the standard four character Excel workbook extension. If we don't save this file in the right way, it's as if we didn't record a macro and we wouldn't have any VBA code in it. So you have to save it as a macro enabled workbook. As a matter of fact, let's check this out. On the toolbar, you have a save button and notice when you hover over it, it wants to save the file. 
go ahead and click on that save icon. And you get this pop-up message that says, the following features cannot be saved in macro free workbooks. And then it says VB project. That's your visual basic project to save a file with your code in it. Click no, and then choose a macro enabled file type to continue saving as a macro free workbook. Click yes. We are going to click no. When you click no, it gives you the save as dialog box. Now we're going to leave the same name vehicles, but we need to change the type right underneath the file name where it says save as type, click on Excel workbook. And we want the second choice Excel macro enabled workbook. Again, if we just save this as a regular Excel file, it's not going to keep your code. So we need it to be macro enabled. And part of that is for your security, which I'll explain in just a few moments. And after we have it set as Excel macro enabled workbook, we're going to go ahead and click save. So now if you look up at the title bar, it has a different extension dot XLSM. That's your macro enabled Excel workbook extension. And so it will retain our code. And now that we've saved it as macro enabled, we're going to switch over to Excel to test our edited code. There's a couple of ways that you can switch over to Excel, um, back and forth between Excel and visual basic. First of all, and I'm not going to use this way, but the first button on the toolbar is Excel. So I can use that to switch back over to Excel. I'm a real shortcut key person. So alt F 11 will also switch me back and forth between Excel and the visual basic editor. So I can just keep doing alt F 11 and you see that it switches back and forth between the two separate application windows that are open. When I am back in Excel, I'm going to do control O to get the open dialog box to display. So this is where we're going to open the vehicles to file. And by the way, if you look at my screen, we have two files. We have vehicles and vehicles too, right? We have two versions of vehicles. I'm pointing to the macro enabled worksheet. And then we have our original one, which is just a regular Excel file. And if you look closely, the icons are slightly different. The macro enabled worksheet icon has an extra little thing in its lower right hand corner than the other regular Excel icons. So we want to open the vehicles to Excel workbook. And so we have two Excel files open. We have our macro enabled vehicles and we have vehicles too. Earlier when we went to record our macro, I said, if you save your macro in the personal macro workbook, it opens behind the scenes every time you open any file in Excel. This is a workaround. We save that macro in the vehicles file, but we can use it in vehicles too, as long as the vehicles.xlsm file is open. I don't typically save in the personal macro workbook. There are occasions that I do that if I'm going to use it across a wide range of files, but typically my files are structured so differently that macros from one won't work well with others. So what we're going to do here is we want to use the macro that we recorded, the add formatting macro. We want to use it in this file. Another way of getting to your macros instead of going to the developer tab is you can go to the view tab of the ribbon and all the way to the right. The last button is macros. So check this out. If I do the drop down arrow under macros, I can view or record them. Um, and I'm going to just go to view macros. Notice that it gives the file name exclamation point, and then the name of the macro that vehicles.xlsm file has to be open and it's showing you macros in all open workbooks. If we did the drop down and we choose this workbook, right? 
it's showing there as well because the other one's open so you can access it. But it really resides in that other file, vehicles, the macro enabled vehicles file. And so we're going to just click on vehicles, XLSM, exclamation point, add formatting and choose run. So you'll notice that it gave us our headings. They're centered and bolded. Notice one of the changes we made is we had it do the accounting format on the MSRP column, right? So that worked. We also cleaned up some comments and stuff in there as well. So you will see that if you have the file that contains the macro open, you can access it from other Excel files that you open. Also notice that the active cell is cell A1 because we changed that as well. We're going to close this vehicles two file without saving any changes to it. So I'm going to just close that file when it prompts me, I'm going to say, don't save the changes. And I still have my macro enabled vehicles file open. So in our macro enabled vehicles file, first take a note, look at your um, sheet tabs. So we renamed sheet three new vehicles and that's what shows on the sheet down there. We did that in the properties window in the visual basic editor. So another change that we made in there that you're seeing in here. And I mentioned earlier and we saw that you can't really undo the effects of a macro. When we tried to do it, it didn't really undo it. It only undid the column auto fit, right? So we saw that. But I said that there is a workaround. Like, let's say on this sheet two, right, that we wanted to test the macro. And it's already been run, so we certainly don't want it to put another row in here, right, at the top. So on sheet two, what I'm going to have you do is just delete row one. So I'm just right clicking on the row header and choosing delete. And now I'm going to go to the view tab, drop down, view my macros, and I'm going to rerun this macro. So it puts the headings back in, right? We see that we have the currency format on or accounting format on the columns G and H and it put us in cell A1. So you would have to kind of manually delete the effects of a macro to rerun it on a sheet like that. We're going to go ahead and right click on the sheet to sheet tab and we want to delete sheet two and confirm the deletion. So now we have two sheets. In this macro enabled file, we have our inventory sheet and we have our blank for right now, new vehicle sheet. Let's go ahead and save and close this vehicles file. Now we're going to explore what happens when you open a file that is macro enabled. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just relaunch Excel and go to open and navigate to wherever you saved your macro enabled vehicles file. And when you're there, you can go ahead and select the vehicles macro enabled file. I'm gonna just double click on it here and open it. Now, because it's macro enabled, you're gonna get the yellow band underneath the ribbon that says security warning, macros have been disabled. And then there's an enable content button. Microsoft does this by default. That's the default security settings for a file that contains macros that has been saved as macro enabled. And it's to kind of protect you. So if you receive a file from an unknown source, you probably do not want to enable the content. It's not the typical way of delivering viruses to computers anymore, but it used to be delivered via macros that were infected via viruses. So if it's from a trusted source, you can go ahead and enable the content, which we're going to do. Now, 
that can be annoying if you're working with a lot of macro enabled files and you know the people that are creating them, maybe your colleagues, yourself, you all work in teams or something like that. So we're going to modify a trust center setting and uh, you'll see how this works. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the file tab and all the way at the bottom on the left, you're going to go to options. On the left side of Excel options at the bottom, you're going to click on trust center. And then on the right, you're going to click on trust center settings. So the first thing I want you to see here is on the left side, click on macro settings. So the default setting is to disable VBA macros with notification. That's what the yellow band that we got. And I wouldn't suggest changing that. What you can do to make it a little bit more convenient and you don't get that yellow band when you're, you know, using files back and forth amongst your teammates or colleagues is we can set either trusted documents on the left or trusted locations. I always do trusted locations. Um, it's more global than trusted documents. So click on trusted locations and I'll tell you um, how this works, right? So. I set up a folder on my desktop. It's called files for video description. And it's where I've stored all the files that we're going to be using during this course. And I want to set that as a trusted location. So any of the macro enabled file formats that we're going to be using during this course, that folder and it's any subfolders will be a trusted location. So what I'm going to do underneath here is I'm going to click on add new location toward the bottom right. And then I have to navigate to that location. So I'm going to just do that. I know it's on my desktop. So you're navigating to wherever you put the files that you're going to be using. So the folder name for me is files for video description. And I'm going to click OK. And then I'm going to say subfolders of this location are also trusted. So any folders within that folder would also be trusted. And then I'm going to click OK. And once I do that, it shows up in this list of trusted locations. So it could be a shared network drive. If you're all of your files that you and your team are working together on are in a specific shared network drive, you can use that as a trusted location so that you don't get the yellow warning and have to enable content. At the bottom, we're going to click OK. And then let's close and reopen this vehicle's macro enabled file. So when I open it, it's in a trusted location now, so I don't get the yellow banner under the ribbon. I don't have to enable content and I didn't disable the default trust center setting. So that's still in place, but this file is now in a trusted location. So I'm able to open it with no problems. Just to recap what we covered in this introductory lesson one, um, the getting started section, we reviewed what you can do with Visual Basic for applications. You learned that it is an object-oriented programming language that is part of the Microsoft Office suite. You learned that it's the code that is produced in the background when you record a macro. You also learned the advantages of Visual Basic for applications over recording macros. We moved into customizing the ribbon to add the developer tab, and we recorded a macro in Excel that added and formatted column headings on a worksheet. We then toured the Visual Basic Editor environment, and were able to edit the VBA code produced by our recorded macro. We also changed some VBE settings, including font size, and we saved a macro-enabled file. You tested your edited macro and lastly, modified some trust center security settings by adding a trusted location. You also understand the importance of saving a macro enabled workbook 
or else all of your work would be lost. Before we get hands-on again in Lesson 3, we need to go over some background information. And I should mention at this point that this slide deck is also in the video description and you can use it for your future reference. No one is expecting you to memorize all of these things. So we need to talk about the Excel object model. You need to understand collections and how to reference objects and also how to simplify object references. You learned that VBA is an object-oriented programming language, OOP. And we discussed that that means that Excel is an object that contains objects. Objects that have attributes known as properties can be manipulated through VBA. And objects also have methods, which are actions that can be performed on them via VBA. So this is a foundational lesson here. And again, you'll be able to reference this slide deck. So the Excel object model hierarchy is a hierarchical structure of Excel and all its objects with Excel, the application residing at the top of the hierarchy. So you can see on this slide that we have the application at the top of the hierarchy here on the left. And then underneath the application, you would have add in objects, window objects, workbook objects. And then we expand on the workbook object. A workbook object has a name, a visual basic project. A workbook also contains worksheets. Worksheets can contain comments, hyperlinks, names, ranges, and pivot tables, for example. So a simplistic example is over on the right where you have Excel the application, which is an object at the top of the hierarchy. Then you have a workbook. A worksheet is an object of a workbook and a range is an object of a worksheet. And you're, you're going to be seeing this as we're working in this video course. The next thing you need to understand are collections. Now collections are key in VBA programming. A collection is simply a group of objects of the same type. A collection is also an object. Collections are useful when you need to work with not just one worksheet, but with a couple of them or all of them. You'll learn later that your VBA code can loop through all members of a collection and do something to each one. We have a table that shows the collections, the most commonly used collections in Visual Basic. So you have the workbooks collection and it would be all currently open workbook objects. So all currently open cell files are part of the workbooks collection. You have a worksheets collection and it's a collection of all worksheets contained in a particular workbook. The charts collection is a collection of all chart objects. So these are Excel worksheets that only have charts on them. A collection of all chart objects contained in a particular workbook object. A chart sheet is not part of the worksheets collection as it is not considered a worksheet. It is in fact a worksheet, but it only has a chart on it. And then you have the sheets collection, plural, a collection of all worksheet objects contained in a particular workbook object. So you have a worksheets collection and then you have a sheets collection. What is the difference? The sheets collection contains all worksheets and all chart sheets. Whereas the worksheets collection is just all of the worksheets. And then the charts collection is just all of the chart sheets. The sheets collection combines them all. So 
you can reference these things sometimes across different collections, as you will see when we resume with our hands-on stuff. In order to access the objects that you want to reference in your code, you're going to have to learn how to reference them. So you can work with an entire collection quite easily, but it's most often the case that you'll need to work with a particular object in a collection. For example, if you need to work with a particular worksheet, you'll need to know how to reference it. When it comes to referring to an object in a collection, you can either use its name or its index number. To reference a single object from a collection, you put the item's name or index number in parentheses after the name of the collection. So you have two examples on this slide that refer to the exact same object, the first worksheet in the workbook. So worksheets, and then in parentheses and double quote, sheet one by name, or worksheets, and in parentheses one by index number. When you refer to an object by its name, the name must be enclosed in quotes. When referring to an object by its index number, you need to know that the first object in the collection has the index number of one. Using a workbook with three worksheets as an example, sheet one has an index number of one, sheet two would be two, and sheet three's index number would be three. And index numbers are not enclosed in quotes. We're going to spend a few slides on referencing objects. So each worksheet in the worksheets collection is an object in two collections, which we mentioned already, worksheets and sheets. Each chart sheet is an object in two collections, charts and sheets. So there's another example of how to refer to sheet one. You could use the sheets collection instead of the worksheets collection. Like a typical office application, you get several ways of referring to the same object. You know, there's multiple ways of getting the same thing done in Excel. And along the way, you'll find a way that works best for you, although I do have some suggestions. So all Excel objects are under the application object in the hierarchy. Remember, Excel, the application, is at the top of the hierarchy. You access these objects by moving down the hierarchy and connecting each object with the dot operator. You can even access the value of a particular cell on the worksheet by using the range object. And you saw that when we reviewed our code. There is no cell object in VBA, really. It would be the range object even with one element. And here are additional examples on this slide of object references. So referring to a specific workbook, application dot workbooks, and then in parentheses and double quotes, the name of the workbook, including its extension. And then a specific worksheet in the workbook. If you're using the entire hierarchy, application dot workbooks, the name of the workbook, and then dot worksheets one, the first sheet. Referring to the value of a cell, your application dot workbooks, name dot worksheets one dot range a one dot value. The last example is known as a fully qualified reference. It specifically refers to all the objects in the hierarchy from application down to range. So again, you have this PowerPoint in your video description for future reference. Now I'm going to tell you about simplifying object references. You want it to be as concise as possible. And I, I mentioned that earlier. It's easier to write and easier to troubleshoot should there be any issues. So Visual Basic for applications can assume some of the object references for you. For example, it assumes that the workbooks collection is within the application object. And that means that you don't have to reference that object in most cases. Another example here is that if you only have one workbook open, one Excel file open, it is the only one in the collection. 
So VBA assumes it is the active workbook and you don't have to reference the workbook's collection. If the first worksheet is the active sheet in the workbook, you don't have to reference the worksheets collection as VBA will assume it. So I'm gonna go over these examples. The code that refers to the value of a cell, so starting with the application, application.workbooks, the name of the workbook in parentheses and double quotes, dot worksheets one by index number, dot range a one dot value. If VBA is assuming the application object, it would just start with workbooks and the name of the workbook, so on and so forth. If it's the only open Excel file, it will assume the workbooks object. So you can just start with worksheets. And if the first sheet is the active sheet, all you would have to reference is range a one dot value. And so the last example is the most concise and therefore preferable. You don't want to have to type all of this line unless you just like to type like that. My arrow drawing is getting horrible here, but you don't have to type all of that. Why would you wanna type all of that? Maybe fat finger to keyboard, whatever set of circumstances could happen when all you would have to type would be this. And also if someone is coming behind you or if you have to troubleshoot the code, this is a lot more difficult to troubleshoot because it has more on this line than the last and preferable example. Now that we've gained an understanding of the Excel object model hierarchy, collections, and how to reference objects, we're ready to dive into lesson three, which is working with procedures and functions. Previously, you were introduced to modules and sub procedures when we edited the VBA code that was generated by the macro we recorded. You're going to get more in-depth knowledge on those two topics during this lesson. So we're going to start by doing a deeper dive into modules and then procedures. Then we are going to move on to creating a standard module as well as creating a sub procedure. You'll learn different methods of executing procedures or running them, including how to call procedures in this lesson. Then we're gonna create a function procedure and we're gonna use the immediate window within the Visual Basic Editor to run it. You're gonna learn how to get context sensitive help within the Visual Basic Editor, which is really cool. We're going to use the vehicle's macro enable file that we created, as well as another file in the video description. And it's another Excel file named received vehicles. Those two files need to be in the same directory for this lesson. You saw earlier that when we recorded a macro, VBA created a module to store the Visual Basic code in. And so we discussed how a module is a container of sorts that stores your VBA code. Well, there are two different types of modules. There are class modules, which allow you to create your own objects. And we'll begin using class modules when we get to lesson seven. And then there's standard modules, one of which you already saw, and it uses the application objects. We also discussed that our code was put in a procedure. Specifically in our case, it was a sub procedure, began with the sub statement and ended with the in sub statement. So a procedure tells the application what to do as it defines a specific task. Specifically, it's a named group of statements that are run as a unit. For example, a block of code. A sub procedure defines specific tasks, like our add formatting sub procedure. It told the application what to do. So insert a new row and then we typed in the headers, that kind of thing. 
When responding to events, you'll learn about these later, they can be known as event procedures. There are also function procedures, and you'll be introduced to creating function procedures during this lesson. A function procedure actually returns a value. Property procedures are outside of the scope of this course, but they exist. And there are a series of statements that allow a programmer to create and manipulate custom properties. For example, read-only properties for forms. Before we dive in, we're going to go over the naming rules and conventions for procedures. Now, the rules cannot be broken. Conventions are suggestions, but just so you're aware of them, you need to know what they are. And I use conventions as well as the rules. So if you inherit an Excel macro enabled workbook and you're looking at somebody else's code, they may be using the conventions. So anyway, let's go over this and then we'll get hands on and learn more about procedures and modules by recording another macro. So when we're naming procedures, the name may be up to 255 characters. It can be alphanumeric. The first character must be a letter. You can't use any spaces or any of the special characters listed on the slide. And the names must be unique within a module. So you can't have to add formatting sub procedures within the same module. It will disallow it. You just can't do it. And then the conventions begin the names with a verb. Use proper case for each word within the name. When two or more procedures are related, place the words that vary at the end. And there are some examples. So you could name a procedure, close workbook, get new inventory, get selected date begin, and get selected date end. So if you're looking at these in a list, the ones that have the words that vary at the end would still be all together in the list. So you know that they're related procedures. I'm back in the vehicles macro enabled file that we created earlier. And I'm gonna switch to the new vehicles sheet tab. Now we're gonna record a macro again to get this lesson started. And along the way and going forward beyond this lesson, whether we're recording macros or we're writing VBA code from scratch, we're also going to be using properties and we're going to be using methods. Now you saw properties. We use properties to change the name of a module. We use properties to change the name of this particular sheet tab. And a method is an action that is taken on an object. So you'll learn how to access methods along the way as well. And I want to show you another way of starting a macro recording without accessing the ribbon. So I'd like to direct your attention to your status bar and it's at the very bottom underneath your sheet tabs of your Excel screen. So the area all the way at the bottom. Now it starts with ready. You may or may not have numlock and some of the other stuff that I have on my status bar, but in particular, I'm interested in making sure that you have this icon. I don't know, it looks like a spreadsheet with a little camera on it in a way. And if you don't have it, I'm gonna show you how to get it down there. You can right click in a blank area of the status bar and you get the customized status bar menu. And notice that a lot of the things on my customized menu are already checked, which means they will show in my status bar as appropriate. So for example, caps lock and num lock. My num lock is on and that's why it's showing down in the status bar. My caps lock is currently not being held down. I'm not enabling caps lock on my keyboard, I should say. So that one is not showing there. But were I to enable it, it would show in my status bar. The setting that we're interested in having you have down there is macro recording. That's that icon. So if it doesn't have a check mark in front of it, 
and you click on it, it will check it. If it does and you click on it, it unchecks it like it just did on mine. So I'll click on it again. And then you just click on any blank cell. You want to make sure you're in cell A1 before we start recording this macro. And what we're going to do is we're going to go down to that icon in our status bar. That looks like a spreadsheet with a, looks like a camera lens to me. But if you hover over it, it says no macros are currently recording. Click to begin recording a new macro. And we're going to do just that. And it gives us our record macro dialog box. So you could start this process from the developer tab, or you can start it from that icon on your status bar. Now for this macro, we want to name it using our rules and conventions. So we're going to start with a verb, capital G, get, capital N, new, capital V, vehicles. So remember, you can't have spaces. You could use the underscore character, but I prefer to just use this convention. We're not going to use a shortcut key. We're going to store it in this workbook and we're going to click in the description box and we're going to type copy and paste data from the received vehicles file. And again, it, once we click OK, it's ready to follow our instructions. So go ahead and click OK. Notice that the icon on your status bar now looks different and it looks like a stop button. And if you hover over it, it says click here or well, a macro is currently recording. Click to stop the recording so we can start and stop it from the status bar as well. So what we want to do is we want to open the received vehicles file that is in the same directory as this file. And I'm going to use the shortcut combination control O to bring up my open dialog box. I'm already in the proper directory for myself and I'm going to just double click that received vehicles Excel file to open it. And once it's opened, you'll see that it has a limited amount of data. There's some VIN numbers and dealer cost. And so what we're going to do is we are going to click anywhere on the spreadsheet. It's only on sheet one. And we're going to hold down our control key and type the letter A and the letter C. So A selects everything and C is the copy command. And now we want to switch back to our vehicles macro enabled file. So one way to do that is we can go to our view tab on the ribbon. The next to the last button is switch windows. And I'm going to use, I'm going to just click on vehicles to switch back to that file. We're already in cell A1 in the vehicles file on the new vehicles tab. I'm going to just do control V as in Victor to paste in the information. We have one more step we're going to take before we stop this macro recording. I'm going to switch back to the received vehicles file and I'm going to just close it. And now I can go down to my status bar and stop the recording. Before we switch over to the Visual Basic Editor to look at the code that we just generated, just wanted to give you some examples of methods. So I've said that a method is an action that is taken on an object. So clear contents is a method of the range object. It would empty the cells, delete everything that's in the cells, clear all everything that's in the cells in the range. Add is a method of the workbooks collection object, and it's used to create a new workbook. And then you have activate, and that's a method of the worksheet object. It's used to activate a worksheet. You know, if I click on the inventory sheet tab, I'm activating that sheet. So examples of how you access the methods, you start with the object. So range A1 colon B11 in parentheses and double quotes, you use the dot notation 
And then you can access the method, clear contents, workbooks.add, worksheets. You have to give it the name or the index number of the sheet, dot activate. So we're seeing the dot notation used to call methods as well. And when you're in the editor and you do the dot, it sometimes gives you, and usually gives you built-in help that it will list the methods that are available for that particular object. I'm gonna just delete this text box off of my spreadsheet. Then I'm going to Alt F11 to switch over to the Visual Basic Editor. The first thing I want to point out is the Project Explorer window, the upper left corner. And if you look in your Modules folder now, we renamed what used to be called Module 1, Mod First. So because we had closed the file and reopened it, when we recorded this macro, it created a new module. Since module one wasn't in use anymore, it used that. And so we would have to go there to find the code that we just recorded the macro for. So I'm gonna switch to module one and it created a sub procedure we named it Get New Vehicles. We put stuff in the description explaining what it is. And, you know, we can get rid of those extra green lines that are preceded by apostrophes that don't need to be there. Just to kind of clean up the code. Of course, you want it as concise as possible. When we did Control O, the open command, it did this active window dot close. And then workbooks.open, right? So open is a method of the workbooks object. Close is a method of the active window object. So we did workbooks open. We had to give it the name of the file and these characters here. So it says file name followed by a colon equal. Then there's a space and an underscore. The space and the underscore means the rest of this syntax, the rest of what is needed here is on the next line. It's called the line continuation character, space and underscore combined like that in Visual Basic is the line continuation character. And that's what we have after file name colon equal. If we didn't have that there, we would get an error message because it's saying, hey, you gotta give me the path to the file name, including the file name. So it just goes to where I have my, on my hard drive, users, Trish, desktop, files for video description, and then it's in that received vehicles, the name of the file is receivedvehicles.xlsx. And that line, starting with C, begins with an open double quote and ends with a closing double quote. And then I scrolled a little bit when I got over to that other file, receive vehicles, and it took note of that. That's this active window, small scroll down. And then we did control A to select everything, which is A1 through B11. Range.select. Select is a method of the range object. And then we have range A2 activate. And then we did copy. So we actually just did control AC and it created those three lines of code. And then after we copied it, we switched back over to the vehicles macro enabled file. We click in cell A1 and then we pasted what was on the clipboard onto the active sheet starting in cell A1. And then we went back over to received vehicles file calling the activate method. And then we said close that window. And then of course, with every sub statement, you have your in sub statement at the bottom. 
Now that we've reviewed this code that was generated from us recording that macro, there's a few things we want to do. We want to rename module one so it's more specific. And we want to create a new sub procedure from scratch in the newly named module. So let's start in our Project Explorer window. I'm going to just click on module one. Go down to properties window, double click name, and we're going to call this mod. Remember that three character prefix, which is a convention, not a rule mod new vehicles. And I'm using the proper casing all mushed together. And then I'm going to press enter. So we have mod first and mod new vehicles. In mod new vehicles, click at the end of your in sub statement and press enter. We're going to go to the insert menu and we're going to choose procedure. And this is a Microsoft product. So this is just one way of doing this in the add procedure dialog box. We're going to start and work our way from top to bottom, right? In the name box, we're going to name this procedure move cells. So capital M capital C mush together procedure name move cells. The type defaults to sub for a sub procedure. And we're going to talk about the scope in a little while, but we're going to leave it on public and we're going to just click OK. So a couple of things happened. It automatically put a dividing line between your get new vehicle sub procedure and this new sub procedure. And it has the keyword public because we did it from within the dialog box. And again, you'll learn about scope in a little while. And that's what public speaks to. It gave us our sub and our in sub statements. And of course the open and closing parentheses at the end of the first line. So what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you click outside of the closing parentheses, public sub move cells, press enter twice, and then press the tab key on your keyboard. I talked about code being concise, but also you need to know this. You're going to probably end up spending more time troubleshooting code than actually writing code. It's just the way it goes. And there are certain things in terms of how you format you, your code that makes it easier to review when you're troubleshooting. And indentation is one of those things. I like to look at my code and see the public sub and in sub statements at the same margin. And that's what we're doing by indenting here. So now you're going to type a few lines of code, four lines to be exact. And you can take them off of my screen. The first line is going to be columns, plural, open paren, open double quote, B, close your double quote, close your paren. So columns B. So we're referencing column B. You're going to use the dot notation and start typing select. And if I don't type it with a capital S, when I press enter, at the end, it will automatically capitalize it for me. And now we're going to type selection dot cut enter. I'll explain it all when we get it in. And then we're going to type columns, open paren, open double quote, G close the quote, close the paren dot select active sheet dot paste. And typically I like to have a blank line after public sub and a blank line before end sub. So my previous block, my get new vehicle sub procedure, I'm going to just get that blank line above the end sub statement. So basically it's going to select everything in column B and it's going to cut it, put it on the clipboard. 
And then it's going to select column G and it's going to paste what was in column B into column G. Congratulations, you just wrote four lines of VBA code from scratch. Now, earlier we added some buttons to our toolbar and we used one of these earlier. Be anywhere in between your public sub and your in sub statements and go on and click that compile VBA project that we put up on the toolbar earlier. And again, if there were any errors in your code, you would be notified of it. It's kind of line checking your code. You accessed the select method of the columns object. And once you have something selected, it is known as the selection object. So you access the cut method of the selection object and the paste method of the active sheet object in that code block. So let's go ahead and save. There's save on the toolbar or you could do control S and then we're going to do alt F 11 to switch back over to Excel so we can test this code. There is another way that you can access your macros in here. So earlier, we accessed our macros from the developer tab by using the second button macros. We also accessed it from the view tab of the ribbon by going to the last button, which is macros. Well, there's another way of doing it and it's a shortcut key. So you can use alt F eight to open the macro dialog box. And so in here, you'll see your add formatting macro, your get new vehicles macro. Both of those were based off of macro recordings, I should say. And then move cells is listed in here, even though we created that sub procedure from scratch. So this is a, just another way, alt F eight, that you can open the macro dialog box. And we're going to double click the move cells procedure. So you could click it once and then choose run, or you could just double click it to run it. And it did exactly what we asked it to do just very quickly selected everything in column B, cut it and then pasted it into column G. So the next part we're going to do is going to further our automation. What we want to do is we want to edit the add formatting sub procedure so that it works on this sheet, the new vehicle sheet that we're currently on. And before we do that, um, we're going to delete everything on this sheet, new vehicles. We're going to do control a to select everything. And then we're going to just press delete and then just click in cell a one. Now we want to go back over to the visual basic editor. Alt F 11 will get you there. And in the project Explorer, we're going to double click mod first, which is where our add formatting sub procedure resides. Now notice the first two lines in our code block. That's when we right clicked on row one and we inserted a new row. Well, we don't want to do that again. We want to keep the row headings that we already have. So we don't want it to insert a blank row above row one, which now contains the headings. So we need to delete just those two lines of code rows one colon one dot select and selection dot insert shift, blah, blah, blah. The first two lines. So I already have them selected and I'm going to delete those two lines. And then what I'm going to do is in your project Explorer window, go ahead and double click mod new vehicles again to get back into that module where we have our get new vehicles, which is the result of a macro. And notice when you do a macro, it gives you in green that it's based off of a macro. You didn't create this code and then whatever description you put in, right? So we should probably add comments just so I can be a good example here 
to our move cells sub procedure. I'm going to click at the end of the public sub line and press enter twice. And then I'm going to type an apostrophe. Now, when you type an apostrophe, it's like saying the visual basic, hey, heads up. The next thing I'm going to type is going to be a comment, which means you're not going to execute it when the code executes. It's just there for informational purposes. And we're going to say that this is going to select and cut contents of column B and paste into column G. And then when I press enter, it will turn that line green because we started with an apostrophe. Before we do the next bit, I just want to go over that there are different ways to execute your procedures or run them within the application or in VBA. So we've used some of these already. Um, we've used the macro dialog box. The ones that are highlighted on in yellow on this slide, we will use during this course. So you'll later on, we'll use the run sub user form button on the VBE toolbar. We've already used the macro dialog box. We're going to call the procedure from another sub procedure, which is the one, the example we're going to do next. Later on, we're going to add a button to the quick access toolbar in Excel. You can also attach the procedure to an event, which you will learn later. And also you can run it from what's known as the immediate window in visual basic editor. So many different ways to execute procedures. So like I mentioned, we're going to be calling the procedure from another sub procedure in this lesson. We're going to click at the end of the end sub statement in your move cells public sub procedure, and we're going to press enter twice. We're going to create another sub procedure here. We're going to do it in a different way. And it's going to be known as the calling procedure. You'll see how this works and I'll explain more after we get it done. Now we're going to actually just type this in. We're not going to use the add procedure, insert procedure dialog box. And so we clicked after in sub, we pressed enter a couple of times and we're going to type sub and then we're going to name it, get new inventory and press enter twice. So you get the line, the dividing line between the move cells sub procedure. Notice we didn't have to type the opening and closing paren or the in sub statement. The visual basic editor will supply you with those when you're typing it from scratch. So now we're going to press, I'm going to just do shift tab to out dent. Let's do a comment here. I'm trying to be a good example. We're going to type an apostrophe and we're going to put, this is a calling procedure that is calling three other procedures and press enter at the end of the line. It turns green, press enter again, and then tab to indent. We simply need to give it the names of the procedures. So this is known as a calling procedures. And the procedure names we are going to type are known as called procedures. So we are going to type get new vehicles. Enter move cells. Enter add formatting. Enter. It should look like this on my screen. So Get new inventories purpose is to kind of bundle those three other procedures together in the order that they're listed there, and it will execute them when it is executed. So we get three for the price of one. We execute get new inventory and it executes three other sub procedures for us. 
Go ahead and compile your project and save. We have our three procedures that are called procedures in our get new inventory sub procedure, two of which reside in this same module. Add formatting resides in mod first. We're going to talk now about the scope of procedures and why it's possible that we can access the add formatting procedure from a different module. So of course, we're going to review the scope of procedures on a slide, because again, the slide deck is in the files in the video description, and you'll be able to re use it for future reference. So scope determines where the procedure may be used. You have basically three different scopes, really two. So the first one is public. If a procedure declaration is preceded by the keyword public, this makes the procedure accessible to all modules in the Visual Basic project. If the procedure declaration is preceded by the keyword private, this makes the procedure available only in the module where it resides. It cannot be accessed from any other modules or from the Excel workbook. And then you have undeclared. So we have no private procedures at this point. If no keyword is inserted at the start of a sub or a function declaration, the default is public. Okay, so I'm going to switch back over to the Visual Basic Editor and we'll take a look at this. And I'm still in Mod New Vehicles. So we have the result of a macro. We recorded a macro and we named it Get New Vehicles. It simply named it sub. It didn't put public or private. So it's considered undeclared, which means it's public. Then we created a procedure by using the insert menu. And because in there, and I'll bring up that dialog box, the scope is defaulting to public. So when we created the move cells procedure, it added the public keyword. And then we create it from one from scratch, sub get new inventory. We didn't type public before sub. We left it undeclared. So all of these are public procedures. And if we go to mod first, add formatting is also undeclared, which means it's public. And I look at the end of that and I want that blank line above in sub. So I just modified it and did that. So because add formatting is public, I'm going to go back to mod new vehicles. We can access it by calling it from this module. That's why that's possible. The scope of procedures matter. Now, one other little fix we're going to do, because I already know it's going to be an error, and you may not even have this line in your get new vehicles sub procedure in mod new vehicles. But that first line of code, since get new vehicles is included in our calling procedure, if we have the first line saying active window close, it's going to just close the file and then it won't be able to run the rest of the code. So that very first line active window close, if you have that line, you know, could cause you to have an issue with the code. If you don't have that line as your first line, if your first line is workbooks.open file name, so on and so forth, you're good to go. But if not, you want to delete that first line active window close. We're going to leave it at the bottom but not at the top and then go ahead and save your code. And now we're ready to alt F 11 to switch over to Excel. And we're on the new vehicle sheet in cell a one. We're going to do alt F eight to bring up our macros box. And we want to run our calling procedure, get new inventory. So I'm going to just double click it. And my screen will flicker for a moment and then ultimately stop. Okay. So what happened? Well, it ran the bundle. 
let's switch back over Alt F11. The first thing that it did is it ran get new vehicles. So it opened the receipt vehicles file. It selected everything and then it copied everything. And then it went back over to our vehicles macro enabled file, made sure it was in cell A1 and it pasted the data. And then it went back over to received vehicles file and closed it. After that, it did the move cells sub procedure. So once it brought in that information from received vehicles, it selected everything in column B and it pasted it, it cut it, and then it pasted it in column G. And then after that, it did add formatting, which is in mod first. And that's where it added the headings for us, right? So it added our column headings and we didn't want it to create a new row there because it came in with a heading row. So we had already modified this. It did the currency format or accounting number format, and it auto fitted the columns. It also made the headings bold and centered in their cells. So it ran the bundle. We ran one sub procedure that called three other procedures. So when I go back and look at it in Excel, we're still on new vehicles, right? It moved the dealer costs to the appropriate column, applied the appropriate formatting to it, and it added the headings instead of the headings that came in from the received vehicles file and the formatting that it did. So you saw that calling procedures lend themselves to efficiency but there's further efficiency to be had. Earlier, we discussed how sometimes a sub procedure is known as an event procedure, and that happens when you attach it to an event. So first thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna do control A on this new vehicles sheet to select everything, and then we're gonna press delete. We're gonna clear the sheet, just click in cell A1 and switch back over to your Visual Basic Editor. Now on the left side, you attach to, in order to make something an event procedure, you have to access an object's events. So we're gonna double click in the Project Explorer window. We're gonna double click Sheet 3, New Vehicles. Now notice at the very top of your screen, you have two different drop downs above option explicit, which we still haven't talked about, but we're getting there. You have a general box and to the right, you have a declarations box. Both of them have drop downs on their far right sides. The left side where it says general is known as the object list. The right side where it says declarations currently is known as the procedures or events list. So we're gonna do the drop down arrow to the right of general. And the only thing, because we have sheet three selected, the only object we're gonna see is worksheet. So we're gonna select worksheet. And it creates this whole like sub procedure framework it's private, so it's only available within where we're putting it. It's attached only to the new vehicle sheet, which the system knows as sheet three, right? So the first thing, the default event for a worksheet, if you look at the right now, where it used to say declarations, it says selection change. That's just the default event. That's not the event that we want. What we want to happen is we want our calling procedure to run whenever the new vehicle sheet is activated. So we're gonna do the drop down all the way to the far right of selection change. And these are all worksheet events, right? Activate 
before delete, calculate, you have a whole list. We want to select the activate event. So now it gives us the framework for a private sub procedure that it names worksheet underscore activate. Typically with event procedures, you don't change the names, right? It's kind of like hard coded. So it's that particular worksheets activate event that we're going to code. So we don't need this second block. We don't need this. This is just what was created. As soon as we selected worksheet, it selected the default event, which is selection change. So we can just delete that. Click at the end of the parentheses on the private sub worksheet activate line. Press enter twice, just so you get that blank space again. We're gonna press tab so it's indented. And we're simply going to call our calling procedure by name. We named it get new inventory. So that's the one that has the, the three called procedures within it. So we're saying whenever the new vehicle sheet is activated, go ahead and run that bundled calling procedure known as get new inventory. Go ahead and compile your VBA project using the toolbar. You want to get in the habit of doing that and save and switch back to Excel. Just make sure you're in cell A1 on new vehicles, which we deleted everything off of. And now we're going to go to our inventory sheet tab at the bottom. And then we're going to click back on the new vehicle sheet tab to activate it. And voila, as soon as we activated that sheet, it ran our get new inventory calling procedure. So we get the same result. We didn't have to do Alt F8 to get into the macros dialog box to make it run or anything like that. We simply made it an event procedure and it was the activate event for this particular sheet. We are going to once again clear this sheet by doing control A and delete. Just click back in cell A1 and go ahead and save your vehicle's file. So now we're ready to create a function procedure. And if you remember from earlier, a uh, function procedure performs a calculation and returns a single value or an array of values. So differs from a sub procedure. So when you create a function procedure in VBA, it can only be executed in two ways compared to the nine ways you can execute a sub procedure. You can call the procedure from a sub procedure or another function procedure or you can use the function in a worksheet formula. It, it becomes a user defined function in your Excel application. And you'll see both of these play out when we do this. We're going to create a new module for this. So I'm gonna just go up to the insert menu in the visual basic editor, and I'm gonna choose module. So it gives me a new module one. And, and let's rename that module using the properties window. We're going to call it mod and then capital F function. And in this module, we're going to create a function. And what it's going to do is we're going to give it different values for an MSRP. And depending on the value, it's going to display a message. And once we get it typed in and stuff, it'd be easier to kind of explain it to you. So in your mod function, I'm going to click at the top after option explicit and just press enter. And we're going to type the word function and a space, and we're going to call it MSRP. So all of that is capitalized and then capital S status. And then in the parentheses, we have to have an open parenthesis. We're going to type MSRP. That's a parameter. You'll also hear it 
as an argument. So we have to pass the function an argument in order for it to give us a value as its return. And after that, you're going to press enter and notice it gives you the end function statement, just like it does when we do a sub procedure and it gives us the end sub statement. So I'm going to press enter again, and I am going to press my tab key to indent. It's just a structure thing. Visual basic doesn't care. Now we're going to build what's known as an if construct. It's more specifically, it's an if then else if else construct, which is a lot to say and can be overwhelming. It's similar to the if function in Excel. You're being rudely introduced to it for this function, but you'll get a deeper dive in control of flow structures in a later lesson. So I will explain this after we get it typed in. So we're going to type if and then MSRP, we're going to do the less than symbol 20,000, no punctuation on the 20,000 and type then and press enter. Now tab a little bit more, one more time. So if the MSRP value is less than 20,000, then if that is true, it's going to do what we say on this line. We're going to type now we're going to type MSRP status, the name of our function equals and in double quotes, less than 20 K and close your quotes. So if the MSRP value is less than 20,000, it's going to say as the function return, the result of the function, it's going to display the text less than 20 K press enter and then shift tab. And you're going to type else if, and it's all one word, initial capital letters, MSRP less than 30,000. Then next line down, you're going to tab MSRP status, the name of the function equals and then double quotes less than 30 K and close your quotes, enter and shift tab. We're almost done. We have two more lines. Now we're going to type else, just else, not else. If space M S R P status, the name of the function again, equals and then double quotes greater than or equal to 30 K and close your double quotes, enter. And we need an end if statement. So end if and press enter one more time. So you get that blank line between end if and end function. So if the MSRP is less than 20,000, it will display the text less than 20 K. If it's less than 30,000, meaning it's not less than 20,000, but it's less than 30,000. It is say less than 30 K to display that text. If neither of those statements are true, if it's not less than 20,000 and it's not less than 30,000, it's going to just display greater than or equal to 30 K. So the else statement and notice when you got to the end of the line, it put that colon after else you didn't have to type that. So there's a line editor. Every time you get to the end of the line, it's checking the line to make sure it's okay. So this is known as an if construct, it's going to do different things depending on whether a statement is true. And that's how you create the function procedure. Now we should go ahead and compile our project. So again, you just need to be anywhere between function and end function and do your compile project. Make sure there's no errors. And then we're going to save. 
So there are two ways to execute a function procedure. The first way is by using what's called the immediate window. And it's really testing the function to make sure that it works properly. And so we're going to do that way first. And then I'll tell you about the second way, which is really super cool, in my opinion. Um, and you'll see that soon. So the first thing we need to do is get the immediate window open in Visual Basic Editor. So we're going to go to the View menu, and we're going to choose Immediate Window. And it opens in the bottom of the screen. In the immediate window, we can test this function procedure. I'll explain it after we type it in. You're going to type question mark and then MSRP status, the name of the function. And then in parentheses, now, if you notice right underneath where we're typing in the immediate window, right, right underneath that, it's showing that in the parentheses, it's waiting for us to give it a argument. So we used MSRP in the parentheses as a parameter, and now we have to pass it an argument in order for the function to work, which means we have to give it a number that represents an MSRP. In the parentheses, we're going to just type 10,000, no punctuation, close the parentheses, and press enter. Question mark means the same as print in VB. A, right? So it's saying print the result right there in the immediate window. So if we look at our if block, we said if it's less than 20,000, we want it to say less than 20K. And that's exactly what it did. Now we can use either the question mark or the print keyword to the same effect in the immediate window. So now in the immediate window, you're going to type print and then MSRP status open paren, and we're going to put 20,000 in there and close the parentheses and now press enter. So it's giving us less than 30,000. So question mark and the print keyword do the same exact thing in the immediate window. We're testing our function to make sure that it works. So let's do another one. We could do either question mark or print, whichever your preferred one is. And we're going to set it up again, MSRP status. And this time in the parentheses, we're going to put 40,000, close the parentheses, press enter. And we should get the greater than or equal to 30K. The else statement is working because it's not less than 20,000. It's not less than 30,000, the parameter that we gave it, the argument that we gave it in the parentheses. It's 40,000, so we're getting greater than or equal to 30K. If you're creating super complicated function procedures, you would want to test them in your immediate window, giving it different values to make sure it works. The other way to test it, let's go ahead and switch over to Excel. I'm doing Alt F11 there, okay? And let's go to the Inventory Sheet tab and click in cell I2. In cell I2, you're gonna type an equal sign like you would for any built-in Excel function. And then you're gonna start typing the name of the function. We're gonna type MS, and our MSRP status function shows up here. It's a user-defined function in the Excel application. Once you create it, unless you go and delete that function, you will be able to use it in Excel. We're going to click on, or since MSRP is already selected, I'm going to just tab key. It's called tabbing it in. And then we are going to click on cell H2, the very first MSRP. And we don't even have to type the closing parenthesis here because we're doing it in Excel application. So go ahead and press enter and then click on I2 and the little notch in the lower right hand corner of the cell is known as the fill handle. And once I put my mouse on top of the fill handle, it looks like a thin black cross 
and I am going to double click. So you'll notice it'll fill it all the way down to the bottom until it runs into a blank, right? So if I do control N, it filled it all the way down to row 105. And it's looking at each MSRP's value and determining what to display in the adjoining cell. And so we are going to right click on the column I column heading and delete that column. And I want to show you something else since we're in here, go to the formulas tab on your ribbon. And the first button is insert function, click it where it says, or select the category most recently used do the drop down arrow. And you might have to scroll down to see it, but you're looking for a category called user defined. Now there's going to be stuff in here that you are like, what does that mean? Don't worry about it. There's stuff that comes into Excel automatically, but you'll see your MSRP status in that list. So that is a user defined function in the Excel application, which I think is just pretty cool. We can just cancel out of that and go ahead and save your file. So our last topic in this lesson is getting context sensitive help in the visual basic editor. So I'm going to do alt F 11 and switch back over to VBE and in VBE, I'm still in my mod function module. I'm going to just click anywhere in the word function at the beginning of that function procedure. And I'm going to press F one on my keyboard. So it brings up the context help box because you're in Excel visual basic for applications. And it's saying that there's an object in both visual basic and Excel called a function. We're interested in the VBA function. So we can just either double click it or go over and click on help. It's already selected. So it launches your browser. And I can tell you that the VBA documentation from Microsoft is awesome. So it gives you the function statement from VBA. It lets you know that it declares the name arguments and code that form the body of a function procedure. It gives you the syntax. So, you know, just like sub procedures, there's different statements, public, private, right? If it's undeclared, it's public. Um, there's also friend and static and then the function name and then in parentheses, the argument list, and you can give it a data type as it's returned as well, which we didn't have to do on ours, right? Um, there's also an exit function statement that we didn't need to use. So it gives you the breakdown about everything descriptions on everything, right? And so, and then there's remarks at the bottom. And so it says, there's one line in here that says all executable all executable code must be in procedures. You can't define a function procedure inside of another function sub or property procedure. And notice that sub there is a link. So if I click on that link, it brings me to context sensitive help about the sub statement. And the other thing I'll point out in here is on the left side, it lets you know that you're looking at the sub statement, right? So if I scroll up on the left side, there's the if then else construct. And again, we're going to do a deeper dive into that later. But if I wanted more information on that, I can just click on it on the left side, right? And it gives you all the information you need to know about that. If I continue to scroll up, it's all under the heading statements, which is under the heading reference which is under the heading language reference. So anything you need to know, um, I'm going to just switch back over to my visual basic editor. You can access it by pressing F one when you are on a particular keyword, right? So it works that way. It gets you into the Microsoft documentation, really good context specific help at your fingertips.
So we covered a lot in lesson three. And just to recap what we covered, we went into a deeper dive about the types of modules that are available within Visual Basic and the types of procedures. Then we went on to creating a standard module. We created a sub procedure and we called procedures by creating a calling procedure. You also learned about the scope of procedures. Then we created a function procedure and we tested it using the immediate window before going into Excel and accessing it in its interface as a user defined function. After that, you were shown how to get context sensitive help from within the Visual Basic Editor. Thank you for attending Excel 2019 Visual Basic for Applications video course. Hi everyone, I'm Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to the Excel 2019 Visual Basic for Applications video course. This course is for beginning users looking to automate repetitive and recurring tasks in Microsoft Excel. VBA is Microsoft's programming language and it's built into the Office applications. Our focus during this course is on Excel specifically. You'll be equipped with the basics to start writing your own VBA code, modify the code behind macros you've already recorded, and have an understanding of how VBA lends itself to creating efficiency in your daily tasks. A key component of VBA is its language elements. You'll learn about this important topic by learning about variables, their scope, and how to declare them. You'll also gain an understanding of VBA data types, intrinsic functions, and the with-end with structure, and how it provides efficiency in your code. You'll also learn to create message boxes and input boxes in this lesson, as well as gaining understanding of object variables. The next lesson will teach you how to control program flow through supported control of flow structures. This lesson begins with an overview of structures and Boolean expressions. You'll then learn how to utilize conditional branching, and the lesson ends with learning about how to use looping constructs. If you're enjoying these videos, please like and subscribe. If you want to earn certificates and digital badges, please become a member of our Patreon. The link is in our video description. If you have any questions you want answered by one of our instructors, please join our offsite community. The link is in the description as well. As always, if this course has exercise files, you'll find them in the video description below. In our fourth lesson, we're going to dive into expressions, variables, and intrinsic functions. You've already experienced comments, seen them when we fill out the description in the record macro dialog box, and we've actually modified comments and added our own comments to code that we created from scratch. And comments are known as a foundational VBA language element. Well, there are others, and we're going to get into them in this lesson. So we're going to get started by learning and understanding variables. We'll go over VBA data types and intrinsic functions, which include expressions. We saw the with and with structure in the first macro we recorded, the add formatting macro, it created that structure with everything that resides in the paragraph group on the home tab of the Excel ribbon. And we deleted a lot of extraneous lines just to make our code more concise. You're going to learn about the offset property using message boxes and input boxes and object variables. We're going to be using our regular vehicles macro enabled file, as well as two other Excel files that are in the video description. And you should be putting these files all in the same directory. So we're going to be using an Excel file named VIN numbers and another one called sales fiscal year. Variables are often considered the most important VBA language element. 
Since one of VBA's main purposes is to manipulate data, variables store data in your computer's memory when procedures are executed and the data may or may not end up on disk. Some data resides in objects like worksheet ranges. Other data is stored in variables you create. Data that is stored in a variable usually changes while your procedure executes. There are, of course, naming rules and conventions when it comes to variables, very similar to the rules and conventions, well, the rules for naming procedures. Variable names can be up to 255 characters, alphanumeric, the first character must be a letter, cannot use spaces or any of the characters listed on the slide. And then it has another one that is not a procedure rule. VBA is not case sensitive, but it is case preservative. So you'll learn about declaring variables in a moment and you'll see this play out. When you declare a variable, if you declare it in proper case, right, using the rules and conventions, and then let's say the next time you reference it, you type it in all lowercase, Visual Basic Editor is going to automatically change it to the case it was when you declared it. And that's what case preservative is. A convention is used proper case for each word within the name of the variable. And we have a couple of examples. Today's date, then num. Before you can use variables, they need to be declared. And just like procedures, variables also have a scope. So there are two declaration methods. There are implicit and explicit. Implicit declaration means you declare the variable by just using it without writing a declaration statement. And this method can lead to code errors. So for example, with implicit declaration, let's say I name a variable green, for example. And then when I go to use it, I misspell green. It's going to think that I'm implicitly declaring another variable. And you can see how that could lead to coding errors. Explicit declaration is the preferred method. You write a declaration statement to officially declare the variable. Now, when it comes to variable scope, you can use either the dim or the private keyword. They mean the same thing. They're used interchangeably. They have the same result. I typically use dim and you declare the variable at the top of the module before the first procedure. And that area at the top of the module is known as the declaration section. If you want the variable available to all procedures in a module, you would use dim or private and declare it in the declaration section. The public keyword is also used in the declaration section at the top of the module. And you use it if you want the variable available to all procedures in all modules. And then there's a static keyword. Static variables retain their value even when the procedure ends. And you declare a static variable at the procedure level. It means it's only available in that procedure. And when you declare variables, you should assign them a data type. So on this slide, it's talking about the data types that are available in VBA. And you can see the name of the data type, the number of bytes that are used, and the data types range of values. A byte uses the data type known as a byte, uses one byte, and has a range of values from zero to 255. A Boolean data type uses two bytes and has either true or false as its range of values. You have integer, long, single, double, currency, and then at the bottom you have decimal data type. Those are your numeric data types. They use varying bytes and they have varying ranges of values. You have a date data type, I don't think, you will ever be in a situation where you're not covered as concerns a date. 
I mean, it goes back to the year 100 and all the way up to the year 9999. You have your string data types, fixed length and variable length, and you have a variant data type. So if you declare a variable and you don't assign it a data type, it will automatically assign it the variant data type. Look how many bytes that's using. If it's a value, it's going to use 16 bytes. And if it's a string, it's going to use 22 plus bytes. So you want to be careful and really try your hardest to assign data types when you're declaring variables. I've gone ahead and opened the VIN numbers Excel file that was in the video description. And I still have my vehicles macro enabled file open, but our focus right now is going to be on this file. So it only has one sheet. It has one VIN number and it has several other columns. Year, make, model, color, country, classification. What we're going to do is insert a new module, create a sub procedure and declare six procedure level string variables. We talked about the declaration section at the top of the module window and anything you declare there, depending on the keyword that you're using, determines the scope of the variable. And the scope of a variable not only determines where it can be used, but also affects the circumstances in which the variable is removed from memory. Only procedure level variables that are declared using the dim keyword are removed from memory when its code has completed execution. If you use the static keyword in a variable that's declared at the procedure level, that means it's going to retain the value of the variable after it executes. So you'll see what this means and how we're going to use it when we switch over to VBE, which we're going to do right now by doing Alt F11. So I want to point out a few things to you now. Since I still, and you do too, have the vehicles file open, there's a VBA project that we've been working in this whole time for that particular file. I'm going to collapse that project. Because we have another open workbook, we have another VBA project, and it's vinnumbers.xlsx file that we just opened. One thing I want to point out at the very top of the screen, and I'm going to just select like sheet one in here to get rid of the code that's on my screen. And at the very top of the screen, we have that option explicit statement. This is when it's time to learn why that's sitting there and what it means. So let's go to the tools menu and go into options like we did earlier in the course. And one of the options under code settings on the editor tab is require variable declaration. And that way we can't do an implicit declaration. We have to do an explicit declaration. The implicit ones are where you don't write a declaration statement. You just use the variable, but that's the type that can lead to code errors. So to get the system to force you to write declaration statements, you want this setting to be checked in your options, require variable declaration. And that means that it produces, I'm going to just cancel out of options. It forces that option explicit statement to show at the top. So it's going to force you to do variable declaration. The other thing we talked about just a moment ago is that the scope of a variable determines not only where it can be used, but the circumstances in which the variable is removed from memory. You can always use two techniques to remove all variables from memory. One of them is the reset button on the VBE toolbar. So it looks like a stop button. When you hover over it, it says reset. And a lot of times if you get code errors, once you resolve the errors, you're going to want to reset anyway. If you ever get a runtime error, there's a dialog box that will pop up and it has an end button on it. If you click end, it will remove all variables from memory. 
So I've closed the immediate window as we won't be using it. It has an X in its upper right hand corner just to give me some more working space here. And what we want to do, we're going to take this in little steps. Like I said, we're going to set up the framework of a sub procedure and we're going to declare six string variables. We are going to look up at the top of your screen right underneath the option explicit statement is known as the declaration areas. That's why it says declarations over to the right in the procedure box. We are going to first insert a new module. So we're going to use, make sure you're on your VBA project, then numbers, right? We want to be on that one. We're going to go up to insert module. So it gives us a module one, which we are currently in. And again, I always verify in the title bar up at the top, what file or what project I'm in, and then what module I'm in. And this is where we're going to create a sub procedure. We are going to type sub and we're going to name it parse then. Since then is all capitalized, I'm going to leave it that way. Parse then. I'm going to press enter twice and press the tab key. So it gave me my parentheses and my n sub statement. I'm going to actually, and actually we don't have to press tab. I'm going to shift tab. I'm going to declare procedure level variables. But first I want to type a comment. So I'm going to do an apostrophe and type this procedure will parse the then number into the appropriate columns. And then I'm going to press enter and enter again. So I have my comment line. Now we're going to use the dim keyword. So I'm going to type dim and I want to show you two examples here. Again, you want your code to be as concise as possible. So you guys, you don't have to type or do anything other than watch my screen. Just want to show you an example here. So hopefully this example is going to show you how to make your code more concise. I'm going to highlight the lines of interest here. These variables are all using the string data type. And I typed a separate line item using the dim keyword for each item. Why would I do that? If they're all the same data type, I can type this line just using the dim keyword once separating the variable names by commas. And at the very end, giving it the as string data type. So that's the line that you're going to end up typing and then I'm going to end up keeping. But I have another example. Let's say you were only declaring two variables and they had different data types. So in that case, you would end up with two lines. Dim dealer cost as single, dim then number as string. The ones that have the same data type, I grouped them together on one line. Easier to type, easier to troubleshoot. So I am going to go ahead and delete these individual rows of variable declarations, and I'm going to delete the last two. And we want to declare six procedure level string variables. And you're going to type this dim statement that I have on my screen. And you'll notice that when you get to the as keyword and you start typing string, a list of data types will appear. So it's not going to let you type in a data type that you just make up or pull from thin air that is not compatible with VBA. Now that we have our six procedure level string variables declared, and again, they're only going to be available to the procedure within which they're declared. We are going to look at building intrinsic functions. So by definition, they're functions that are provided by the application. Like a function procedure, an intrinsic function performs a specific task or calculation and returns a value. You may be familiar 
with the three functions we're going to use in this section because they're essentially Excel functions and they're string functions in Excel. So if you've ever used any of the Excel text functions, these may be familiar to you. We're going to use left, mid, and right. So the left function extracts specified text from the left of a text string. Its syntax is left, and then you have to tell it what string expression, and then you give it a numeric expression. Don't worry about memorizing this. I will walk you through it when we're ready to go back to Visual Basic Editor. The mid function extracts specified text from the middle of a string. It has three arguments. Well, first you use mid, which is the name of the function. And then it has a string expression that it needs to reference, a starting position in that string, and the number of characters you want extracted. And then the right function does the opposite of the left. It extracts specified text from the right of a text string. It too has the same arguments as left. So right, and then the string expression, that it's referencing and a numeric expression that references how many characters are going to be extracted. And again, don't worry about this. I will guide you through these functions. And now I want to show you just a split screen of a slide on the right and the VIN numbers Excel sheet on the left. I mentioned earlier that these are just make believe VIN numbers, but the way we're using them in this course, and the way we're going to use them in this procedure that we're developing is based on the slide. So we're saying the first character in the VIN, so in this case, the number one represents the country of origin. Honestly, I don't know if that's true or not. It's just make believe data here, but this is how we're using it. The second character of the VIN would represent the make. The third and the fourth characters would represent the model. The 11th character would represent the year. 12th character would represent the color. And the 17th character of the VIN would represent the classification. Again, I will guide you through this as we're using our left, right, and mid functions. But you have the slide for future reference if you want to kind of run through it again on your own, you'll know how we're using the VIN number. Now we're ready to use our intrinsic functions in this parse VIN procedure. We already created a blank line underneath our variable declaration dim statement in this procedure. And we're going to press tab on the keyboard to indent. And what we're going to type is range and then in parentheses and double quotes, A2, close your double quotes, close the parentheses. We're going to use our dot notation. And now you'll see the list pop up with methods, properties, bunch of different things. We're going to start typing select. And when it shows up on the list and it's highlighted, I can stop typing and press my tab key to get it in. And I'm going to press enter. So it's going to select cell A2. And then we're going to reference one of our variables, but we're going to reference it in all lowercase. So we're just going to type then num and then a space bar equals, and we're going to type active cell dot. And when the list comes up, start typing value. When I see it on the list, I highlight it and tab it in. So we're saying select cell A2, and then that is the active cell once it's selected. We want the then number variable to be populated with whatever is in cell A2. So in Excel, you can see that the only then number in this file is in cell A2. So it's going to select that cell and then assign the then num variable that VIN number. Go ahead and press enter at the end of that line and notice that it adjusted the casing on VIN num. Remember VBA is not case sensitive, it's case preservative. So when we declared that variable, we did uppercase V, uppercase N, and then when we typed it in, we did it in all lowercase. As soon as we press enter at the end of that line, 
it goes back and preserves its original declaration case. That is an example of case preservative. So now we're going to type year. So we're going in the order of the way we declared the variables. That's easy to keep yourself organized. So we started with select cell A2 and then populate the VIN num variable with the VIN number that is in cell A2. Now we're going to say what to populate the year variable with. So we type year equal, and then we're gonna type the mid intrinsic function, open paren. So right underneath it, it's telling you the arguments that it's looking for. So you'll see that yellow banner there, right? Right now it's waiting for the string argument and then you have a numeric argument, right? And the string argument is bold because that's the one that it's waiting for. In the open parenthesis, we're gonna type then num, the name of our variable. And again, doesn't matter how you do the casing because it's case preservative. Then num comma 11 comma one. So the mid function has three arguments, the string argument, the start as long argument, right? That's the starting position. And then the last argument is the number of characters. So we're saying the year is going to equal the 11th character of the then. We're saying in that then num variable, which now holds the entire then number, we want you to go to the 11th character and extract one character, which is the 11th character. You're going to type a closing paren. So the 11th character of the VIN represents the year and press enter. Our next one that we're going to do is the make because we're doing them in order here. So instead of you watching me continue to type, I finished this part of this procedure. So we left off with doing the year. So I'd like you to just copy from my screen and assign values based on the character or characters in the VIN to make, model, color, and classification. You can pause the video until you get it done. And once you have the other variable assignments done, Go ahead and compile your VBA project. So just be anywhere between sub and in sub. Make sure there's no errors. By the way, if you just watch my screen, I'm going to take out this classification line. And I just want to show you something. You don't have to worry about spacing. You know, the variables are case preservative. So I could type that line as classification, no space, equal, mid, open paren, I'm typing then num in a weird mix of capitalization, 17 comma one, and I'm not typing spaces at all. I'll type the closing parenthesis, and when I press enter, it gives me the appropriate spacing and it case preserved the name of the variable. So you don't have to worry about your spacing. There's a line editor. So when you get to the end of the line and you press enter, it will fix little stuff like that for you. So you don't have to worry about that. Now for the classification, since we have 17 character VIN, 17 characters total in the VIN, we could have used the write function. It would have just been write VIN num 17, right? The last character. But you can also use mid there. Same result. Now we're going to go ahead and I'm going to compile again since I made a change. And it's saying the variable is not defined. So I got a compile error this time. Class because I misspelled classification. So it's not defined. I spelled classification and it's like, uh, nope, sorry. You have explicit variable declaration turned on and you did not declare that variable. So I'm going to just do okay, correct my typo. I'm going to compile again. And now I don't get the error. We're going to test this at this point. 
So we're going to switch over to Excel. I'm going to use the Excel icon on the toolbar to switch over since I have multiple files open and we're going to test this. We're going to go Alt F8 to open up our macros dialog box and we'll see the macros that are in the vehicles macro enabled file that we still have open as well as this one that's not prefaced by a file name parse fin because it's in the current file that we're working in. So I'm going to just click on parse then I double clicked it and absolutely nothing happened. I wanted to show it to you at this stage. Let's switch back over alt F 11 and switch back over to our parse VIN sub procedure. So all we've done at this point in this procedure is declare variables and use our intrinsic functions to assign each variable a value, but we haven't told it what to do with the values assigned to the variable. So nothing happened. It assigned the values to the variable, but we didn't say how to display those values in order to tell it where to display the values of the variables on the spreadsheet. We're going to take a look at the width end width structure and the offset property. And then we're going to go and complete that parse then sub procedure. Compare these two code blocks. So the top one, these four lines, selection dot starts at the end of each line. It's repetitive. And then you have whatever the thing is. So selection dot horizontal alignment equals Excel center. Selection dot vertical alignment equals Excel center. Selection dot wrap text equals true. Selection dot merge cells equals false. So you're repeating the selection and the dot on every line as a compared to the width end width block of code. So you say with selection and then you just do the dot and the thing that it is and what it equals. And at the end of it, you have an end with statement. So with end with structure saves you some typing, makes your code a bit more concise. And that's one thing that we're going to use. And then you're going to learn how to use the offset property. It allows you to refer to a cell that is a specific number of rows and or columns away from another cell. So it has a syntax dot offset. It is a property. And then you have the number of rows comma the number of columns as arguments. Both arguments are not required. If you use the rows argument only close the parentheses after it. If you use only the columns argument, use a comma as a placeholder for the rows argument. When positive numbers are used in arguments, the property goes down rows and right across columns. When negative numbers are used in its arguments, the property goes up rows and left across columns. So I have some examples here. Range A1, so if you're in cell A1, right? Dot offset one comma two refers to cell C2. The first argument is the rows argument. So it's saying go down one row and go to the right two columns. So if I'm in cell A1 and I go down one row, I'm in row two. And if I go across two columns, I'm in column C. So it refers to cell C2. If I'm in cell C2, and I do an offset of negative one for the rows argument and negative two for the columns argument. It's going to go up rows because we're using negative numbers there and it's going to go to the left of cross columns. So it's going to refer to cell a one. I have range a one offset one and that refers to cell a two. I'm just using the first argument, the rows argument. So it's just going down one row. It's staying in the same column, no column offset. And then the last example there, range A1 offset comma two. So we're not using the rows argument, but we need a comma as a placeholder or we'll get an error message. And we're saying go to the right two columns, but stay in the same row. 
So that refers to cell C1. And again, this PowerPoint is in the video description for future reference. And I already gave you the typing tips that are on the bottom of the slide. So now we're going to add our with and with structure and included in it will be our offset statements. We're going to click at the end of the classification line and press enter and then tab. And we're going to type with active cell, enter, tab again, and type dot and the letter O. So the offset property shows at the top of the list. Notice it's a property. You can tell by the icons over time, you'll learn the different icons in the list. But the one that looks like offset, it looks like a spreadsheet or a piece of paper that a hand is holding, that indicates it's a property. If you look down at the green icon that's in the list for parse and pay special, those are methods. So just visual cues for you. Since offset is selected, I'm gonna tab it in so I don't have to type. And then I'm going to do an open paren comma, because we're not going to use the row offset, but we have to use that comma as a placeholder. We're only doing column offsets here. One, close the paren dot value, and you'll see value on your list. So you can double click it or tab it in equal year. It's saying the active cell is still cell A2. Up at the very beginning, we said select that cell and then we assign the VIN number variable, the VIN num variable, the value of cell A2, where the actual VIN number resides. That is still our active cell. So we're saying starting with cell A2, offset one column. So go to B2 and put in the value of the year variable, which is the 11th character of the VIN. Now, again, you don't have to watch me type. I'm going to just pause and get the rest of these offset lines in, and then you'll be able to pause your video and type them in. So after the year offset line, you're going to type the other remaining five offset lines on my screen for make, model, color, country, and classification. But you're also going to have to type the end with statement. Unlike when we do a sub or a function procedure, when we type sub parse VIN and press enter, it gives us the open and closing parentheses for our parameters, if any, and it gives us the end sub statement, or if it's a function procedure, the end function statement. It will not give you the end with statement that is required with the with end with construct. So make sure you outdent and get your end with in. And you can go ahead and pause the video and get those lines typed in. And once you're done, you're going to go ahead and compile your project. Check to make sure there are no errors. And we're going to switch back over to Excel. I'm using the icon on the toolbar to get there. And so now we're ready to test it. We told it what values to assign to each variable. And now we've told it where to display those variable values, which column and cell to display it in by using our offset statements within the with end with structure. So I'm going to just be on any cell in here and I'm going to do alt F eight to bring up our macros dialog box. And I'm going to click on parse then and then run, or you can double click it. And I'm like, yay, it worked. It put the right bits of data in the right cells except for country. What happened to country? Stay tuned and we'll take a look and you'll find out. Just so you know, I did this on purpose. You can blame me, but I did it on purpose because a lot of coding is troubleshooting and we get to debugging code in like the last chapter of the last lesson of this course. But along the way, you're going to run into situations and it's helpful to get some guidance in what to do. So in this case, everything worked except it didn't populate country in row two. So the first thing we're going to do, since it didn't work the way it's designed to work, is we're going to delete, we're going to select B through G2 
and just press delete. And we're gonna switch back over to the Visual Basic Editor. So the last thing we did was our width and width structure, and I'm gonna start there. And I look through the list and our offset statements, pardon my OCD, but I have them in order, one, two, three, four, five, six. Again, I don't wanna be looking up and down if I'm troubleshooting to, to figure out where something is. But I do have an offset statement for country. So I'm like, okay, it's not that. The compiler did not pick up any errors. So it's something that I probably missed. So I look up in the upper half of this and I said, you know, we're gonna tackle these variables in their order. So we started with Venom, then we went to year, make, model, color, and then we skipped country and went to classification. So we never did our country intrinsic function to tell it what value to assign to that variable which means that it can't display anything even though we did an offset statement. I'm gonna click after the color mid function line and press enter so it's in order. The first character of the VIN represents the country. So we're gonna use the left intrinsic function here. We're gonna type country equals left open paren, then num, and we want it to extract one character, which is the first character, from the left side of the then number. And we're gonna close our parentheses. We're gonna press enter just so it does any formatting. And then I'm gonna delete that extra line and shift tab, so classification. We're gonna go ahead and compile our project again, make sure there's no errors. And now we're gonna switch back over to Excel, we're gonna do Alt F8 to access our macros box. And we're gonna run parse then again. And now you'll see that the year, make, model, color, country, and classification columns are filled in appropriately as a result of the parse then procedure. So because we created a sub procedure in this file, you probably want to go ahead and save it as macro enabled workbook. And I'm going to let you go ahead and do that on your own. And when you're done and you look in your working directory, you have two vehicles file. One is just a regular Excel file and the other is macro enabled. And now you have two VIN numbers. You have your regular one that we started with and then the macro enabled one that you just saved. Now we're gonna to begin to get some background information on both the message box function and the input box functions in Visual Basic. So we're gonna start with the message box function. On this slide, it has the syntax. So in parentheses, you have a prompt, which is required. And then you have two optional arguments, buttons and title. The message box function displays a pop-up box with a message for the user. Another thing, VBA will allow you to use the function without enclosing the arguments in parentheses. A best practice here is to always enclose function arguments in parentheses so you err on the side of caution and to provide consistency in your code. Now, if you do not use the title argument, the title defaults to the name of the application, which in this case is Excel, Microsoft Excel. So the table on the right tells you about the argument. It displays text in a message box for the end user. The buttons is a number that specifies which buttons and icons appear in the message box. This is optional. If it's not used, the message box will default to the OK button. And then you have the title argument. And like I said, if you don't use the title argument, it defaults to the name of the application. But if you want it to say something else in the title bar of the message box, then you would use this argument. To choose which buttons and or icons display in your message box, you do that by using what are known as VBA constants. Constants are similar to variables. They are declared. However, while variable values can change during program execution, constant values do not change. 
and visual basic for applications constant names are preceded by lowercase vb. So you have a table on the right. We're not going to review this again. The slide deck is in your video description files and you can use it for future reference. But if you just want an okay button in your message box, the value for that particular constant is zero. If you wanted a question mark icon in your message box, you would use the value of 32 to represent that. In addition to referencing the icons and the buttons in the message box by utilizing their values, as we saw in the previous slide, you can just use the VB constant name. If you say VB yes, no plus VB exclamation, it will display the yes and no buttons with the exclamation point icon. If you have VB OK cancel plus VB critical, you'll get the OK and cancel buttons and the critical warning icon. And you can also have multiple lines for the prompt argument by using the VB new line constant. So here's an example. MSG box, that's the message box function, in parentheses, in double quotes, because it's text. Do you want to continue? Question mark. Then we're using the concatenation character, the ampersand, to combine everything. And we're using the VB new line constant. So it's saying go down to the next line. And on the next line, it's going to say click yes to continue. Then after that, so all of that is the prompt argument. And then we say VB yes, no plus VB question. So we want the yes and no buttons and the question mark icon. And then the last argument is the title. And we're going to put in step one of three for a title. And when we get back into Visual Basic Editor to use the message box function, you'll use the assignment operator, which is the equal sign, to assign the return value of a message box button to a variable. You'll see that in a bit. And we're also going to be using the input box function, similar syntax to message box has three arguments, one of which is required, which is the prompt. It has a title argument and a default argument. And an input box is used to obtain a single piece of information from the user. The information could be a value, a text string, or even a range address. Input boxes always display OK and cancel buttons. So the prompt argument is just like the prompt argument for a message box. The title argument is the same as well. It's optional, but it's the text value that appears in the title bar. And if you don't use it, it would be the name of the application. And then the default argument is new to you here. It's the default argument for the user's input. So it's optional, but you can pre-populate it. And if the user doesn't want what you pre-populate it with, they can type over it. So we're going to get ready to use both the message box and the input box functions. We'll be working again in our vehicles macro enabled file. I'm in the visual basic editor for our vehicles macro enabled file. And in the project explorer window, I'm going to go ahead and double click sheet three new vehicles. So this is where we use the event procedure. When the new vehicle sheet is activated, it runs the get new inventory calling procedure, which bundles all the other procedures to retrieve that data. And so we're going to make this further automated by modifying this procedure here. And it's going to give the end user a choice whether they want to get the new inventory or not. So we're going to modify this worksheet activate sub procedure and click right in front of where it says get new inventory and press enter a few times and then use your up arrow to go back up. So we want that blank line after private sub worksheet activate again, just for spacing purposes. And when you have to debug your code, it's easier to read. So what we're going to do is we're going to declare a variable and it's a procedure level variable. So it'll only be available in this 
sub procedure. So we're going to use our dem keyword and we're going to name the variable response and we're going to declare it as an integer. And then I'm going to press enter. And this is how you assign the user input from a message box results to a variable. Our next line is going to do just that. We're going to type response equals, remember the equal sign is the assignment operator. And then we're going to type MSG box. We want to use our line continuation character here. We're going to do a space and then an underscore and press enter. And remember, if we didn't do that and we just press enter, we'd get an error because it's expecting the rest of the message box arguments, the rest of its syntax rather, on the same line unless we tell it to continue to, on the next line. So that's what we've done here. And then we're going to tab again. And we're going to do an open paren, double quotes. Do you want to run the get new inventory procedure? Question mark, closing double quote, comma. So that's our prompt argument. And your argument separated by commas. Now we want another line continuation. So we're going to do a space and an underscore and enter. We're ready for what combination of buttons we want in the message box, as well as which icon. So we're going to type, we're going to use the constant names, VB, yes, no, plus VB question, comma. And for our title bar argument, our title argument, it's going to be in double quotes, run, get new inventory. And I'm going to put a question mark at the end of that and close the quotes. And now we're ready to do our closing parenthesis. Now we're going to press enter and we're going to shift tab to get back to the margin. So, so far we've declared a variable response as an integer. And we're saying response equals whatever the user choices are in the message box. Well, we have to tell it what to do based on a user choice. So now we're going to type if, and then response equals VB, yes, then, and now I'm going to use my delete key to get the get new inventory line on that same line. If the response equals yes. So if there's going to be a yes and a no button in the message box, if the response equals yes, then run the procedure. And we're not telling it what to do if they say no in the message box. So if they say no, it's not going to do anything. In other words, it's not going to run the procedure. Go ahead and compile your project. Make sure there's no errors there. And let's go ahead and save. So now we're ready to test this message box function. And I'm going to just do Alt F11 to switch back over to Excel or any way you want to get there is fine. And we're going to click on the new vehicle sheet tab. And let's just say no at this point, right? So this time when we click on it, instead of just running the procedure, it gives us our message box. Let's say no on the message box and it doesn't bring in any of the new vehicle information. Go back to your inventory sheet tab, click on new vehicles again, and now you'll see your title bar, run get new inventory. You see it has the question mark icon in the message box and it has yes and no buttons. So we're gonna click yes this time and it ran the procedure. And we're gonna select everything by doing control A and pressing delete and then just click in cell A1 on new vehicle sheet again and go back to your inventory sheet. Now we're going to switch back over to Visual Basic. We're going to use the input box function in our next example. So we want to, in Visual Basic Editor, we want to go to our new vehicles module. And we're going to modify this get new vehicle sub procedure. 
the scenario here is that it defaults to opening that received vehicles file, right? And copying and pasting the information from it. So suppose that that file changes over time. Maybe this month it's called received vehicles. Maybe next month it's called something else. We want to give the users, the end user, the ability to put in what the actual file name is. Most of the time it will be received vehicles. So we're going to use that as a default setting that the user can override as necessary. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and update the comment line. So I'm going to just select that first comment line that says get new vehicles macro. I'm going to leave the exclamation point there though. So it will retain its status as a comment line. And I'm going to type prompts the user for the name of a file comma, opens the file, comma, selects the data. And the second comment line, the copy and paste data, we're going to just say copy and paste data into the current workbook. So it's going to be a more accurate description than what it was before. Underneath, I'm going to press enter a couple of times. And now I'm ready to declare two procedure level variables. They're both going to be strings. So we're going to do dim file location, comma, file as string. So our two string variables. And now I'm going to click in front of workbooks.open file name and press enter a few times. And then I'm going to up arrow. So I have a blank space after our variable declarations. And I'm going to type file location equals this workbook dot path, the directory path to this particular workbook, this vehicles workbook. So we're assigning that path to the variable file location. I'm going to press enter. And now we're going to say file equals, and we're going to type input box, open paren, double quotes. What is the name of the new vehicles file? Question mark, double quote, comma. And we want our line continuation character here. So space and underscore and enter. Now we're going to tab in one time and now we're ready for the title argument. So that is the prompt argument. What is the name of the new vehicles file? Now we're ready for the title argument and it's going to be in double quotes, new vehicles, file name, question mark, close your quote, comma, line continuation. So your space underscore enter. And our last argument here for input box is the default argument. So the actual text box in the input box will be populated with, and we're going to put it in double quotes, received vehicles, and you have to have the extension dot XLSX, close your quotes, closing paren, enter. We're almost done with this one. And we're going to do shift tab just to get to the same margin as file location and file. And we're going to type file equals file location, the ampersand for our concatenation character. And then in double quotes, a backslash, another ampersand and file. So we're saying that the file location is the path on your directory path to this workbook, the vehicles workbook. And the file variable is going to be the result of the user's input box choice. If they keep the default, it will be received vehicles.xlsx. If they overtype that, it'd be whatever they overtype it with. And then we're saying we want to combine the file location and the file with a backslash in between the file location and the file name. And that is then going to be what the variable file represents. And this is assuming 
that the received vehicles file or whatever file has the new inventory in it is in the same directory path as this workbook. We have one other change to make to the existing code that was here. So I'm going to go underneath my file equal file location concatenated line, and I'm going to just delete the blank lines that are there. And now we're going to change that workbooks.open file name line. So what I'm going to do is after the equal sign at the end of that line, I'm going to type file. And then we're going to delete the continuation character. Notice how we get that red line underneath because we don't have, we're not telling it to continue on the next line. And we're going to delete that whole path there because now we're saying open the file based on the variable file. So file is now the file location path and whatever file is in not name is in the input box, whether it's received vehicles or whether the end user types in something else. So we don't need the rest of that stuff that we had there. Go ahead and compile your project and save. So now we're going to be ready to test this. And I will say we've given now the end user the ability to say no or yes, that they want to run the get new inventory procedure. And now the additional use of being able to dictate which file to bring the data into from. I'm gonna just go over to my Excel and I'm on the inventory sheet tab. I'm gonna click on new vehicles and there's our message box. And we're gonna say yes, that we do want to run the get new inventory procedure. And now we see our input box. We point out the title argument, new vehicles, file name, question mark, right? Here's our prompt. What is the name of the new vehicles file? And then we have our default argument where it populates it with receive vehicles.xlsx and it can be overwritten by the end user. We're gonna click okay to accept the default and it runs the procedure. And of course, we are going to select everything and delete it. Actually go back to your inventory sheet tab. The last part of this lesson is getting used to object variables. So they're used to make your code more concise. They help you avoid typing lengthy object references. And when you're declaring object variables, the scope statements you use with regular variables are applicable. So your dim, private, public keywords are the same. Object variables are declared with object types instead of data types. So we have the syntax there. You could use dim, public, private, static, the name of the variable as the object type. So examples would be public sheet as worksheet, dim range as range. When you assign values to object variables, you have to use the set keyword. So your basic syntax would be set variable name equal object name, set sheet equal worksheets year to date sales, set range equal active sheet dot range A1 through F12. Once you assign an object to an object variable, the object can be referenced by its variable name. Now we're gonna do exercises obviously using object variables and we're gonna be using the sales fiscal year dot Excel SX Excel workbook in your directory. It was a file from your video description. So in this Excel file, we have multiple sheet tabs. If I just right click on your tab scrolling arrows, You'll see going from June 1st, 2016 to August 26, 2016. Each sheet is representing sales on that day. So you have your VINs, your year make model classification color, dealer costs, MSRP, selling price, and the salesperson. Each sheet has different 
amounts of data. So different amounts of rows of data, depending on the sales on that particular date. We're going to use object variables and we're going to create a sub procedure that will sum the column column I, the selling price column, and place the result in a cell two rows below the last populated cell in that column. So for example, on the 26th of August sheet, we want the selling price sum to be two rows underneath the last selling price in column I. And we're gonna use object variables to set that up. Let's go ahead and switch over to the visual basic editor and make sure you're in the right project. If you still have your vehicles file open, you may not see it here. If you don't see your file, your sales fiscal year file listed over here, sometimes you have to close the visual basic editor. Like mine's been open the whole time. So I'm going to close it and then go back into it. Just a little trick. Sometimes it doesn't refresh. And now I can see projects for sales fiscal year, which has a lot of Microsoft Excel objects because of all the sheets. I can collapse that and I still have my vehicles project there as well. Collapse that. What we want to do in here is start this code where we're going to declare object variables. So we're going to expand our sales fiscal year project and you can collapse your Microsoft Excel objects folder, right click on your sales fiscal year project in project Explorer, hover over insert and choose module. And in module one, we're going to start a sub procedure. We can just, this one's not going to be very long. We can just type it in. So we're going to type sub and we're naming it add totals. And I'm going to press enter twice and then I'm going to tab and I'm going to declare my object variables. So we're going to use the dim keyword and the variable name is going to be last cell as a range. So as an object, not a data type. So we're dimming last cell. We're declaring last cell as a range enter. And we're going to dim total formula as a string and enter. So two object variable declarations. I'm going to enter again and then tab. We're going to set. So we have to use the set keyword when assigning a value to an object variable. Last cell equals and then range. And in parentheses and double quotes, we're going to type I2. So cell reference I2. Close your quotes, close your parentheses, type the dot notation and then end. And now when you type an open parentheses, you'll have a list that pops up and we're looking for the entry that says Excel down. That's an Excel constant. And we're going to close the parentheses. So that line is saying, starting in cell I2, go all the way to the end of that column until you find the last populated cell. We're going to press enter and we're going to type last cell dot select, right? So the last populated cell is now selected in column I, press enter. And we're going to do active cell dot offset. You remember our offset before in parentheses, we're going to do two close the parentheses. So we're saying the last populated cell is currently selected and we want to go down two rows dot select and select that blank cell two rows down from the last populated cell. Now we have to tell it what the object variable total formula is going to be. So we're going to do total formula equals in double quotes, equal sum open paren I two colon close your double quotes space and an ampersand. We'll get this one typed in and then I'll explain it. And then a space last 
cell dot address, which will be on your list. Open paren, false, false, closing paren, space ampersand, and then in double quotes, a closing paren. And you're like, what? Okay, so basically it's saying we have that last cell, right? Selected the last cell uh, object variable is set to the last populated cell. So it's saying, give the total formula, give me the sum from cell I2 through the last cell address, wherever that last populated cell is. It could be I24, could be I26, whatever it is. And then it wants to know if that last cell address is absolute and we're saying false. It's not absolute by row, it's not absolute by column. And then we just need to enclose it in a parenthesis, a literal parenthesis. So we have that in double quotes as well. And now we just have to assign it. So we're gonna go down and we're gonna type active cell dot formula equals total formula. Declared two object variables. We set both of them. Well, last cell, we, we said it's from I2, the last populated cell starting in cell I2, and then select that last populated cell, offset it by two rows, and populate the total formula result in that cell that's two rows underneath the last populated cell in column I. That's what you just did. And we have our in sub statement there. And you're gonna go ahead and compile your project and save. So when we get to the save part, right, it lets us know that this is a macro free workbook. We could lose our code here. So we're gonna do no on that message box and you're gonna save it same file name as macro enabled. We are gonna test this sub procedure in a different way than we've seen our procedures run before. So normally we've been running our procedures and the entire block runs. We wanna see kinda of like the behind the scenes, step-by-step -step version of what happens when we test this add total sub procedure with our object variables. So I've arranged my windows. I have my Visual Basic Editor on one side of my screen, and I have the Excel Sales Fiscal Year, now macro enabled workbook on the other side of my screen. So take a moment and get your screens arranged that way. And then in the Excel portion of your screen, you're gonna do Alt F8 to bring up your macro dialog box. Now I still have my vehicles file open. So you'll see the macros that are in that file, the, the code blocks that are in that file, but you also see our add totals code here. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna just click once on add totals and over on the right, you're gonna click on step into. So now in your visual basic editor, you'll see that the name of the sub procedure is highlighted in yellow and there's a yellow arrow in the margin. So at this point, if we were running the procedure, it would be at this step. It would just be highlighting the sub line of the procedure. There's no change in our Excel window at all. We used step into from the macro dialog box. The shortcut key for step into once it started is just the F8 key on your keyboard. So now we're gonna press F8. So it skipped the lines, our object variable declarations, right? It, it skipped those lines and it went to the first line of code. So it's saying set last cell equals range I2 and Excel down. So we want the last cell to be the last populated cell in column I. But notice there's still no change on your Excel workbook at this point. Press F8 again. 
And now it's on the last cell select line. Again, you're not seeing any change in Excel. Let's F8 again. Now you're seeing a change in Excel. In Excel, it has now selected the last populated cell in column I. So when this active cell dot offset line is yellow highlighted, you'll see the step before it. You're now seeing the results of last cell dot select. Press F8 again. So now you're seeing the results of active cell offset by two rows. So now it's selected the cell two rows underneath the last populated cell in column I. We're going to F8 again. No change in Excel because we told it what the total formula is, right? It's the sum of from I to the last populated cell in column I. At this point, we haven't told it where to put that result. So go ahead and press F8 again, and you'll get the result now. Active cell dot formula equals the result of the total formula object variable. So you can see how this can be useful when you have varying amounts of data on different sheets, but you want the sum to be two rows underneath the last populated cell in a particular column. We're going to press F8 one more time to finish the procedure. So now all your yellow shading is gone in Visual Basic. And on that one sheet, the 26th of August sheet, we do have the sum of column I's selling prices. In this lesson, we did a deeper dive into foundational VBA language elements, and we started by getting an understanding of variables. And you learned that variables store data in your computer's memory when procedures are executed, and the data may or may not end up on disk. Some data resides in objects like worksheet ranges, and other data is stored in the variables that you create. And so you learned about the naming conventions um, when you declare variables, how to declare them. You learned about the data types that are supported in VBA and the importance of assigning data types to the variables you declare so that it uses the least amount of memory on your computer. You learned about the scope of variables, meaning where they can be accessed from, as well as two methods of declaring them, which is implicit and explicit. And we have the option explicit statement at the top of all of our modules. So it forces us to explicitly declare our variables, which is the preferred method because implicit declarations can often lead to code errors. And so we moved on to covering some intrinsic functions and we use the left, mid, and right functions to extract data from the VIN string. We learned how to make our code more concise by using the with end with structure. It decreases the amount of typing that you have to do. And we did that when we used the offset property to put the extracted data into the right cells. We moved on to using the message box function to give the end user more control over whether a procedure runs or not. You learned about visual basic constants, which are used to control which buttons display in the message box, as well as which icon displays in the message box. And then we moved on to input box, which gave the end user the ability to change to a different file to get that data brought into the main vehicles file. And you saw that it has similar arguments to the message box function, but it also has a default argument, which we populate it with the name of a file and the end user can overwrite that. And then we ended up with declaring object variables. And we did that so that we can configure a sum function on a sheet that shows two rows below the last populated cell in a particular column. 
And this is useful when you have sheets with varying lengths of data on it to be able to set up object variables and get the result in the same position relative to the last populated cell in a column. So lesson five is about controlling program executions. We're going to start by learning about control of flow structures, as well as Boolean expressions. You'll learn about conditional branching, looping constructs in this lesson as well. We're going to be using our regular vehicles, macro enabled sales, fiscal year, macro enabled files, as well as two text files in the video description. One is called inventory append and the other is called model. To this point, we've worked with code blocks, either the ones that we created via macro recordings or by writing sub and function procedures that progress line by line through the code. This is known as a sequential structure. There will be situations where a sequential structure is not what you need for your project. And we actually got to visually see a sequential structure where we did our object variables and we stepped into the code seeing line by line how it works in the background. In VBA, you use control of flow structures in your code to make decisions such as which statements to skip, testing conditions to determine what the code should do next, and to execute some statements multiple times. You've seen a small example of that when we did our message box function where we modified that event procedure with an if then construct. So if they did the yes button in the message box, it would run the code. If they did the no button, it would do nothing. So you've had a small example of that already. So here you're seeing the common control of flow structures. You have sequential, which we've already discussed. You have unconditional branching, and you've seen that already. You're just not aware of it yet. And that's a statement directs the flow of execution to another location in the program without condition. So when we created a calling procedure, that is unconditional branching. You're going to learn about conditional branching. The code to be executed is based on the outcome of an expression that evaluates to true or false, a Boolean expression. And that's also known as a decision structure. And it is used to implement conditional branching. And then we have our looping structure, which a block of code is executed repeatedly as long as a certain condition exists. Within the conditional branching and looping structures, there are constructs that you use to carry out the job of the structure. So we're going to focus on our conditional branching right now. We'll revisit this slide later to go over our looping structures. But within your conditional branching, there are two different constructs. There's if then and select case. So if then, statement does something if something is true. Your select case statement does any of several things depending on something's value. And we're going to focus right now on our if then constructs. And you also need to know a little bit about Boolean expressions here. So let's do that first. So Boolean expression evaluates to true or false. They usually contain two expressions on either side of a comparison operator. If the expression evaluates to true, the condition is met and the structure passes control to the code to be executed. So we have an example here, sheets.count less than three. If the count of sheets in the workbook is less than three, the expression is true. If the sheet count is greater than or equal to three, the expression is false. Boolean expression, expressions are of the integer data type. So they're stored as zero for false and negative one for true. But now we're going to just briefly go over these comparison operators. The ones that I like to know about when I tackle a new programming language is how is not equal to represent it because it varies according to a different programming language. So in here, it's less than and equal to symbols together in VBA. Also at the bottom of the slide, 
you use the is keyword to compare object variables, and you use the like keyword to compare string expressions in Visual Basic. Then you have the logical operators. And so you can test for more than one condition by joining Boolean expressions with a logical operator. We have the table here. We have and, or, not, and exclusive or. When you're using the and operator, each expression must evaluate to true for the entire condition to be true. When you're using or, only one of the expressions must evaluate to true for the condition to be true. The not logical operator says the expression must evaluate to false for the condition to be true. And then you have exclusive or, which returns true if the expressions are different. So I have a couple of examples of joined expressions here. Year greater than 2017 and make equals Chevrolet. Both of those conditions have to be true because it's using the and keyword in order for the expression to evaluate to true. Selling price less than or equal to 15,000 or list price greater than 15,000. Only one of those statements has to be true in order for the expression to be true because it's using the or logical operator. The if then construct has four variations that can be used in Visual Basic for applications. So we've already seen if then. If the condition evaluates to true, it executes the code after the then statement. If the condition evaluates to false, it does nothing. The next variation is if then end if. It's the same as if then, but it closes the if block with the end if statement. And I'll just let you know now, most of the time it needs to be closed with that end if statement or you'll get an error. Then you have the if then else end if variation. If the condition evaluates to true, it will execute the code after the then statement. If the condition evaluates to false, it will execute the code after the else statement. This is the one that's most similar to the if function in Excel. In the if function, you give it a condition and you tell it what to do if the condition is true and what to do if the condition is false. And then we have if then, else if, end if. And by the way, you can also have if then, else if, else, end if. And this is used to test multiple conditions. And it can take an action on any that evaluate to true. And again, the else statement can be used if all conditions evaluate to false. So if condition is true, let's say if condition one is true, then it will execute the code after the then statement. Else if condition two is true, right? or condition three, condition four, condition five. So the ability to test multiple conditions and say what to do if any of them are true. There is another conditional branching structure, which we'll talk about before we use, and that's the select case statement. But for right now, we're gonna go ahead and use our if then constructs. I'm back in the Visual Basic Editor and I'm in the code window for our Sheet 3 new vehicles. So that event procedure, which we already modified um, to add our if then statement, we're actually going to put in a if then end if statement in here. Imagine if there's something already populating cell A1 on your new vehicle sheet. If that's the case, if the sheet is already populated, you don't want it to have the message box asking if they want to run the get new inventory procedure because the sheet is already populated. Only if that cell is empty do we want it to bring up the message box offering the end user the choice to run the procedure. So we're gonna create an if statement and let's click at the end of our dim response as integer line and press enter. 
and I'm actually gonna press enter twice. And then I'm gonna do my tab key. And we're gonna start typing this if then end if construct. So I'm gonna type if and then active sheet dot range and then in parentheses and double quotes A1 for cell A1 and you want to close your quotes and close your parentheses dot value equals and we're going to have a set of double quotes which means it's empty so two double quotes no space in between and then we're going to type the then keyword if cell A1 on the new vehicle sheet is empty then right we want it to do response equals message box do you want to run to get new inventory procedures so all of the stuff that we have there and now what we need to do click after that if response equals vb yes line press enter and tab and type end if now the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna click in front of that if response equals VB yes line, and we're gonna press tab twice. We have an if construct nested within an if then end if construct. It will only bring up that message box. Do you wanna run the get new inventory procedure if cell A1 on new vehicles is empty? Let's go ahead and compile and then save and switch over to Excel. Go to your new vehicle sheet, say no, you don't wanna run the procedure and just type anything in cell A1. It could be number, text, anything. Now go back to your inventory sheet and back to new vehicles and you'll notice that the message box does not pop up because cell A1 is not empty. So now you can click on cell A1 and delete that information, go back to inventory, back to new vehicles, and because the sheet is not populated, or at least cell A1 is not populated, it displays the message box. And we're gonna say no on that message box. So now we're gonna create a function procedure and we're gonna do it in our new vehicles module for our vehicles macro enabled file. And we're gonna create a function procedure with two arguments. This is going to evaluate the character in the VIN that represents the model year and then mark up the cost based on whether the vehicle is from the current or previous year. So the VIN character is the 11th character in the VIN. So we're going to use an intrinsic function here within an if then else end if structure. So we're giving it something to do based on two different things, right? What to do if our condition is true and what to do if it's false. So the 11th character of the VIN is either populated with an A or a B. The A means it's the previous year, in which case it will get a 10% markup. The B means it's the current year and it will get a 15% markup. So I'm gonna guide you through this now. So I'm in mod new vehicles and I did control end to get to the bottom of the module. And I'm gonna type the name of the function that we're using here. So it's gonna be function and it's gonna be called get MSRP. And in parentheses, we're gonna give it two parameters, dealer cost and then num and press enter twice. So now you'll have your function and end function statements. And this is where we're gonna now set up the if construct using the mid function. So I'm going to tab and I'm going to type if mid open paren then num comma 11 one. So if the 11th character of the then number close your paren equals and then double quotes B then enter and tab get MSRP equals dealer cost times 1.15 and then we can put a comment at the end of that line so i'm going to do a single quote and afterwards i'm going to type vehicle is current 
model year and then press enter. So only the comment portion of that line turned green. Anything after the apostrophe or single quote turns green. And it's just explaining what that math is on that line and that the character B represents the current model year. Okay, so now we have that. We're going to do a shift tab to get back to the same margin as if. And we're going to type else, enter, tab. And we're going to type get MSRP equals dealer cost asterisk for multiplication 1.1, which is 10%. We're going to do a comment, a line comment there. So your apostrophe and then vehicle is previous model year. Enter shift tab. And you need to type an end if statement here. And then I'm going to press enter again. So I have that blank line between end if and end function. Now we're going to go ahead and compile and save. And we're going to call this function from another procedure. So we're not going to test it quite yet. What we're going to do is we're going to go to the upper right corner where it says get MSRP in your procedure list. We're going to do the drop down arrow there, and we're going to select the get new inventory procedure just to navigate to that procedure. In the get new inventory procedure, we're going to declare two local variables. So right underneath the comment line, I'm going to, at the end of the comment line, I'm going to press enter twice. And I'm going to just declare these two local variables. So we're going to dim dealer cost as single data type. And then the next line, we're going to dim then number as string data type. So we have our variables declared. Click at the end of the add formatting line and press enter. And you're going to type range and then in parentheses and double quotes a2 dot select so we want it to select cell a2 and so a2 on the inventory sheet is where the first vin number resides so we want that cell selected and then we're going to assign the vin number variable that cell as its value so the next line down we're going to do vin number equals active cell dot value and enter. And now we want to assign the dealer cost value in cell G2 on that sheet to the variable dealer cost. So on this line, we're going to type dealer cost equals active cell dot offset. So we have to offset it by six columns, no rows. So it'll go to G2, where the first dealer cost would be. So we're going to do a comma because we're not using the row offset. And then a six, close your paren dot value. So we're assigning the value of cell G2 to the dealer cost variable. And then we're going to call on the next line down, we're going to call the get MSRP function and put its result in cell H2. So that line is going to be active cell dot offset in parentheses comma seven, which takes us to H2. And we're going to do dot value. So the value of cell H2 is going to equal, and this is how we call the function procedure by its name and its parameters, get MSRP, and then in parentheses, dealer cost, comma, then number. Let's go ahead and compile in our get new inventory and save, and we're going to switch over to Excel. So now we're going to test this get MSRP function by initiating our calling 
procedures. So we're going to go to the new vehicle sheet and we're going to say yes, that we want to run the procedure. We're going to use the default file name and you'll notice that the MSRP column is not wide enough now, right? Um, and that is an easy fix. So let's select everything on this sheet and delete it and switch back over to the Visual Basic Editor. If you look at our Get New Inventory sub procedure, the Add Formatting procedure is being called before we do the Get MSRP section of this. So we just need to move Add Formatting to right above the end sub statement. So I'm going to just select it and cut it. And then I'm going to click at the end of the active cell offset line, press enter, and then I'm going to control V to paste it and get rid of the extra space by doing shift tab in front of it. We had add formatting in the wrong position. So now to add the formatting at the end after the MSRP is already calculated. And so now I'm going to compile and save again and switch back over to Excel, go back to the inventory sheet tab, back to new vehicles. Yes, run the procedure, keep the default. And now you'll see that the MSRP column is populated and formatted accordingly. So the column width has been adjusted and everything. And again, it's either 10 or 15%, depending on whether the 11th character is a B or an A in the VIN. Now we can clear the sheet again, the new vehicle sheet, and we're going to create another function procedure that will get the year in the appropriate column on this sheet. We can just go back to the inventory sheet after you clear it and then switch back over to the visual basic editor window. I'm still in my new vehicles module. I'm going to click at the end of the end function statement at the bottom for our get MSRP function. I'm going to press enter twice and we're going to type function and this one we're going to name get year and we're going to give it one parameter and that's going to be then num press enter a couple of times in this one we want to declare a local variable it's going to be named year marker with a string data type so i'm going to just do dim year marker as string we're going to set the value of the year marker variable to the 11th character of the VIN. Remember that's the A or B either indicates the current year or a previous year. Type in year marker equals, and then we're going to use the mid function, mid open paren, then num comma 11 one, the 11th character of the VIN number, enter. And now we're going to use an if then else end if construct here as well. So I'm going to tab over if mid and then then num and you can copy and paste this if you want 11 one equals and then in double quotes a then enter tab get year equals 2018 and then I'm going to do a shift tab so I can get my else statement at the same margin as the if statement. So else enter and then tab get year equals 2019. Enter shift tab and end if. And I'm going to press enter again so I get that blank line between end if and end function. Now we have to tell the get new inventory procedure where to place the result of the get year function. So in your get new inventory procedure, I'm clicking at the end of the line that starts with dealer cost, press enter, and you're going to type active cell dot offset. And then in parentheses, comma one dot value equals get year 
and you have to put in the argument. So it's going to be uh, get year. We just use VIN number. And then you can go ahead and compile your get new inventory, compile get year if you haven't. It compiles everything in the module actually, so you only have to compile one. And then save. And then go ahead and switch over to Excel. Let's switch back to Excel and test our work. So at this point, we should be getting the MSRP and the year extracted from the VIN. Let's go ahead and test this. So I'm going to just go back to the new vehicles tab. I'm going to run the procedure, accept the defaults, let it click and whir. And we have our year in column B and our MSRP in column H. Again, we're going to select everything and delete it. Go back to your inventory sheet and switch back over to the Visual Basic Editor. Now we're going to create another function procedure to extract the classification from the VIN. The classification is the 17th character of the VIN, the last character of the VIN. And depending on what its numeric value is, it would either be a classification of a car, a truck, a van slash minivan or an SUV. So we're going to put that function at the bottom of our new vehicles module. And we're going to just type function get classification is what we're naming it. And we're going to give it then num as a parameter. Press enter. We're going to do our function level or procedure level variable declaration. So we're going to do dim class marker is what we'll name this variable as string enter twice. Now we have to tell it which character of the VIN is the classification code. We're going to do that by saying class marker equals, we're going to use the right intrinsic function and then in parentheses, VIN num comma one, just extract the last character on the right of the VIN number, which is the 17th character representing the classification. Now we're ready to do an if then else if end if construct, because we're going to actually be testing four different things. So we're going to have our test that we do on the if line, and then we're going to have three else if lines. So it tests three other things. We'll start that. I'm going to press enter twice, and then I'm going to tab. And I'm going to type if class marker equals one, then enter and tab, get classification equals, and in double quotes, car, enter shift tab. Now we're ready for our first of the three else if statements we're going to do. Else if is one word, initial capital letters on each one in Visual Basic. So else if class marker equals two, then enter tab, get classification equals, and then double quotes, truck. Enter shift tab. Your next else if, else if class marker equals three, then enter tab, get classification equals, and in quotes, van slash minivan. And do your last else if, so if the class marker is four, then the classification is SUV. And you can see my else if statement for the SUV. I'm going to press enter and shift tab. And then I have to type my end if, and you want to make sure you have press enter. So you get the blank line between end if and end function. Now we're going to navigate. And again, I'm using the procedure list. I want to go back to get new inventory procedure. And so we've been adding these active cell offset lines 
to put the year and the MSRP in their correct cells, right? We have one there for dealer cost as well. And we want to make this code more concise. So we're going to create a with end with block because we have other things that we're going to be extracting as well. So it'll make this code more concise. I'm going to click at the end of the dealer costs equals line and press enter. And I'm going to type with active cell. And then on the next line down, I'm going to double click active cell before the dot offset and delete it. Just leaving the dot offset. Do the same thing on the next line. Go to the end of the last dot offset line, press enter and type end with. So now you're going to go back and click after the dot offset comma one line, press enter, and we can add the offset here for the classification. So we're going to do dot offset and this one's going to be comma four dot value equals get classification, the name of our function, and then we're using VIN number as the argument here. So this way we have the offsets in order so far, one, four, and seven, and that makes it easier to troubleshoot. Now I'm gonna press enter at the end of that line just to get the spacing, and then I have to delete and shift tab again. So now we have our with block set up. I'm gonna select from with down to end with and press my tab key so that that with end with structure is indented. Now we can compile and save and switch over to Excel and we're going to test this. So at this point, we should have the year, the classification and the MSRP populate when we test this. So go ahead and switch over, start your procedure, accept the default. And now we have the year, the classification, and the MSRP extracted from the VIN. And we can switch back over to Visual Basic Editor. We've just used the if then else if end if construct. And there is a variation on that, a different construct that mimics its use. And it's called the select case in select statement. So it also tests for multiple conditions. A lot of people think that select case is easier to read than the if then else if end if construct and also easier to troubleshoot. So the if then else if end if construct has limitations. It can only test like seven conditions, but with select case, you're unlimited in the number of conditions that it can test. So I have a slide in here giving you the syntax, but we're going to just go ahead and use it. Before we set up our first select case construct to extract the color from the VIN number, I'm going to have you switch back over to Excel and select everything on the new vehicle sheet, delete it, and then go back to the inventory sheet and then come back into Visual Basic Editor. I'm at the bottom of the new vehicles module underneath the get classification function. And I am going to type function and we're going to call it get color. And we're going to use then num as a parameter. Press enter twice. We're going to do a variable declaration here. So dim, we're going to name it color marker as string and enter twice. We need to tell it which character of the VIN number represents the color. And it's the 12th character of the VIN. It's only one character. So we're going to use the mid function here. Color marker equals mid and then in parentheses VIN num comma 12 comma one. So extract the 12th character of the VIN number that represents the color. Going to press enter twice and then tab. Now we're ready for our select case construct. So we're going to type select case and then color marker. Press enter and tab. 
case zero, enter tab, get color equals, and then double quotes black. So if the 12th number of the then is the 12th character of the then is a zero that represents the color black. Press enter and we're gonna shift tab just till we get to the case margin and we're gonna type case one, enter tab, get color equals white in double quotes. And press enter, shift tab. Now I'm gonna fill out the rest of the cases and the rest of the select case statement and then you'll be able to just copy it from my screen. Now you can pause the video and complete your select case statement. Uh, don't forget the in select at the bottom if you need to make sure that that is there as well. So you have your other cases there, go ahead and get those populated. And once you have that function, get color completed, we need to go back to the get new inventory procedure and we need to add the appropriate offset in our width end width block for the color. And so it's an offset of five columns. So I'm going to click at the end of the get classification offset line and type another offset with a comma five dot value. And that one's going to equal get color and it's using then number as an argument. So we have that all set up. Now we'll test the color in just a moment, but first we're going to create another function procedure and we're not going to have to type this one from scratch because I have a text file that you're going to access that's in the video description that we'll use for this one. So in the meantime, just go ahead and compile and save. I'm going to do control and the end key to get to the very bottom of the new vehicles module. And after that, and make sure you're after the end function statement that's down there. And you're going to go to the insert menu and choose file. In your files for video description or whatever your working directory is where you pulled in these text files, you're going to open the text files folder and we're going to double click the get model text file. So now if you look at the bottom of your screen, it brings in this whole function. And so saving you some typing here, it's using a select case statement here. I'm going to just format it a little bit. So I want a blank line after function, another blank line after the variable declaration. And then I want to have my, yeah, we're, we're assigning it. We're telling it what numbers from the VIN number represent the model by using the mid function. So it's actually two characters, the third and the fourth characters of the VIN number represent the model. So I'm going to put an enter after the model marker equals mid line. Then I'm going to select everything from select case to end select, and I'm going to tab to indent it. Now my OCD gets the better of me here. I'm also going to tab in my cases and I can select multiple cases. So we don't have to spend time getting them indented properly and everything, but my OCD is just going crazy right now because I'm not doing that. But this is what happens when you bring it in from a text file. I'm just going to go to the bottom and put an enter in front of in function. So we have that space there. And so you could see it's two numbers starting with the third character of the VIN. If it's 16, it gives you the model as Katera. If it's 17, it's Seville, so on and so forth. And now what we have to do is we have to make reference to this in the get new inventory procedure so that the result is in the right cell. So I'm going to go back to get new inventory procedure using my procedure dropdown, and we're going to add an offset here. The offset for the model is three columns from the active cell. So I'm going to click at the end of my offset comma one line and do 
dot offset it's going to be comma three dot value equals get model with an argument of then number and we're going to compile and save now we have one more that we're going to do by typing it ourselves and then we'll test these three so the last one we're doing here um, if you look at the very bottom of my new vehicles module i have the framework of the function get make already set up and you need to copy that onto your screen recreate that onto your screen and then for the select case in select statement, I'm gonna put up a PowerPoint slide and have you kind of work through it on your own. Get your function, your variable declaration, and the fact that the make marker represents the second character of the then in. And once you get that in, you'll use the following PowerPoint as your guide to build your select case statement. And when you're done building it, you can go ahead and, and pause this video while you build your select case statement. You'll be able to see my completed block of code. And so you can see my completed get make function. And now the only thing we have to do is get its offset reference. And by the way, the make is offset by two columns. And we need to put that in our get new inventory procedure. So I'm going to switch to that procedure and put them in numerical order. So I'm clicking at the end of the offset comma one, pressing enter, and I'm going to do offset comma two dot value equals get make and with an argument of then number. And now we can compile and save and we can switch over to Excel. So we're just gonna get our procedure, our calling procedure running by clicking on the tab. You know how to do this. Go ahead and yes, select the default of received vehicles. And now we should have everything extracted in row two, the year, the make, the model, the classification, the color, dealer cost was already there. And we have our MSRP, which is a calculation, either 10% or 15% markup, depending on the year. Well done, everybody. You can clear that sheet and return to the inventory sheet tab. So we just used our conditional branching constructs, all variations of the if then construct and the select case construct. Now we're going to get into our looping constructs. We have the for to next loop, which executes a series of statements, a specified number of times. We have a for each next loop, which is used on collections and it loops through each object in the collection. And then you have your do while and do until loops, the do while loop statement does something if something else is true and the do until loop will do something until something becomes true we're going to get started with our do loops so they're used to execute a block of code repeatedly as we've been setting up our function procedures we've been seeing that it's extracting the pertinent information from the VIN number, but it's only populating the second row, whereas we have other VIN numbers on the sheet. And so we're gonna use these looping constructs to populate the rest of the sheet. Now there are two variations of the do loop, do while and do until. So the do while loop runs until, as long as a condition is true, and do until will run when a condition becomes true. Each of your do loops have two different syntaxes. Both of the constructs test a conditional value, but the differences between the two control how they handle the tested condition. Here's the two different syntaxes for do while. You can start with do while and give it the condition. 
And if that condition is true, it will run the statement block. Or you can have it run the statement block before testing the condition, which is the second syntax there. So the first syntax will execute the statement block zero or more times, depending on whether the condition is true. The second will execute the statement block at least once because it's not going to test the condition until it has executed the statement block. And the same holds true for do until. You can have it execute zero or more times by testing for the condition up front, or you can have it execute the statement block at least once because it tests the condition at the end. And then we have our for loops. So for to next and for each next. For to next executes a series of statements a specified number of times. The for each next loop is used on collections and it will loop through each object in the collection until there are no more objects. So they do the same thing just in a different way. So we're going to switch over to the Visual Basic Editor. And what we're going to do is we're going to modify our Get New Inventory sub procedure by adding a do while loop to it. The end result of this is that when we run the procedure in Excel, it is going to populate for all of the VIN numbers on the sheet. So all of the years, makes, models, color classification, all of that will be populated for all of the VIN numbers. We're going to start the modification. Look for the line in your get new inventory sub procedure that says VIN number equals active cell value. Click at the end of that line and press enter. And we're going to indent. So I'm going to press my tab key. And we're going to do do while, two separate words, then number, and we're going to say not equal to, so that's the less than or great and greater than signs together. Do while then number is not equal to, and we're going to put two double quotes to represent a blank. So it's going to run this loop as long as the then number is not empty. That's what we're saying to do there. It will stop running this loop when it finds an empty VIN number. And now what we're going to do, we're going to go down to add formatting line, click in front of it, press enter and up arrow. And you have to give the loop keyword here. So we're going to just type loop and actually indent the word loop. So it's at the same margin as do while. So it's going to run this loop as long as the VIN number not equal to empty. So not empty. And then we need to add a couple of other things here. Under our offset comma seven line, click at the end of that line and press enter. And we're going to do an offset of one row. So we're going to do dot offset and then in parentheses one dot select. And then underneath that, after your offset, one line, press enter, do shift tab, and you're going to type then number equals active cell dot value. So what does that do? So we have our offset. So as it's extracting things from our function procedures, it's putting them in the right cells. So after it does that, we're saying, go down one row. So right now the active cell, right, is range A2, which we assign to the VIN number variable. So the first VIN number is in cell A2, and that's what we're assigning to the VIN number variable. And now we're saying go down one row. So it will be on A3, the next VIN number, and it's assigning that cell's value to the VIN number variable. And then it will keep looping until it doesn't find any more VIN numbers. We're going to go ahead and compile and save, and we're ready to switch to Excel to test it. So start your procedure and of course, select the default file name. And now that you, you can see that it populated 
for every VIN number on the sheet. We did that do while loop, which says do continue doing this stuff, right? By extracting and putting it in the right offset columns, continue doing this stuff until you have no more VIN numbers. And it did just that. So now the sheet is populated. We're going to perform a few more tasks in this file. And one of the things that we want to do is I have another text file with an procedure in it called inventory append. And what it will do is once you run the procedure in here and you get the sheet populated, your new vehicle sheet populated, it's going to select everything from cell A2 through H11. So it's purposely going to ignore the headings. It's going to select from A2 to H11, and it is going to cut that selection. And then it's going to paste it on the bottom of the inventory sheet. So right now our inventory sheet goes through row 105. And anytime we bring in new vehicles, we want them appended at the bottom of the inventory sheet. So that's one thing that we're going to set up. And then the second thing that we're going to set up is we're going to write a sub procedure that will then delete the data on new vehicles. We've been deleting it manually this whole time. And then we'll add a line of code to call the procedure that deletes the data. Let's first start by deleting the data off of new vehicles as we've been doing typically. Go back to your inventory sheet and then switch back over to the Visual Basic Editor. Now we're still working in the new vehicles module. I wanna to get to the very bottom of that module. And this is where we're gonna use a text file to get the inventory append code. So we're gonna to go to the insert menu, file, and in your text files from the video description, you're gonna double click inventory append. So when we look at that sub procedure, right? It's using a, an object variable, dim last cell as range. And then we have dim response as integer. And we're assigning the response to the outcome of a message box that says append the new inventory now. It will have a yes, no button and its title bar says append inventory. If the user selects the yes button, then it's going to set the last cell to equal starting with H2 all the way down to the last populated cell in column H and then starting with A2. So basically it's going to select the range A2 through H, whatever the last row in column H that's populated in. And then it's going to cut that selection, switch to the inventory worksheet, and it's going to go to the bottom. It's going to find the last populated cell in column A, and then it's going to offset by one row. So it's going to go to the first blank cell in column A and start pasting the data from the new vehicles sheet tab. And then it's just going to select cell A1 and save the workbook. That's what that is going to do. Now, we're not going to test it right now. We're going to test it in a moment. We're going to create another sub procedure. This one is short and quick, so I didn't have a text file for it. Click at the end of that in sub statement for your inventory append procedure. Press enter and you're going to type sub clear sheet and press enter twice. So we're creating the sub procedure that's going to tell it to clear the new vehicles sheet, anything that's on it. So we're going to just do an indent here and we're going to type worksheets. Remember how to reference from a collection and then in quotes, new vehicles, close your quote, close your paren dot select. So go and select that worksheet. And then we're going to do cells dot select which will select all of the cells on the sheet, kind of like us doing control A. And then we're gonna do selection dot clear. So clear everything in those cells. And then we're gonna end with range and in parentheses and double quotes, A1 dot 
select. We want it to end up on cell A1. So that's our clear sheet sub procedure. So we're going to call clear sheet from within inventory append. In inventory append, we're going to click in front of active workbook dot save and press enter and up arrow. And we're going to just type clear sheet to call that procedure. So we want it to clear the new in the new vehicle sheet before the workbook is saved. And last but not least, we are going to call the inventory append sub procedure from our get new inventory procedure. So I'm going to go to my procedure drop down, make my way back to get new inventory. And we're just going to add the call line here. Click at the end of the add formatting line, which is right above in sub press enter. And we're going to type inventory append to call that procedure. And that procedure is going to call the clear sheet procedure. Now we're ready to compile and save and switch over to Excel. So now we're going to test to see if our append functionality works well by activating our new vehicle sheet. Go ahead and start your procedure. Use the default. It will pop up and ask you if you want to append the new inventory. Now you're going to select yes. It clears the new vehicle sheet. And when you switch back over to the inventory sheet, remember we were at row 105 before, and now we're at row 115 because it appended the information from new vehicles onto this sheet. You can go ahead and save your file. We're going to be using the sales fiscal year macro enabled file that we used earlier. And in that file, we're going to use both of the four loops. I'm going to go ahead and close this vehicles file. And I already had sales fiscal year file open. I'm going to just bring it back up and maximize it. And I'm going to actually switch over to visual basic editor here and make sure that I'm seeing this project. Cause again, sometimes if you have multiple files open, you switch over, it doesn't update. I want to make sure that I have the sales fiscal year project in project Explorer. Then I go back to Excel. So this is the file earlier. We had it do a sum function and place its result two rows down from the last populated cell in column I. We did that earlier. Now we're going to use our for loops because we have several sheet tabs of sales data on it. And you'll see how the for each next loop and the for two next loop are similar to each other. We're going to get the same result. We're just using two different loops. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start with the four to next construct to repeatedly call that add totals procedure. So all the worksheets have the selling price column totaled. And I'm going to just switch over to the visual basic editor for that. The project Explorer window, I'm going to collapse Microsoft Excel objects so that I don't have all of those sheet instances showing up. So we see our, I'm looking at the module one code window and we see our add total sub procedure. I'm going to click at the end of the end sub statement and we're going to create another sub procedure. And the first time we do it, we're going to use the for to next construct. So that's when you have it run the loop a specific number of times. And we're going to create a sub procedure and we're going to call it all totals and press enter twice. And then we're going to tab and we're going to declare by using dim just a small letter I as an integer and press enter twice. And then I'm going to tab again. So my for loop is indented. And for this one, we're going to tell it what I equals. So we're going to say for I equals one, two worksheets dot count. I equals one, 
to however many worksheets are in the file. And we're going to press enter after that line and tab. We're going to type worksheets and then in parentheses, I dot select enter add totals enter shift tab. So you're at the same margin as your for statement and you're going to type next I and then enter. So you have a space between it and your in sub statement. So we declared I as an integer and I represents worksheets one, two, three, four, five. So starting with one, I equals one to the total count of worksheets in the file. We're going to select the first sheet. And once the first worksheet is selected, we're calling our add total procedure. It's going to run on that first sheet. Then it's going to go to the next I, the next sheet, run that procedure. And it's going to keep doing that until there are no more sheets to go to go ahead and compile and save, and we'll switch over to Excel and test this out. So we already have this sum configured on the 26th of August sheet, and that's fine. We're going to do alt F eight since we don't have this attached to an event procedure, and we are going to select all totals, not add totals, but all totals. That's where we put our four to next loop. So I'm going to just double click it. So at some point during the execution of the program, you will get this runtime error 1004 it says application defined or object defined error. I will explain why this happened in just a moment, but what we want to do is we want to click the end button in that error message and it takes us to the last cell. Well, it takes us to a cell on the July 4th sheet tab. If we do control home, you can see that July 4th, well, it's a holiday. No sales happened on that day. And that's why we got that runtime error. So we're going to fix that by adding some code. So let's go back over to visual basic editor. The issue that caused the error is in the add totals procedure, not the all totals one that's calling add totals. In the add totals procedure, we have to tell it that if cell I two, right, is blank or if cell I two is not equal to zero. So if it's, if it's unpopulated, if it's populated with anything other than a zero, then run the procedure. If it's not populated with anything, any number, right, then we want it to print the text, no sales in cell a three. So we're going to set that up. You're going to click after your dim total formula as string line and press enter twice and then tab. And we're going to use an if statement for this. So if range and then in parentheses and double quotes, I two. And we're going to use our not equal less than greater than symbol zero. Then if cell I two is not equal to zero, then go ahead and run this code, select everything from set down to active formula and tab it over. Click at the end of the active cell dot formula equal total formula line, press enter and shift tab. And we're going to type our else statement to go with if enter and we're going to tab and we're going to type range and in parentheses and double quotes, a three dot value equals and then double quotes, no sales. Then we're going to type enter shift tab and end if so you're completed sub procedure add totals should look like my screen. If the sheet is blank, essentially, right? It's going to put no sales in cell a three. If the sheet is not blank, if there are values in column I, then it's going to calculate the sum and put it two rows below the last populated cell in that column. That's what we just set up there. And we'll test this soon. 
Go ahead and compile and save. So in our all totals subprocedure, we use the for to next loop. Now I'm going to show you the difference and it's going to end up being the same end result between for to next and for each next. So for to next repeats specific number of times. In our example, it repeats on every worksheet in the workbook. For each next is used on collections. So the easiest way to show you this is we're going to use a for each next construct to duplicate the work that we have in the all totals procedure that we created with a for to next construct. So the first thing we're going to do is select your entire all totals sub procedure. And one of the buttons we added to the toolbar was comment block. Click on that comment block button. And it basically puts the apostrophe before each line, thereby commenting out that entire sub procedure. At the end of its end sub statement, press enter twice, and we're going to create another sub procedure named all totals. You can't have two with the same name. So that's one reason why we commented out our original one. And for this one, we're going to use the for each next loop. So we're going to just type sub all totals, enter twice. We're going to tab in and we're going to dim sheet as worksheet. We're creating like an object variable, right? Every sheet is going to be declared as a worksheet here. And now we're going to press enter twice and tab. And we're going to type for each sheet in worksheets and that's the worksheets collection, right? So all of the worksheets in the workbook for each sheet in the worksheets and we're going to press enter and we're going to tab again and we're going to type sheet dot select enter add totals enter and then we're going to shift tab and type next sheet. The difference between this one and this one, first one we did that we commented out, the first one runs a definite number of times. It runs from the first sheet until it runs out of worksheets. This one, we're using the sheets as a collection object. So for each sheet in the worksheets collection, it's going to select the sheet and then it's going to call the add totals procedure. And then it's going to go to the next sheet in the collection and so on and so forth until it runs out of sheets. So after your next sheet, you should have the blank line and then your in sub statement. So since we're calling the add totals procedure, which we modified so we wouldn't get that runtime error, we'll see the results of our modification as well when we run this new all totals procedure. Go ahead and compile and save and we're ready to switch to Excel and test this out. So I'm going to just go back. I'm going to right click on my tab scrolling arrows in the lower left corner and I'm going to go back to the first sheet which is 26th of August and that's the one that we calculated the sum of the selling price before. And now I'm going to do Alt F8 to bring up the macros box and we're going to double click all totals. And so you saw your machine kind of click and were right. It left me on June 1st and we see that we have the total of the selling price and it's two rows beneath the last populated cell in column I. I'm going to right click on my tab scrolling arrows and navigate to the 4th of July. And that was one sheet that caused an error before because there were no sales on that sheet. And so now you can see in cell A3 on the 4th of July sheet that it actually has no sales. So we diverted it from having that runtime error. Go ahead and save your file. In this lesson, we went over control of flow structures 
and we utilized pretty much all of them. So we worked with our looping structures. We worked with our decision structures. And so we started with our, um, just a general understanding of the structures of our control of flow structures and their variations. You learned about Boolean expressions and how to combine them with comparison and logical operators. We went into conditional branching and that's when we used our if constructs and our select case constructs. And then we finished by using our looping constructs. We used our do loops and then we did both variations of the four loops, the four to next structure and the for each next structure. Thank you for attending Excel 2019 Visual Basic for Applications video course. Hi everyone, I'm Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to the Excel 2019 Visual Basic for Applications video course. This course is for beginning users looking to automate repetitive and recurring tasks in Microsoft Excel. VBA is Microsoft's programming language, and it's built into the Office applications. Our focus during this course is on Excel specifically. You'll be equipped with the basics to start writing your own VBA code, modify the code behind macros you've already recorded, and have an understanding of how VBA lends itself to creating efficiency in your daily tasks. We move into creating a form and programming its controls. During this lesson, you will learn about form properties, events, and methods, and learn how to add controls to the form and modify their properties. You'll ultimately launch a form with code. The next lesson will take you through the steps necessary to create pivot tables programmatically in Visual Basic for Applications. If you're enjoying these videos, please like and subscribe. If you want to earn certificates and digital badges, please become a member of our Patreon. The link is in our video description. If you have any questions you want answered by one of our instructors, please join our off-site community. The link is in the description as well. As always, if this course has exercise files, you'll find them in the video description below. Now we're gonna get started with lesson six working with forms and controls. We have several topics to cover in this lesson. You're gonna start learning about the user form object and then its properties, events, and methods. There's a toolbox we'll be using to add controls to the user form. We'll go over what kind of controls we'll be able to access from the toolbox. We'll be adding controls to the form and modifying the control properties, formatting the controls, and then we're gonna apply code to the controls to determine what their use is going to be. Finally, you'll learn how to launch the form via code. We're gonna be using our sales fiscal year file as well as accessing another text file named coding controls during this lesson. So far in this course, You've created message boxes and input boxes. You've learned that message boxes display messages and accepts input from the user via buttons. In our case, it was OK and cancel buttons. An action is then taken on that input via coding. Input boxes display messages to the user, but also allow the user to type in one input or have it default. Just like a message box, input action is taken on the input box via coding. The user form objects allow for multiple inputs, which can then be coded to perform specific actions. These inputs can be text, checkboxes, or drop down lists, for example, and they're known as controls. User forms have properties, events, and methods that can be accessed. These next few slides are for your reference after you've completed the course. I will be guiding you through this as we do exercise. So I have a slide with a description of form properties that can be accessed. The next one are form events. 
So for example, the click event and whatever action is attached to it will occur when the left mouse button is clicked when over the form. And the next slide is about form methods. You have cut, copy, paste, hide, move, so on and so forth. And again, I will be walking you through these during the exercises in this lesson. The one that I do want to cover with you now are form control prefixes. We've used lowercase mod as a prefix for a module. And so if you're looking at them in a list, you'll see them all begin with MOD. We have prefixes for form controls, and I'll guide you through these as we use them. But for example, CHK would be a checkbox. CBO is a combo box. And we'll be utilizing these throughout the lesson. Each form control has its own set of properties, and they differ depending on the type of control. But this slide has a list of common control properties that most controls have. So you have like a height property, a width property, that type of thing. And again, this slide deck is in the video description, so you'll have access to these reference slides. We're ready to get hands-on now with the user form object. Before we insert a user form object into our sales fiscal year Excel file, Let's talk about the different types of modules again. We did a brief review early in the course. Your standard code is stored in modules. Like in this project, we have module one. We could have renamed it, we didn't. We've also, in a different file, created event procedures. And if you expand your Microsoft Excel objects folder in the Project Explorer window, you'll see one for each sheet. And all the way at the bottom of all of the sheets, you have one called this workbook. And in our vehicles macro enabled file, we did an event procedure based off of the new vehicles sheet tab, which was known as sheet three in the system. Your sheet modules and this workbook module or where you store event procedure codes. And I'm gonna just go back up and collapse the Excel objects folder. So I don't have to look at all of those sheets. So we have our regular module where you store your function procedures, your sub procedures, and then you have your event procedure modules, your worksheets and this workbook. Now we also talked about early in the course, a class module, the modules we've been using, like module one, that's a standard module. Class modules we're not gonna use in this course. However, those are used to create your own objects. And so now we're gonna create a user form and that actually sets up a forms folder. And no matter how many forms you create in this particular file, they will all go into that forms folder. So it's almost like another module just for form, user form objects. And you'll see that now as we go to insert our user form. So we're gonna just go up to the insert menu and choose user form. And now a couple of things happened. You have the blank grid, a framework for your user form object on your screen and attached to it is a toolbox which you'll use to access the controls that you're going to put on the form. Now I'll give you a heads up here. Sometimes if you have double monitors, your toolbox may show up on another monitor and it could be behind some other open windows. So if you need it, you may have to search it out. If I click on a blank area here, or try to deselect this user form, it'll disappear, but then it'll reappear when I click back on the user form typically. And we can always get it back by using the view menu. Now I'm gonna close my toolbox for a minute. It has an X in its upper right hand corner so that I can see in the Project Explorer window that I now have a forms folder with one form in it, which it names by default user form one. Now we're gonna use the properties window to change some of the properties for our user form object. 
And again, if your properties window is not showing on your left hand pane, you can go to your view menu and select it, or you can press F4 to bring it up. We are going to give the form a name using the appropriate prefix. We're going to give it a caption, which will show in the title bar of the form. And we're going to give it a height and width measurement. So in the properties window, we're going to start with the name property. We're going to double click name in parentheses, and we're going to type lowercase F R M capital G generate capital R reports. So that's the system name of the form F R M generate reports. The next property we're going to do is the caption property. And again, that shows in the title bar and we're going to type just in plain English. And as you're typing it, you can look at the title bar and see it populating generate sales reports. And I'm pressing enter after I change a property, we're going to double click height and we're going to make it 300 and we're going to scroll down if necessary, double click width. And we're going to change that value to 400. And by the way, the height and width values would change if we manually resize the form by dragging it sizing handles. In the next exercises, we're going to add controls to the form and set properties for those controls. So the first thing we need to do is display our toolbox again. And we can get that from the view menu because we closed it by using its X. So we're going to just go to view toolbox and the toolbox shows up again and we can move it so you can see it clearly. And if you look at the controls in the toolbox, as you hover over them. So the first one is your mouse pointer. It's the select objects control. The next one is a label. Third one is a text box. You have a combo box, list box, so on and so forth. So we'll be using several of those controls, placing them on our form. And you'll learn also how to size and align your controls a little bit later in these exercises. So let's get started. We're going to add start date and end date label controls to the form. So in my toolbox, I'm going to look for the label control. It's the capital letter a, and I'm going to click on it on the toolbox. And now if I move my mouse over the form grid, it looks like a crosshair. I can click and hold and draw the label control, or I'm going to just click in the lower left corner of the form and it places the label control there for me. And so now with that label control selected, we're going to change some of its properties. So typically you don't name labels unless they're going to be some kind of code attached to them. So we're not going to use the name property. We want to look at the auto size property. So the auto size property is set to false. If we double click auto size, it will change it to true and we want it to be true. And then the caption property is the text that shows on the label. So I'm going to double click caption and I'm going to type end date in plain English followed by a colon and press enter. And now you see the end date text populating the label. And then you notice how it wrapped end date within that label control. We don't want it to do word wrap. So the last property is word wrap and it's set to true. We're going to double click it to set it to false. So it doesn't wrap the words in the label. And I'm going to just manually move. So I want my mouse pointer to look like a four headed arrow on that end date label. And I'm going to just drag it down just a little bit. We also want a start date label. So instead of starting from scratch, I'm going to just right click on the end date label and I'm going to choose copy. And then I'm going to right click in a blank area of my form grid and choose paste. So now I'm going to move the copy of the end date label above the existing end date label. And now it's just a matter of changing some of its properties. Couple of things. We didn't give the label a name, so we don't have a label name here. Our other property auto size 
is set to true already because we copied it. And word wrap is set to false. And it's the caption property we're going to change. So I'm going to double click caption and I want it to say start date in plain English with the colon and press enter. So copying it actually saves you time because it copies some of the pertinent property information as well. Now we're going to add two text box controls. We'll do the first one and then copy it and modify the properties for the second one. We're going to find in the toolbox our text box control and it's the one that has the lowercase a b to the right of your label. Going to select it and again when my mouse is on top of the form grid it looks like a crosshair and I'm going to click to the right of the end date label and let it place the text box there. I'm going to move mine up just a little bit so it's more in line like that. And with that text box control selected, we are going to give it a name. So in the properties window, we're going to double click name. We're going to use lowercase txt as the prefix for a text box. And we're going to type capital E and capital D date. So txt end date. And the other property that we're going to change for the text box is its width property. And we're going to make the width 50. And then we're going to copy that text box, paste it on the grid, and move it down so it's to the right of the start date label. And on the copy, we're going to just change the name of it to TXT start date. And notice the name property didn't come over with the copy because you can't have the same name for controls on a form object. So TXT capital T capital S start capital D date is what we're naming that text box. When this form is completed and totally coded, it will generate sales reports based on user choices in the form. And as such, we want to add two buttons to the form. We want to add a display button and a cancel button. So we're going to use the command button control in your toolbox. The command button control is in the second row. It's the second one on my screen in the second row. And it looks like a lowercase a B as well. When you hover over it, of course, the screen tip will let you know it is command button. So we're going to go ahead and select it in the toolbox and we're going to place a command button like in the upper right hand corner of the form. In the properties pane, we're going to name it using CMD as the prefix for a command button, capital D display. So CMD display is the name. And the caption, we're going to go down to the caption property, and that's the text that shows on the button. And it's just going to be display in plain English. And the last property we're going to change is the default property. Default property is currently set to false. We're going to double click it to make it true. So the default property when it comes to a command button is you can press enter to make that button happen instead of having to click on it. That's what the default property does. And you can only have one default property on a button on your object, your user form object. So we have CMD display and we gave it a caption of display and we changed the default property to true. Now we're going to copy that display button, paste it on the grid and drag the pasted version underneath your original display button. And again, don't worry about alignment. We'll fix that later. So on the copy, notice the name didn't carry over, right? We're going to name this one CMD capital C cancel. We're going to give, we're going to change the cancel property here from false to true. And that means you can use the escape key on your keyboard to make that button happen. And so we set cancel to true. The caption property, we're gonna change it to cancel. 
And the default property we need to change to false because you can only have one default command button and that is the display button. If you click on a blank area of your grid, you'll see the display button has like that dark border around it. Whenever you see a button like that in a dialog box, it means you can press your enter key to make that button happen. This would be a good time for us to go ahead and save right from the toolbar before we continue adding controls to this form. Now we're going to add a combo box control to our form. So the combo, find the combo box control in your toolbox and select it. And we're going to put it in the, like the lower right hand corner of the form. In the properties pane, we're going to change its name to prefix of CBO and then capital M month. We're going to use its list rows property. And that just says how many rows will be in the drop down list. So we're going to change list rows to 12 and then the match required property. We're going to double click that to change it from false to true in visual basic controls, a combo box by default says no matches required, which means that the end user can type in their own entries and use them from the list. We don't want that to happen. We want them to pull just from the list that we're going to populate later. So we have our combo box in the lower right hand corner. And now we're going to click in a blank area of the grid and you can copy your start date or end date label because we're going to want another label and we're going to paste it onto the grid. And then we're going to move that label to the left of the combo box. I'm going to just move mine down a little bit. And again, we'll do some alignment stuff in a little while. So now we just have to change the label properties. Now we're going to use this label later in code some stuff for it. So we want to give it a name. So we're going to name this LBL prefix for a label month, capital M month. And we're going to give it a caption of for which month question mark. And then I need to move my label over because it auto expanded. So it's not overhanging my combo box. So your form should look similar to mine at this point. Now we're going to add two frame controls to the form. And we'll add the first one, of course, copy it to create the second one. But the frame control is utilized to group related other controls together. So we're going to start by adding our first frame control on my toolbox. The frame control is the first one in the second row. It has an X, Y at the top of it. We're going to click that and I'm going to click like in the upper left corner of the form grid. And now in order to make space for the other frame, I'm going to move this frame over as far left as I can, where I can actually see the borders of it. And then I'm going to decrease its width manually by just clicking on the right center sizing handle. So my mouse looks like a double headed arrow and dragging it backwards about that much. And so we're going to give the frame a name and it's going to be F R a is the prefix for a frame control capital P period. And we're also going to give it a caption of period. And the caption is what shows up in the upper left hand corner of the frame. Now we're going to copy that frame, paste it onto your grid and drag the pasted frame to the right of your period frame. And for this one, we're going to change the name property to F R a sales, and we're going to give it a caption of sales. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add three option button controls into each frame. We're going to find the option button in the toolbox 
And it looks like the little circle with a dot in the middle of it. It's the next to the last one in my first row. And I'm gonna select the option button. And now I'm gonna click inside the period frame. And then I'm gonna copy that option button and I'm gonna paste it twice inside the period frame. So you'll have three option buttons inside your period frame. And if you click on the top one, you'll see in the name property, it's option button one, second one is two, second one is three. You kinda want to have them in the right order for tab order purposes a little bit later. And again, we'll deal with the alignment a little bit later. And I'm going to show you how to get three option buttons in the sales frame now too. another efficiency tip here. What we can do inside the period frame, just click in a blank area inside the period frame and do control a, and it selects all three option buttons, right? And then you can just do control C to copy them and then right click inside your sales frame and paste. Let's do the properties for these option buttons. So the first one inside the period frame should say option button one as its name property. Its name property is gonna be OPT as the prefix, capital M month, and we're gonna give it a caption of month. And you can see the caption shows instead of option button one. The second option button in the period frame, which name is currently option button two, we're going to change it to OPT all with a caption of all. And the last option button option button three in the period frame. Its name is going to be OPT other with a caption of other. So we have month all and other option buttons in the period frame. Let's go to the sales frame. So the first one in the sales frame, since we copied it, it's now option button four. And we're gonna give that a name of OPT salesperson with a caption of salesperson. And I'm making that caption plain English, two words. And then the next one in the sales frame, option button five, that one is gonna be OPT model with a caption of model. And last but not least, option button six, its name is going to be OPT classification with a caption of classification. So now we're ready to do some formatting of our form controls. And we'll start with alignment and grouping. We're gonna start by aligning the option buttons in the period frame. So just click in the period frame and do control A like we did before to select the option buttons. And we can go up to the format tab, the format menu, hover over align, and we're gonna click on lefts. So those three option buttons are aligned by their left edge. Let's do the same thing in the sales frame also align those three option buttons by their lefts. Now we wanna align our two frames by their tops. So I'm gonna select the period frame, hold down my control key and select the sales frame. That's one way of getting them both selected. Gonna go back to format menu, align, and this time we're gonna to choose tops and we can click away and see they're perfectly aligned by their top edges now. Now we wanna group the options buttons in each frame so that if we move any one of them, all of them will move. They'll retain their alignment and everything. So I'm gonna just click in the period frame and do control A to select all three option buttons. I'm gonna to go to the format menu 
and I'm going to click on group. And now you'll see there's one border around all three option buttons instead of three separate borders. They're grouped together now. Do the same in your sales frame. Now I'm going to show you how to use a selection net, also known as a selection marquee. It has a lot of different names to select different objects. So we want to align the period frame and the start date and end date labels by the left edges. So I'm going to click slightly above and to the left of the period frame, click and hold and drag down until your start and end date labels are within that little guideline. So now when you let go, it selected the period frame and the start and end date labels. That's called a selection net. And we're going to go to format align lefts. Let's use a selection net to select our display and cancel buttons as well as our combo box. And let's align those by their left edges as well. At this point, we haven't coded any of our form controls yet, but we want to test our form, make sure it displays properly. And specifically, we want to test the tab order on the form. Just make sure your form is selected. And you can use the run button on the toolbar, run sub user form button, or you can just press F5 to run the form. And the form should pop up on your screen. It's on top of some other module. So we want to test the tab order on the form. Now, when I bring up the form, notice that it's flashing in the end date field. That's where it's starting. If I press the tab key on my keyboard, it then goes to start date. If I press tab again, it looks like it has the display button and then the cancel button and then the combo box. Then it goes into the period frame and it's on month, then all, then other. Then it goes to the sales frame and it's on salesperson, then model, then classification. The frames, the tab order is perfect because we made sure that the option button copies were in the right order. So option button one, two, three, four, five, six. But we can see that the rest of the tab order on this form is not the way it should be. So we're going to go ahead and fix that. Go ahead and close the X button in the upper right hand corner of your form. And it should take you back to your form design view, if you will. If not, you can double click FRM generate reports in your forms folder in the project Explorer window. So we need to adjust the tab order here. So we're going to go to the view menu and on the view menu, you're going to select tab order. And I'll move this box here so we can see it a little bit better. The labels don't have to be included in the tab order because we don't want to tab to any labels in there at this point. So the tab order that we want is that it start period frame and then go to the sales frame. So they're at the bottom of my tab order list, which is why it went there last. I'm going to click and hold on FRA period and drag down to select FRA sales. And with both of them selected on the right side, I'm going to use the move up button until they're in the first and second position. Then I'm going to click on TXT start date, move that up. So it's in the third position and put TXT end date in the fourth position. We want our combo box CBO month to be underneath the end date text box. And then we want our command and display buttons underneath CBO month. And again, we're not concerned about the labels because labels are not input controls. We can click OK, and then we're going to do F5 so we can test the tab order on our form. Notice that the month in the period frame is already selected. When we do tab, it's going to go to all and then other. Then into the sales frame, salesperson, model, and classification. 
After that, it jumps down to the start date text box, then to the end date text box, then to the combo box, finally the display button and the cancel button. We can close the form again by using the X in the upper right hand corner. When we code the controls on our forms, we're going to be doing them in what are known as built in class modules. These modules contain procedures that are used to respond to events for a form or maybe a worksheet or that performs tasks in support of the form or worksheet. So we're going to be populating our combo box for starter by using code. So what we're going to do is we're going to right click on the form anywhere in a blank area of the grid. And this is only one way of doing this. And we're going to choose view code. So now if you look up at the top, right, it gives you the file that we're in, but it says FRM generate reports code. That is a built in class module. This is the code just for that particular form. The first thing we're going to do is explore the object list where it says it defaults to user form, right? And notice the user form default procedure is the click event. Well, do the drop down next to, to the right of user form, and you'll see all of the controls that we've placed on that form. And this is a good example of when using the prefix is handy. Your command buttons are grouped together. Your frames are grouped together. Your option buttons are grouped together as are your text boxes. So you don't have to keep looking through a list for something, not knowing what the actual control is. So that's a good example of why you want to use those prefixes here. We're going to leave it on the user form object. Now I mentioned that it defaults to the click procedure but we want our code to be based on its initialized procedure. So to the right of click in your procedure list, you're going to select initialize. And just like when we did an event procedure earlier, we don't need to keep the framework for private sub user form click. We're going to just delete that and leave our private sub user form initialize in sub statement. The initialize procedure happens when the form is loaded into memory. So when the form is run, that's when this procedure will happen. At the end of the private sub line, we're going to press enter twice and we're going to do a with end with statement. So I'm going to tab over and I'm going to type with and then CBO month. So that's the combo box, the month combo box. I'm going to press enter tab. I'm going to do dot and the list pops up. We want to use the add item method. So dot add item space and then double quotes Jan for January. Now you can copy that add item line. We need 12 of them January through December. And we're just using the three character abbreviation for the months with no period. And once you have your 12 add item lines, we're going to shift tab and we have to have our end with statement and you can go ahead and compile and save. And in your project Explorer window, you're going to double click FRM generate reports. We're going to press F five to run it. And we just want to test our drop down. So go to your for which month drop down and you should see January through December there. We added those items to the combo box and we can close generate sales reports form and we're going to change one property for that combo box. So select the combo box on your form grid and we're going to go down to its text property and that's like the default property. So we want it to default to January. So we're going to just type J A N there and enter. And now if we so I have to select my form first and F five, we'll see that the for which month combo box is now defaulting to January. 
and we can close it. Another way to access the code window for the form is just by double clicking on the form grid and that will take you to your built-in class module. And it's built in because a form is a built-in object here in Excel VBA. So unlike a regular class module where you're actually creating objects that are not included in the application, this is a built-in class. And so we're in the code window and we're going to hide controls based on when another control is selected. So for example, if month is selected in the period frame, we want to hide the start date and end date labels and text boxes. And we have several event procedures to code. So we're gonna insert a text file and then review the code for your understanding. First, we're gonna declare some variables and we're gonna click at the top after option explicit and press enter. And we're gonna do public sales comma period as string and press enter. So we're declaring variables up in the declaration section and we're making them public. So that means they're available to any modules here. And then we're gonna click underneath our end with statement. We'll click at the end of it and press enter. And we're going to type CBO month, that's our combo box name, dot visible, which is a property, equals false, which shows up on your list. Right underneath that, we're gonna type LBL month dot visible, that's its label, equals false. So right now it's telling it not to show the combo box or the label but we're not done yet. So we're gonna click at the end of end sub and press enter. And then we're gonna to go to our insert menu and choose file. And we wanna grab that coding controls text file so we can just double click it. And boy, did it help us with a lot of typing. Look at all the stuff that's in here. We'll go over what all of this code that we didn't have to type means. We declared two string variables, sales and period. The first thing that came in from the text file is private sub CMD cancel click. So when the cancel button on the form is clicked, it's going to unload the form from memory. And me is just a shortcut for the current object, in this case, the form. So that's one thing that came in from the text file, coding that cancel button. And then we have our opt all button. When that option button is selected, when it's clicked or accessed, it's going to set the period variable to all. When the classification option button is clicked, it's gonna set the sales variable to equal classification. When the model option button is clicked, it's gonna assign model to the sales variable. So we need to do a fix here because I just noticed that model doesn't have double quotes on it coming from the text file and it needs to, or we would get an error message. And you might wanna make a note if you wanna avoid that later to just go into the text file and change it in there. So the next sub procedure is opt month when it changes. If that opt month button is clicked, right? And you see this next sub procedure, it's gonna set the period to equal month. If opt month equals true, then we want the combo box and the label to be visible or else we want them to be hidden. Unless they need to select a month, they don't need to have the label or the combo box showing up on the form. And then we have, we'll go to our private sub opt other. This one has a change event and this one has a click event. So when it's clicked, the other option button, it will set the period to other. And if it's other, then we want the start date and end date text boxes to be enabled. So they're accessible if they select other in that frame 
or else we want them to be disabled. So they'll still be visible, but the end user won't be able to access them. And then the last but not least, if they select the salesperson option button in the sales frame, it's going to set sales variable to equal salesperson. And you want to go ahead and compile and save. Let's go test some of this. So I'm going to just double click my form in the forms folder in Project Explorer to get back over to it. And the first thing we're going to do is in the properties pane, we're going to disable the start date and end date text boxes. So I'm going to click in the start date text box and I'm going to double click the enabled property to change it from true to false. And I'm going to do the same with the end date text box. And now I'm going to go ahead and press F5 to run the form. So make sure you're just on the grid and you don't have any controls selected. And then F5 will be successful for you. And so the first thing I want you to do is try to click in the start date and end date text boxes and you cannot. In the period frame, select the month option and you'll notice that the combo box and its label will now become visible and accessible on the form. If you select the all option button in the period frame, your start date and end date text boxes are not available to you because we want it to run all the reports for all of the dates. And then if you select the other option button, now you have the ability to get into the start date and end date text boxes. So in the background on my screen, you see that opt other change is what's causing that. So if they select opt other, if they select the other option button, it's going to assign the period valuable, the value of other, and it's going to enable the start date and end date text boxes. And now we're going to use the X in the upper right hand corner to close the form again. And the last thing we're going to do, instead of us having to go to the forms folder and double click the form and then F5 to run it, we want to launch it programmatically. So we're going to do that now. We're going to go over to our Project Explorer window. We can right click on the modules folder, hover over insert and choose module. And we're going to rename module two in its properties window. We're going to name it MOD reports. And in mod reports, we're going to type a very short sub procedure. So we're going to type sub, we're going to name it show form, press enter twice. And we're going to tab over, we're going to type the name of our form, including its prefix, FRM generate reports, the dot notation, and then we want the show method. We just created a sub procedure that will show the form when this procedure runs. And now we can compile and save, and we could just execute the procedure by pressing F5 anywhere within it. It brings up the form. And because we brought it in from a text file, we coded the cancel button. We can actually use the cancel button to unload the form from memory and close it. In this lesson, we learned about and used the user form object. We changed some form properties and we went over some properties, events, and methods for form controls. We accessed the toolbox to be able to get to our form controls and we added controls to the form and modified their properties. And then we did some formatting of form controls in terms of alignment and grouping. And we moved on to creating code for form controls in a built-in class module. And we used a lot of code from a text file that was in the files in the video description. We ultimately ended up launching the form via code and we will be revisiting using the form in a later lesson.
In lesson seven, we will be working with the pivot table object in Visual Basic. So the first thing we're going to do is create a pivot table in Excel, and then we're going to create a pivot table in Visual Basic for applications. When end users use the form that we created in the previous lesson, it is going to generate pivot table reports based on the user's choices on the form. After we get our pivot tables done, we're going to finalize our form, and then you'll learn how to add code to a button in Excel for ease of use. Pivot tables allow you to summarize data from a worksheet or an external data source and create reports. You can decide how to summarize the data and the data to be analyzed. And after you create a pivot table, you can pivot the data to look at it in different ways for different analysis. When you're creating a pivot table in VBA, two separate objects are used. The pivot table object, which is the pivot table in the workbook, and the pivot cache object, which is a memory location that's created and it holds the source data the pivot table is created from. When you're doing this in Visual Basic, the pivot cache object needs to exist before a pivot table is created. So you use what's known as the create method of the pivot caches collection object to create that pivot cache in VBA. And I have on this slide, it's syntax. The one required argument is source type. And then you have two optional arguments, source data and version. The source type argument has five options in the form of Excel constants. So we saw a visual basic constants earlier. They're preceded by VB, like when we were working with the message box, right? These are Excel constants, which are preceded by XL. So you have consolidation, database, external, pivot table, and scenario. Process-wise, once the pivot cache is created, the create pivot table method of the pivot cache object will be accessed to create the pivot table. And it has four arguments as listed on this slide, table destination, table name, read data, and default version. And the final three, the only one that's required is the table destination argument. And again, this is background information for your future review if you need to refresh on anything. I will be guiding you through this when we get started. The pivot cache and pivot table can be created in the same procedure. And the fields that are going to populate the pivot table have to be set up separately within what's known as the pivot fields collection. Yes, this sounds complicated until you get used to it. When it comes to pivot fields collection, it's a member of the pivot table object and it contains the columns of data from the data source. The pivot fields orientation property is used to populate the pivot table report. Field names are assigned to the values in each column based on the column headings. And Excel constants are used here as well. You're, if you're used to pivot tables, you know you have row labels, column labels, you have report filter, you have values. So the Excel row field would be for your row labels, Excel column field for your column labels, Excel page field is used for the report filter, and Excel data field is used for the values. You have an extra constant here, Excel hidden, which is used to hide a field. And then at the bottom, I have the syntax of the orientation property for your future reference. So we're going to start in our sales fiscal year file by recording two macros to create the pivot table. So I'm on the 26th of August sheet tab, and I'm going to just click anywhere within my data there. And we're going to start a macro recording. So I'm going to use the Mac, no macros currently recording button down in my status bar that we used earlier. I'm going to click on that and we're going to name this macro create pivot table. And then we're going to just click OK. Now just make sure you're anywhere within your data and except for on that sum of the selling price. We're going to be anywhere within the data. Go to the insert tab of the ribbon and the first button is pivot table. I'm going to click the upper half of the button. 
In the Create Pivot Table dialog box, you'll see that it has selected all of your data. We were just anywhere within our range and it will select everything until it finds a blank. And that's the choice we wanted to use, select a table or range. And then the next choice you make is choose where you want the pivot table report to be placed. It defaults to a new worksheet, which is typically how they're used. And so we can just click OK. So we're on a new sheet. We have the framework of our pivot table on the worksheet. And to the right, we have our pivot table fields list. This is where we need to stop this recording. Remember, it's a two-step process, even when you're recording it as a macro in Excel. The first step is to create the framework of the pivot table, and we've done that. So I'm going to go down to my status bar and select Stop Recording. Now we need to record a macro that will select the fields that we want in our pivot table report. So I'm going to go back to my status bar and start another macro recording. And this one I'm going to name select fields and click OK. In your field list on the right, you're going to drag your year field to the filters box underneath. And notice your pivot table report is already starting to shape up. We're going to drag classification to columns. And we see our pivot table, we have our column labels, and it's showing the classifications, car, SUV, truck, minivan. We're going to drag, well, we could put a checkbox in front of make, and it will automatically put it in the rows box. And we're going to put a, if we scroll down, we're going to put a check mark in front of selling price, and it's automatically going to put that in the values box. So any text-based field will automatically go into rows and any numeric field will automatically go into values and the default aggregate that's used is the sum function. So now in our pivot table, we can see our row labels are the makes of the vehicles, our column labels are the classification, and we're getting the selling price for each combination there. Now we're ready to stop our macro, our second macro from recording. So you could stop the recording and let's switch over to visual basic editor. And in project Explorer, I'm going to collapse that Microsoft Excel objects folder. And now you'll notice we have mod reports, module one and module two. We're going to double click module two, and that's where it put the code for the two macros we recorded. And we're going to rename module two. So using its properties, we're going to name it mod sheet pivot. So this is the code that was created when we did our create pivot table macro, right? It's adding, you can see it's referencing the pivot caches object, right? And we're using the source type of Excel database. And you have all of this code that was generated by your two separate macro recordings. And then we had to record a separate macro for selecting the fields. And that's where you'll see those Excel constants for page field, column field, row field, so on and so forth. So if you create a pivot table while recording a macro in Excel, you have to record two macros, one to set up the framework of the pivot table and the second one to populate the pivot table report with the appropriate fields. Now we're going to start creating our pivot table in Visual Basic Editor. And so we're going to start by creating the pivot cache and pivot table objects, which can be in the same procedure as you'll see. But before we do that, switch back over to Excel and delete the sheet that has your pivot table report on it. And then we're going to insert a new sheet, a new worksheet, and we're going to name it reports. And the sheet tabs in your Excel file should look like mine on the screen. So I've made the report sheet the first one, and I deleted the other sheet where we recorded our macro and created the pivot table. And now we can switch back over to the Visual Basic Editor.
In your Project Explorer window, switch to Mod Reports, where we have just that one small sub-procedure that shows the form. We're going to click after the in sub statement here, and you're going to type the sub procedure that I will display on my screen momentarily. I've changed my font size to 18. So you can create that sub procedure that we're naming create pivot based on what's on my screen. We'll talk about it after you get it typed in. In this sub procedure, we are declaring two object variables, destination and range data, both with the range object type. We're setting the destination variable to equal that reports worksheet, cell A1 that we just created in Excel. And we're setting the range data object variable to equal the range A1 through J1 all the way down to the last populated cell in column J. After that, we're accessing the pivot caches object. So active workbook dot pivot caches dot create. And I'm using the line continuation character there space and underscore. And this time in the parentheses, we're using a different syntax and we're doing this here because you'll probably come across it in code that you inherit. So we're actually naming the arguments and separating them from their values by using a colon and an equal sign. So the first argument for the pivot caches is the source type. And for an Excel spreadsheet, the data on an Excel spreadsheet, you use the Excel constant of Excel database. The next argument is the source data and that is going to be the range data. So A1 through the last populated cell in column J. And then we're doing another line continuation character at the end of that line. And now we're moving on to the create pivot table method of the pivot cache object. And that line starts with dot create pivot table. And then we're giving it a destination for the table which is what we populated as the destination object variable. So the report sheet cell A1 is where we're going to start the pivot table framework. And then we're naming the pivot table sales pivot. Let's go ahead and compile and save our work. And we'll switch to Excel. We need to run that sub procedure or create pivot procedure on a sheet that's populated with data. So I'm going to go to my 26th of August sheet tab, and I'm going to just be anywhere within my data. And I'm going to do alt F eight to bring up the macros dialog box. And we want to double click create pivot. It doesn't initially look like anything happened but we told it to put the framework of the pivot table on the reports sheet tab. So let's go to reports and we'll see the framework of our pivot table. So now that we have the framework of our pivot table, we're going to switch back over to the visual basic editor because we have to create our fields collection. Regardless of whether you're creating a pivot table by recording a macro or by using Visual Basic for applications, it's going to be a two step process. We're going to be still working in mod reports and we're going to go up to the top and click after option explicit. We need to declare some variable names up here. So we're going to type public and after we click after option explicit, I pressed enter. We're going to use the public keyword page name, comma, row name, comma, column name, comma, data name as string. So four string variables we declared in the declaration section and you can press enter. So now we're going to go to the bottom of our create pivot sub procedure, click at the end of the end sub statement and press enter. And we're going to create another procedure sub procedure here. So we're going to type sub 
And the name of it is Set Fields. And press enter a couple of times. Well, we're going to declare an object variable here within the procedure. So we're going to do dim. And then I'm just calling it PVT table as pivot table. And pivot table will show up on your list. Underneath that, we're going to use the set statement. Remember, we have to use set for our object variables. Set PVT table and then equal worksheets and in parentheses and double quotes reports dot pivot tables and in parentheses, we need to put what we named the pivot table, which is in quotes, it's sales pivot. And then we're going to close those parentheses. We're going to press enter twice and we're going to do a with end with block. So we're going to indent and we're going to type with PVT table, enter and tab. We're going to do dot pivot fields, which will show up on your list. And then in parentheses, page name dot orientation equals XL page field. So we're referencing that constant. And just a reminder, the pa XL page field constant refers to the field that's going to go into the report filter box. We're going to press enter. And we're going to do dot pivot fields again. This time in the parentheses, we're going to type row name dot orientation. And this one is going to equal Excel row field. So the field that's going to go into the rows box for the pivot table. Enter again. We have two more of these lines that we have to do. So dot pivot fields and use the list as necessary to decrease your typing. And in parentheses for this one, we're going to do column name dot orientation. And this one equals XL column field. And last but not least, we're going to do dot pivot fields in parentheses, data name, and that's for the values, dot orientation equal Excel data field. We're going to press enter and shift tab, and we're going to type in our end with statement and enter again. So now what we're going to do is we're going to finish up this sub procedure. We have four more lines to type. And I'm going to shift tab to outdent. So I'm at the same margin as our dim and set lines. And we're going to type active workbook dot sheets. And then in parentheses and double quotes reports dot activate. And I'll scroll down so you can see this a little bit better. Our next line is PVT table, like our object variable name, dot pivot select. Then we're going to type a space and a set of double quotes, comma. And from the list that pops up, we're going to select Excel data only, another Excel constant. So the data field is the values field and we want to, we're typing this line to say, select all of the values and we're going to press enter and then we're going to tell it how to format it. So selection dot number format equals, and then double quotes, we're going to type a dollar sign, pound sign, comma, two more pound signs, and a zero and then close your double quotes. The number format, and I have it highlighted on my screen that we're using. So it's going to start it with a dollar sign and the pound represents any digit. 
that may be in that position. You have your thousand separator is the comma. And then we have two more pound signs. So digit placeholders, if they're in that position, it will put them there. If not, it will skip it. And we're saying that we're not going to have any decimal places on our numbers here. If we wanted decimal places after the ending zero, we would, we could do a dot and then zero, zero, which means that it would have two decimal places. The zero that's sitting there instead of the pound signs, or as they're now known, hashtags, that would represent a leading zero for a number if it's less than one. So that's the number format and you'll see it once we finish this up. And now we have one more line to finish this set field sub procedure. And we're gonna just type range and in parentheses and double quotes, E1 dot select. This is going to set the fields, whether they are filter fields, row fields, column fields, or your values fields for the pivot table that we created. Because the variables will not populate until we actually run the form again, um, we're gonna be able to test this, our sub procedure for setting the fields in just a little while. We have some more tasks that we're gonna complete that I have under the heading, finalizing the form. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna create code that will generate pivot table reports based on the selections the user chooses in the form. So in other words, we're gonna distribute user responses to the correct procedures. Specifically, we're gonna create code that will perform these steps when the user activates the display button on the form. We want it to hide the form and whatever option is selected in the period frame will be evaluated determining the month or the start date and end date of the pivot table report. The sales option that is selected in the sales frame will also be evaluated. And at this point, the variables containing the field names will be populated. Then the source data will be pulled from the workbook and placed on a new sheet. And then the data will be moved to a new workbook and the pivot table will be created. So we're gonna get started on these finalizing the form steps. And I'm still in Visual Basic Editor. And in the Project Explorer window, I'm gonna expand Forms folder and double click our Generate Reports form to get back to it. And then I'm gonna double click in a blank area of our form to get back to our built-in class module, which has all the code that we've created for this so far. So we want to select the framework for the click event for your display command button. So where it says user form at the very top of the module in the procedure list, we're gonna do the drop down and we're gonna select CMD display. So now we have private sub CMD display click event waiting for us because click is the default procedure for a command button. I'm gonna click after the opening and closing parentheses and press enter a couple of times. And we're gonna tab and we're gonna type me.hide. And hide is on the list. And in this instance, as we saw previously when we used me, it's referring to the form. When we click the display button, it's gonna hide the form. That's one thing that we need to happen. So now we're gonna declare some variables up top in the declaration section. And we already have public sales and period as string. Click after period, type a comma and type month. So we have sales period and month as string variables. Press enter at the end of the as string line and we're gonna type public start date comma end date as date and press enter. Now we're gonna navigate to the end of this module and we're gonna create another sub procedure there 
that's going to code the options selected in the period frame on the form. And we're going to use a select case construct here. So at the very bottom of the module, we're going to type sub. We're going to name it get dates, press enter a couple of times, and then tab. And I'll scroll down so you can see my whole construct down there. And we're going to type select case period, enter, and then tab case, and then in double quotes, month, enter, tab, month equals CBO month. And we'll type all of this in and then I'll go over it and review it with you. After I press enter after CBO month, I'm going to shift tab so I get back to the case margin and I'm going to type case and then double quotes all, enter, tab, start date equals get first date, enter, end date equals get last date, enter, shift tab, case, and then double quotes other. So we have month all and other in our period frame, enter, and we're going to do start date equals txt start date enter end date equals txt end date enter shift tab twice and you're going to type end select and then I'm going to press enter again so I get that blank line between end select and end sub so let me break this down for you we're doing a select case statement, which is like an if, then, else, if, end, if statement. So we have three cases here, right? Based on the period. So case month means the month equals whatever month is selected in the combo box. When they select all in that period frame, the start date is going to equal the results of a function procedure that we don't have in here yet called get first date. And then the end date is going to equal the result of a function procedure that we also don't have in here yet called get last date. And then if they select other in the period frame, the start date is going to be the start date that the end user puts in the start date text box. And the end date will be the end date that the end user puts in the end date text box. So that's what we've created here in this get date sub procedure. Now the good news is the two procedures that we don't have in here yet, get first date and get last date, we're going to bring in from a text file so we don't have to type it and then we'll review it. So I'm going to click at the end of the end sub statement and press enter beneath our get date sub procedure. And we're going to go to insert menu file. And this particular file that we want is going to be, well, we have get first date. We'll bring in the get last date first. So we're going to do get last date, double click that file, and then go to the end of that function. After the end function statement, be on the next blank line, go back to insert file and we're going to insert get first date. And so now let's review these get last date and get first date functions. We'll start with get last date. So we're doing object variables here, dim sheet as worksheet. And then we're just doing regular variables, last date and test date. We're declaring those as dates. So we're starting with last date equals zero and we're using a for each next construct. So this is going to go through the worksheets for each sheet in the worksheets, the test date equals, and it says C date and then in parentheses sheet dot name. So the name of the worksheets in this file are dates. And C date is a conversion function that it's going to convert the text date on the sheet tab 
into an actual date. So let's say it's on the 26th of August, 2016 sheet, right? It's going to convert the text on the sheet tab to a date format and assign it to the test date variable. And then it says, if test date is greater than the last date, then the last date equals the test date. And that's in an if in if then end if construct, which is nested in our for each next structure. Then it's going to go to the next sheet and it's going to repeat the process until there's no more sheets. And then it will determine what the last date is. And so the result of the function get last date will be the last date that's in the file. And then get first date is similar right? Where we have our declarations and then it starts first date equals 99, 99, or actually five nines. And for each sheet, it's going to convert the sheet name date to a date. And if the test date is less than the first date, then the first date equals the test date. And then it ends that if block with end if goes to the next sheet, repeats the process until there are no more sheets. Now notice this one came in and the last line is red. And if it's not, when you go to compile, it's going to be red because we declared first date and it's all mushed together. But in the text file, it came in as two separate words. So I'm going to just mush it together in that line. And now we can compile and save. So those two function procedures will determine the earliest date and the latest date in the workbook for the period frame. At this point, we have three more procedures that we're going to need to do. We're only going to type one of them. We'll bring in the other two. Well, actually we have four procedures. We're going to type one of them and bring in the remaining three from text files. So we're at the bottom of this module. And we're going to create a sub procedure under our get first date function procedure. And I'm going to just type sub and I'm going to type get sales by grouping and press enter twice. So this procedure is going to code the options in the sales frame on the form. So it's kind of like telling it if they select salesperson in the sales frame, what fields need to be in that pivot table report and so on and so forth. So we're going to do a select case statement for this. I'm going to tab over types, select case sales, press enter and then tab case and then double quotes. It's going to be sales person and on the form made that two words. And then we're going to press enter and tab. So no page name, which is the filter for the pivot table equals, and then double quotes sales person. And I'm going to check whether that needs to be separated there. Sometimes it's what you called it on the form. And then other times it's the way it shows as a column header. So I will definitely double check that before we test these procedures. And then we're going to do enter. And we're going to do row name equals in quotes year, enter column name equals make, and then our data name for our values in the pivot table report is going to equal selling price. And I believe these are the headings on the spreadsheet. We have a few more finishing touches we need to do in order to complete this process. So we want to navigate to mod reports and go to the bottom of the module under our set fields sub procedure. And we're going to use a text file to bring in three other procedures. So we're going to go up to insert file. And this time we want to consolidate data text file. I did this as a text file because it actually contains three different procedures. So we have a sub procedure named consolidate data. 
Then we have another sub procedure telling it where to start grabbing the cells. And we have another sub procedure for finishing the report. And just to kind of go over them briefly for you, what these are doing. So the consolidate data sub procedure will create a temporary worksheet in the file and name it reports. And that will hold your pivot table report. Based on the option the user selects in the period frame, it will collect the data from the worksheets. This procedure calls a function that directs it to select the pertinent cells from each worksheet. And if you look through it, you can see the code blocks for that. And they have uh, select case statements and they're using grab cells to grab some cells. When it references grab cells, it's calling the sub procedure right underneath it named grab cells. It's passed an argument that is the beginning row number of the cells to be selected. And it uses an if construct to grab all the cells on each worksheet that are applicable to the choices made in the form. And then last but certainly not least, we have a sub procedure named finish report. And that moves the collected data from the reports worksheet into an existing workbook in the same directory named reports. It then deletes the report worksheet in the sales fiscal year file and creates the pivot table in the reports workbook. I should mention this by now. We have created across different files, multiple modules. We also have an built-in class module for our form. So you have lots of different blocks of code. And what you wanna do is as you're working in Visual Basic, you want to start saving your code blocks that actually work. So after they're tested and I have a code repository, I just copy and paste my sub and function procedures into a word document because a lot of times you can reuse the same code over and over again. You might have to just change a file name or something like that. But why build it from the ground when you already know you have code that has worked before? So I'll make that suggestion here because, and especially some of these text files, you're getting really great code blocks to use in future VBA projects. We have just a few more finishing touches before we'll test everything. And this time we want to go to our built-in class module for our form. So I'm going to just double click FRM generate reports in the forms folder. And then I'm going to double click a blank area of the form to get into that module. We want to locate the click event for the display command button at the, toward the top of mine, I have private sub CMD display underscore click. And currently it only has me hide in that sub procedure. Click at the end of me hide and press enter. And now we're going to use this to call other procedures. We are going to call our get dates procedure, enter get sales by grouping procedure, enter consolidate data. And we're going to pass it a, an argument of month. So we can just put month after it consolidate data month and the finish report procedure. And then we're going to type unload me. So when the, the display button is clicked on the form, it's going to hide the form and it's going to call those procedures, get dates, get sales by grouping, consolidate data, finish report. And then it's going to unload the form from memory. Now we have a modification we need to make in mod reports. So we're going to go back to mod reports and I'm going to use the procedure list to navigate to the set fields procedure. We need to make a small modification there. So when we created this set field sub procedure, we did a number format, 
But then when we created the get sales by grouping sub procedure for the selection in the sales frame, if they select model, we made color the data name. So we made color the value field. We don't want the colors to be displayed with like a currency format, really, because it's just going to be a count of color here. We need to change this set fields procedure so it doesn't put a numeric currency format on a color field if that's what's selected in the sales frame. To adjust that, if it is an actual value, like a selling price value, we do want it formatted in a currency format. But if it's a count of models, we don't. So we're going to address that by using an if function. So click at the end of the line that says active workbook dot sheets reports dot activate and press enter. And you're going to go ahead and tab and we're going to type if and in the name of our form, FRM generate reports dot sales. And we're going to use our not equal to, so less than greater than. And then in double quotes, we're going to type model. If what they select in the sales frame on our form is not equal to model, we want it to go ahead and give it the currency format. So we're going to type then after model. And then we're going to come down to the line that has selection dot number format. Click at the end of that line and press enter and you're going to tab and you're going to type end if. So it's only going to apply a currency format if the selection in the sales frame is not model. Otherwise it won't apply. If it is model, it won't apply to currency format. it will just be the number. And we're going to make a minor modification to our create pivot procedure. So I'm going to use my procedure list to navigate to that one. And then here in the set range data line, we're going to change the J one range to I one. So when it consolidates all the data, it's only filling the column I, we don't need it to say J there. So just another minor change. And now we're going to go ahead and compile and save. So two things we're going to do before we test this. I promised that I would double check our sub procedure, get sales by grouping. It's part of your built in class module for your form to determine whether the salesperson case should be one word or two words. It actually should be one word there. So I'm going to adjust that and I'm going to compile and save. And then I'm going to have you switch over to Excel and delete the sheet tab that you created that you named reports, which has the framework of the pivot table on it. So just delete that sheet tab because it's going to happen for us automatically when we test this. And once you do that, come back over to visual basic editor, and we're going to double click our form in the forms folder. And then we're going to press F five to run this form. We are going to select month in the period frame. And then go down to the bottom right to your combo box and select July. And in the sales frame, we're going to select salesperson. And then you're going to go ahead and click your display button. It's going to click and whir for a little bit on your screen. And finally, when it's done, now I'm getting a not responding message, but that'll clear we'll see that a message box will pop up that says Microsoft Excel will permanently delete this sheet. Do you want to continue? Now notice it created that reports sheet tab for us, and it just gathered all the information for the pivot table report. So we're going to tell it to delete this sheet. And when I switch back over to Excel, you'll notice that you're in a whole different file. This reports file has been sitting in the same directory as our sales fiscal year file. 
And it was a file that was in the video description. And what it did is first thing we're going to look at is the consolidate sheet tab. So all the stuff that it gathered together for the selections in the form, it put on the consolidate sheet tab, and then it created the reports sheet tab where your actual pivot table report is showing. So if we click on that pivot table report and you look at your fields list, the salesperson is being used as the filter field. We have make in columns, year in rows, and the sum of the selling price in values. And we're going to close this reports file without saving the changes. And you should still be in sales fiscal year and it doesn't have a report sheet tab. So we're going to test this again using different selections on the form. Let's do Alt F11 to get back to our form. And then we're going to make sure it's selected and press F5 to run it. And this time we'll, we'll still select month for and select July. But this time in the sales frame, we're going to select a model. And now we're going to choose display. So again, the clicking and worrying where it's running all those procedures and gathering the data. And you will ultimately get the message asking if you want to permanently delete this report sheet in sales fiscal year. And we're going to say delete. And then when you switch back over to Excel, it is in that reports file. And again, if you look at the consolidate sheet, it has all the data that was consolidated. And then we go to the report sheet. And this is where we put in that if statement, because when we select model, we said we don't want the count of the models to be formatted as currency. And you can see here, or the count, yeah, of the model colors, we don't want them to be formatted as currency. So they're not, they're just the count of the colors per model. And we can close the reports file without saving the changes. So now we're going to set up a way for the end user to display the form and make their choices without having to go into the code window. So we're going to add a button to the quick access toolbar that will show the form for the end user. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to go up to the quick access toolbar and currently mine just has save on it. And to the right of the save icon, there's a drop down arrow. And when you select the drop down arrow, you have a list of commands, but toward the bottom, you're going to select more commands and it opens up the customize the quick access toolbar Excel options window. Now on the right, it defaults to customize quick access toolbar for all documents. That's the default. Well, we want this button to only show in this document. So we're going to do the drop down next to for all documents. And we're going to choose for sales fiscal year. And then what we're going to do on the left side, we're going to access the drop down where it says choose commands from popular commands. And when we do that drop down, we see popular commands, commands not in the ribbon, all commands and macros. We're going to click on macros. Roll down in this list until you see the show form macro. We're going to select it. And then we're going to click the add button. So on the right, you should just have show form sitting there for this particular document on the bottom, right? So you notice all of these macros have that same symbol, right? We're going to change the symbol. So with show form selected on the right underneath on the right, you're going to click on the modify button, pick a symbol of your choice from the list of symbols that are showing there that you would like to have on the quick access toolbar for this. So I always like to do different ones than the default ones. I think for this one, I'm going to just pick, eh, I'll just pick the red circle. No, I'll do the colorful butterfly just for fun. 
So I'm going to click on the butterfly and click OK. And now you'll see the icon in front of show form. And at the bottom, you're going to click OK. So now you have that icon, whichever one you selected on your quick access toolbar. And when I click that icon, it actually brings up the form. So this is how the end users will be able to access the form and we can do cancel on our form. And you're going to go ahead and save your file. To recap lesson seven, we started by recording two separate macros in Excel to create a pivot table first, the framework of the pivot table, and then to create the fields that we want to use to populate the pivot table. So two separate macro recordings. Then we went into Visual Basic for applications and we created a pivot table programmatically. We had to create the pivot cache object first, and then we could tell it to create the pivot table. And we can do that in the same procedure, but we had to do a separate procedure to set the fields for the pivot table, just like we had to cre create two separate macro recordings, one for the framework of the pivot table and one to set the fields. After that, we spent some time finalizing our form by adding more code and we used some text files for some of the code that we added. We then reviewed some of those text files and their procedures therein. So you learned about the consolidate data procedure, grab cells function, and the finish report procedure and what they do in terms of the workflow here. And then we modified our click event procedure for the display command button by calling all of the other procedures that we created or we created via text file. And we added a line that said unload the form from memory once all of the other procedures have run. We saw when we tested everything and we tested it a couple of times that it gathers all the data and puts it on a reports sheet tab in the sales fiscal year file. And then it copies and pastes that data into a reports file in the same directory on its consolidate tab. And then it creates the pivot table on another tab in the reports file. And the pivot table displays the choices that were made on the form. And we ended up adding code to a button on the quick access toolbar in Excel. And I selected the butterfly icon. And that's the way the user will launch the form to make their selections to get their pivot table reports created. Thank you for attending Excel 2019 Visual Basic for Applications video course. Hi everyone, I'm Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to the Excel 2019 Visual Basic for Applications video course. This course is for beginning users looking to automate repetitive and recurring tasks in Microsoft Excel. VBA is Microsoft's programming language and it's built into the Office applications. Our focus during this course is on Excel specifically. You'll be equipped with the basics to start writing your own VBA code, modify the code behind macros you've already recorded, and have an understanding of how VBA lends itself to creating efficiency in your daily tasks. The course ends with you learning how to deal with code errors known as debugging and how to write error handling code. If you're enjoying these videos, please like and subscribe. If you want to earn certificates and digital badges, please become a member of our Patreon. The link is in our video description. If you have any questions you want answered by one of our instructors, please join our off-site community. The link is in the description as well. As always, if this course has exercise files, you'll find them in the video description below. In the last lesson of this video course, we'll be focusing on debugging code. 
we've already experienced some coding errors, also referred to as bugs during this course. As a matter of fact, if we haven't, we could consider ourselves lucky as errors and coding go hand in hand. Typos will happen, syntax may be overlooked, math errors may occur, and there are many more things that can cause code errors during program execution. This lesson will introduce you to the three types of errors that can occur during execution and the reasons why they occur. The process of tracing and correcting code errors is known as debugging. The Visual Basic Editor has a debug toolbar that can be used for this purpose. We'll also cover some tips for minimizing errors and what you can do if you cannot resolve them. And you'll see in this lesson why the structure of your code is important during the process of debugging. Code is easier to review when it's organized in a logical structure. So specifically, we will be covering the following topics. The types of coding errors and their causes, using the debug toolbar to investigate errors, and we'll be setting breakpoints, stepping through code, using break mode during run mode, and determining the value of expressions. Then we'll move on to handling errors where you'll gain an understanding of error handling and learning about VBA's error trapping options. We're going to get into trapping errors with the on error statement, which includes understanding the error object, writing an error handling routine, and working with inline error handling. As mentioned, you'll get tips for minimizing errors and tips on what to do if you cannot resolve them. And finally, you'll be introduced to the object browser window. And we'll review more detail about that when we get there. We're going to be using our sales fiscal year file in this lesson. There are only three types of errors that you may have in your Visual Basic for Applications code. So the first type is known as a logic error. And these are the most difficult errors to locate and Visual Basic will not help you find them. They're usually caused by typos and logic errors will not stop your code execution. Instead, you will have an unexpected outcome. For example, you may have used a minus sign instead of a plus sign in an expression. So it will calculate the expression, but you'll get an unexpected outcome because of the wrong operator that's being used. Then there are runtime errors. A runtime error happens when a line of code cannot be executed. The procedure is halted and a message box will display that defines the error. There is a help button in the message box that can be used to view the help topic associated with that specific type of runtime error. There are many types of runtime errors they're caused by if you divide by zero, that can't be done. If you reference a non-existent workbook or worksheet or other object and referencing an Excel cell that contains an error are a few examples of things that can cause a runtime error. And last but not least, you have syntax errors. Now these are detected by the line editor and the compiler. So as you're typing code, when you get to the end of a line and you press enter, if there is a syntax error in that line, the line will turn red. And examples that can cause this are incomplete expressions and missing arguments. And then syntax errors are also detected by the compiler. So all along we've been compiling and then saving and the compiler checks all lines of code in each procedure and all declarations within the project. If variable declaration is required, if we have that option explicit statement at the top of a module, the compiler will check that all variables are declared and that all objects have correct references to properties, methods, and events. It also checks constructs to ensure the correct required statements are present. So when you have a with block, you need to have the end with statement. When you have an if block, you need to have end if. The compiler will display a message box that describes the error if found. So I mentioned 
using the debug toolbar in the Visual Basic Editor to investigate errors. The tools that are on that toolbar can be categorized as follows. Tools that help you manually execute the program, tools that suspend the execution of the code, and tools that assist in determining the values of expressions. So there's an illustration of the debug toolbar and its tools. So the first set of tools would be the ones that could help you suspend the code. And then you have a set of tools that can help you manually execute the program. And that would start with like toggle breakpoint all the way through step out. And then the last group of tools, the window tools, I call them, are tools that assist in determining the values of expressions. So this slide is for your future reference. It's just a further description of the debugging tools and their shortcut keys, if any, and a description, a comprehensive description of each tool. Now, most debugging is done when the application is suspended and that's known as break mode. An application is in break mode when a runtime error occurs, a breakpoint is manually inserted into the code, or a stop statement is entered within the code. Some of the tools for debugging can be utilized in design mode and or at runtime, in addition to when the application is in break mode. So for example, the step into tool can be run in break mode and design mode. The immediate window can be run in break mode, design mode, or at runtime. And the watch window can be run in break mode and runtime. Now, before we do this next exercise, I just want to review and I increased the size of the font for three of the tools on the debugging toolbar. And those are the step tools. So we used step into earlier in the course, and we saw that that executed code one statement at a time, one line at a time. There's also the ability to step over code and that would execute code one procedure or one statement at a time. And then you have your step out option, which can overlook a called procedure and execute the remaining lines of the calling procedure. So you'll get more experience with step into, and you'll get new experience with step out in this next lesson. So we're going to start by creating a syntax error. And remember, these would be detected by the line editor when you get to the end of the line and you press enter or by compiling your project, which we've been doing all along. And when you compile, it compiles everything in the module. We're going to force this to happen. I'm in the visual basic editor for sales fiscal year. I'm in module one in the add totals procedure. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete the end if statement, and then I'm going to go up and compile the project. Now it gives me a compile error and it specifically tells me block if without end if. So I can click okay. And I'm going to put my end if statement back in. And then I'm going to compile again and I don't get the error. Let's do another one in the if line, we're going to change the not equal to symbol to an exclamation point, put an exclamation point there and now click out of that line. And when you click out of that line, the compile error comes up. It says expect it then or go to, and the entire line turns red. We're going to click okay and now go up and compile the project. And this time you get a compile error that says syntax error. So this one's a little bit more specific. It's letting you know there's some kind of syntax error in that line. And this is typical when you're clicking out of the line, it's the same as pressing enter at the end of it. And the line editor kicks in when you compile, then the compiler kicks in. This message is more specific. I'm going to click okay. And I'm going to change the exclamation point 
back to our not equal symbol and then I'm going to compile. So now I'm in mod reports and I used my procedure list to get to the consolidate data procedure. That's one that we brought in from a text file and we're going to go to the view menu, hover over toolbars and click on debug. So the debug toolbar comes up on the screen. Now we're looking for a specific line of code and before we find it, I'm going to decrease the width of the project explorer and properties panes on the left, because we're going to end up viewing this procedure side by side with the Excel workbook after we set our manual breakpoint. So we're going to scroll down in the procedure. It says select case. FRM generate reports dot period. When you find that line, you can be anywhere within it. And on the debug toolbar, if you hover over the hand icon, you'll see that it says toggle breakpoint and it gives you the shortcut key, which is F nine. I'm going to just click the hand and it turns that line maroon and it puts a maroon oval in the gray bar to the left of the line. That is indicative of a manual breakpoint. When you set a manual breakpoint and you execute the code, it will execute it up until the breakpoint. And then it goes into what's known as break mode, as you'll see in a moment. So I'm going to arrange this so that my editor window is on the right side of my screen and I have my Excel file on the left side of my screen. And in the Excel file, I'm going to go ahead and start this procedure by running the show form procedure from the quick access toolbar. So it's going to bring up the form and in the period frame, I'm going to select month and then choose August from the combo list. And I'm going to select salesperson in the sales frame and click display. So if you notice on your Excel screen, the reports sheet has been created, but it's not populated. And if you look at your editor screen, now that line that where we set the manual breakpoint has yellow shading and a yellow arrow in the gray border to the left of it. And so it ran all the code up until it gets to that line. And now it's in what's called break mode. Now that we're in break mode, we can use our step tools. I'm going to just display my debug toolbar again, and your step tools are to the right of the hand. So there's your step into that does line by line. You have step over, which goes procedure by procedure or statement by statement. And then you have step out that would skip any called procedures or just execute the rest of the code as one block. So the first thing we're going to do is step into, and it goes down to the next line and we'll do step over at this point. That's still within that for each block. We're going to step over again. It goes down to compare, which is another statement. We're going to step over again and it goes to the next statement. And now go ahead and click on step out and it runs the rest of the code. And you can see that it's going through your Excel workbook and ultimately you'll get the pop-up asking if you want to permanently delete the report sheet in the sales fiscal year, I'm going to go ahead and click delete and it opened the reports file and gave me my pivot table. We're going to go ahead and close the reports file and don't save the changes. And I'm going to just maximize the visual basic editor window again. I'm going to expand my project explorer window so that I can get back to mod reports and notice it didn't remove our breakpoint. So I'm going to click in that line and consolidate data procedure and go click the hand again to get rid of the breakpoint. And typically after using these processes, I go ahead and click the reset button on the debug toolbar 
just to make sure there's nothing lingering in memory. You can go ahead and save. So now I'm going to challenge you and give you an on your own exercise. In the same consolidate data procedure, I'm going to have you set the breakpoint again at the same line, select case FRM generate reports dot period. And then I want you to execute the show form procedure until the program enters break mode. So go ahead and pause the video and do those things. At this point, and I have my windows side by side again, the program has halted execution at the point where it created the report sheet. And now we can look at a couple of the window debug tools. So with my debug toolbar, to the right of your step tools are your window tools. So the first one we're going to select is the locals window, and it opens in a pane on the lower half of the editor window. And what it's showing you is the current value of any variables. If you look at mod reports under expression, it has a plus sign. When you expand it, you'll see your public variables and their values at this point. It also on the right tells you the type of variable. So the locals window will show you that when you're in break mode. And I just collapsed mod reports again. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and press F8. So it's at my break line. I'm going to press F8. So it steps into the code and I'm going to F8 until I get down to the on error resume next statement. So now there's a, in the expression window, the value of compare, the compare expression is reports. If I hover over compare in the code window, you can see that it's letting me know the value of that variable right in the code window when it's in break mode. In that compare line in the code window, I'm going to have you select the function C date, which is a conversion function, right? Converts the date on the sheet tab, the date, the text string of the date on the sheet tab to an actual date. So we're starting with the letter C in C date. And we're going to highlight it until we get to the first closing parenthesis after compare. So just the function and its argument in parentheses is selected on your debug window. The next to the last icon is quick watch another window. So when we have that expression selected, it gives us the context. So it lets us know the VBA project mod reports, consolidate data procedure, the expression itself. And then its value is a type mismatch because there's text on the sheet tab, and then we're converting it to a date. So quick watch gives you different information than can show in your locals window. And we're going to close the quick watch window. And you can use the X to close the locals window. And now what you can do is you can go ahead, step out of your code. And I deleted the report sheet and I'm going to close the reports workbook without saving the changes. And I'll just maximize my editor window again. We're going to start forcing some runtime errors to happen. And it is best practice to write error trapping code to try to avoid runtime errors. You might not be able to avoid all of them, but it will be helpful to avoid as many as possible. Error trapping options are set in the options dialog box in the editor where we set the require variable declaration earlier and changed our font size to review those options before we get into error handling. They're listed on this slide. So there's three options. You can break on all errors. 
So that means even if you've written error handling code, a break in execution will occur if a runtime error is encountered. So it really disables any error handling code that you've written. Break in class module, the execution will break and an error message will display when an unhandled error occurs within a class module. This option is only useful for debugging. And then you have break on unhandled errors. The execution will break and an error message will display when any unhandled error occurs. And again, we'll review those options as we go over our next set of exercises. There are some methods to error handling. In Visual Basic for Applications, an on error statement is used to enable what's called an error trap. If an error is generated after this statement is executed, the error handler becomes active and passes control to the code on the on error statement that it's is specified. And there are two types of on error statements, on error go to and on error resume next. I have the syntax. So for on error go to, then there's a corresponding line label and then on error resume next. Once an on error statement traps an error, the error can be handled in one of three ways. You could write an error handler. This is a routine that is pointed to in the on error go to statement line label. The line label statements address one or more types of errors for the procedure. Another method is ignoring the error. And that's what happens when you use the on error resume next statement to trap the error and handle it by moving to the next line of code. And then you have inline error handling, and that's also on error resume next. You can use it to trap the error. You enter code in the procedure to check for errors after any statements that are expected to generate them. You'll see in the upcoming exercise that the error object can be used to examine information about an error that has just occurred. The error object has a global scope and has properties and methods that are useful for finding out information about the current error, clearing error information, and generating errors. The properties contain information about the error that just occurred in the current procedure. So you have a number property, and it's the identification number of the most recent error, and numbers represent different types of errors. You have a description property, which describes the error and corresponds to the error number. And then you have a source property, which is a name that identifies the component module and or procedure that generated the error. And all three of those properties have data types as listed on this slide. The error object only has two methods, clear and raise. Clear resets all the error object's properties to zero or zero length strings. This method is used automatically when any on error statement is encountered. And then you have the raise method, which generates a runtime error. And it can specify the number of an error defined by VBA, Excel, or another application such as Word. And you're like, what is she talking about? Well, it'll start making sense when we start doing it, which is going to be right now. We're going to start by causing a situation that will lead to a runtime error. So I'm in my working directory. And what we're going to do is we're going to rename the Excel file called reports. We're going to just name it reports with the number two. And now I'm going to bring up my sales fiscal year file. In Excel, I'm going to start the show form procedure from the quick access toolbar. I'm going to select all for period and model in the sales frame and click display. Eventually you'll get the runtime error has an error number one zero zero four. Sorry, we couldn't find my path reports.xlsx. Is it possible it was moved, renamed, or deleted? And we're going to click the debug button on that message. So it takes us over to mod reports to the sub procedure finish report. 
and the error is being caused when it tries to execute that workbook dot open file name line because it's looking for a file named reports. Now I'm going to go up to the standard toolbar and I'm going to click the reset button. I'm going to go then go back to mod reports and notice that it cleared that break in the code for us. So now before we write error handling code, I want to show you the options that are available for you. We saw them on a the slide. So I'm going to go up to the tools menu and choose options. And when I get in there at top, I'm going to go to the general tab. And on the right side, you have your error trapping options. So remember break on all errors really means ignore any error handling code that you would write. Your other choices are break in class module or break on unhandled errors. I usually use break on unhandled. Can't really say usually, it just depends on what kind of project I'm working on. And I'm going to click OK to get out of there. So now we're going to modify this finish report sub procedure by using the on error go to statement. So we're going to click at the end of our variable declaration line, dem sheet as worksheet, press enter a couple of times, and then you're going to type on error go to, and go to is one word here, and then error handler. In this example, error handler is what we're calling our line statement. So on error, go to error handler. We're going to go down and click at the end of the set fields called procedure and press enter. And on this line, we're going to type exit sub and I'll explain it after we get the rest of this in. We're going to press enter a couple of times and then we're going to type error handler. What we named our line label followed by a colon, enter, and we're going to do a select case statement here. So let select case, and we're going to do air dot, and the list pops up and we're going to select number. So that's the property of the air object. So select case air num number, enter tab, and then we're going to say case 1004, that's the number of the runtime error we got. So case 1004, enter tab, message box, and in parentheses and quotes, the reports workbook is not available. Period, close your quotes, close the paren. Enter, we're gonna outdent, and we're gonna do case else, enter, tab message box again. And this one is going to say error number. We're going to do a concatenated statement here, colon space, double quote, our ampersand for concatenation, error dot number again, ampersand. We're going to do VBLF, which is line feed. We're going to do an ampersand and we're going to do our line continuation character of space underscore enter tab in double quotes error description colon space double quote space ampersand and air dot description. So another property of the error object there. And we're going to close the parentheses. We're going to enter and outdent until we get to the same margin as select case and we need our end select statement there. And now we'll break down what we just did. So using on error go to, what we've done is we said if there's an error when this procedure runs, go to our line. So error handler is the line what we what we named it. So if there is an error, it's going to go down. And before it gets to that line, it's going to exit the sub procedure. Now this is only if there's an error. 
We don't want it to try to keep running the sub procedure. We wanted to exit the sub procedure and go to the error handler. So we did a select case statement. If the error number is 1004, it's going to show a message box saying the reports workbook is not available. If it's a different error number, it's going to show a message box that gives the error number. And then on the next line, the error description, both are pulled from the error object. So that's how you can trap this error. Go ahead and compile and save. Before we test this error handling code, we need to switch back over to Excel and delete the reports sheet tab. Confirm your deletion. And now what we're going to do is go ahead and la launch the show form procedure again. I'm going to select the same selections, all model and display. And this time, instead of getting a runtime error, we get our pop-up because it was error number 1004. The reports workbook is not available. You can go ahead and click OK on that message box. Now this time we're going to leave the reports sheet here. And what I'd like you to do is go back to your working directory and rename reports to back to reports and then come back over here to your sales fiscal year file. Now that we have the file renamed, we're going to set up a situation where we will use inline error handling by using the on error resume next statement. In your file, go ahead and launch the show form again. And this time I'm going to select month and choose July. And I'll just do salesperson in the sales frame and display. We're getting runtime error, another 1004. That name is already taken. Try a different one. And we're going to select debug. So it brings us to the consolidate data sub procedure where activesheet.name equals reports. Well, remember when we're running this procedure, it has been creating the report sheet for us. It's already there. So we're getting this runtime error because you can't have two sheet names with the same name reports. We're going to go ahead and use our reset button on the toolbar. And I'm going to make my way back to mod reports and I'm still in the consolidate data procedure. And after our variable declarations, we are going to press enter after dim sheet as worksheet a couple of times. And we're going to type on era resume next. And then we're going to go down to the line that says active sheet dot name equals report. Click at the end of it and press enter a couple of times and tab. And we're going to type an if statement here. So if and then air dot number equals 1004, then enter and tab active sheet dot delete sheets on the next line. And in parentheses, double quotes, reports dot cells dot select enter selection dot clear enter air dot clear. That's the clear method of the error object. So clear out the error enter. And then I'm going to shift tab to outdent and type my end if statement. And you want to go ahead and compile and save. So because the report sheet was already there, when it ran this, it created a new sheet. So if I go look at Excel, I have this empty sheet three. And so what this is saying, and that's the active sheet. If after it goes to active sheet dot name equals report, and it gets that error, it's going to say active sheet delete. 
which is that generic sheet. And then it's going to select the report sheet and all of its cells and clear everything off of that sheet. And then it's going to clear the error as well. So that's what this one is going to do. Let's switch over to Excel. And the first thing we're going to do is get rid of that extra sheet before the report sheet, just delete it and go ahead and launch your form and we'll do month July again here. And I think I'm going to do model and display. So now it's letting us know that it's going to delete this sheet. Now I'm on sheet four and we're going to select delete to confirm it. And then it's going to go through the process. And you'll get your second delete prompt to delete the reports sheet. And now you have your reports workbook open with the pivot table. That one covers the case of if you forget to delete the report sheet from sales fiscal year, we are trapping the error and resuming the rest of the code. You can close the reports workbook without saving the changes. So I promised you some tips for minimizing errors and also some tips on what to do if you can't resolve an error. I'm going to just stop talking and let you review this slide. Hopefully some of these tips will help you avoid errors and some of what to do if you can't resolve them. These are from my personal experience. Oftentimes, if I ask someone else to look at my code or I'm explaining the issue I'm having with it, the explanation will become clear to me during that process. Or someone else might look at it and instantly see what's causing the error. The object browser allows you to browse through all available objects in your project and see their properties, methods, and events. In addition, you can see the procedures and constants that are available from object libraries in your project. You can also get online help as you browse in the object browser. So you've already noticed some icons in the editor environment, particularly in the list that are displayed. And you'll see those icons in the object browser window as well. So I've given you a table here with the icons and what they represent. Within the Visual Basic Editor, I can go to the View menu and choose Object Browser. Its shortcut key is F2. And so it opens kind of like in its own window. And notice at the top, it says all libraries. If you do the drop down there, you could just see the Excel library or the Microsoft Forms library or Office or VBA or VBA project. I'm going to select VBA project. And so this is our project. And what it's showing on the left side under classes, these are the objects that are in our VBA project. So it's showing all those worksheets and it's showing our form. If I click on FRM generate reports, then it shows you things. So these are properties, events, methods. It's our objects, our controls like month and period and sales. Those are our frames. So you're seeing everything that's in your project. As I continue to scroll down, I see the click event for the cancel button and the display button. So you're seeing events, properties, all of those things and methods that make everything kind of work together. And some of those properties we didn't use on the objects on our form. Like we didn't use the print form property, but it's available because it's in the VBA project library. So if I click on CMD display click on the right hand side and I look almost at the bottom of the screen, 
It just lets me know that it's a private sub procedure and it's a member of the form generate reports that we created. And you can feel free to explore the object browser. If there's anything in there that you want more information on, you can click on it and then you'll have your help icon up here in the upper right. So you can explore help topics from in here as well. And to close the object browser, I'm going to use the second close window, the smaller one in the upper right hand corner of the screen to close the object browser. Our last topic in this course concerns how to protect your code. So if you have end users using this Excel file and they have the developer tab or they know how to switch over to Visual Basic for Applications Editor, you may not want people to be able to access your code. So you can password protect it. It's kind of a two-step process. So you're going to go in the Visual Basic Editor, you're going to go to the Tools menu, and you'll notice on the list you have an option for VBA Project Properties. Let's click it. There are two tabs. You're on the General tab. You're going to go to the Protection tab, and you're going to check the box that says Lock Project for Viewing, and then you have to give it a password and confirm it. For training purposes, I'm going to just use the word Train in all lowercase, and I'm going to click OK. And then I'm going to save. Now you're going to have to close both Visual Basic and your Excel file for this to take effect. So go ahead and close both of these windows and then reopen your sales fiscal year macro enabled file. Once you have your file reopened, you can Alt F11 to get back into the Visual Basic Editor. If you expand your sales fiscal year VBA project, you'll see that it prompts you for your password. And those who do not have the password will not be able to see the objects, forms, and modules and access them. So again, once you set your password, you need to save and enclose VBA and Excel and reopen the file for that password protection to take effect. To recap this lesson, we started by going over the different types of coding errors and their causes. You learned how to use the debug toolbar to investigate errors. We set breakpoints. We used our step debugging tools. We entered break mode during run mode, and we used the locals window and quick watch to determine the value of expressions and variables. When it comes to handling errors, we got an overview of error handling and VBA's error trapping options. And then we moved on to trapping errors with the on error statement. We learned about the error object and its methods and properties. We wrote an error handling routine by using on error go to with a line handler. And we also worked with inline error handling. Um, actually, sorry, I got the map opposite. The error handling routine was the on error resume next and the inline error handling was on error go to. We reviewed some tips for minimizing errors and what to do if you can't get them resolved. We did a quick tour of the object browser. When you're new to VBA, that can be very helpful so you can learn about different properties and methods that are available for different objects. And then we end it with password protecting your code. Thank you for attending Excel 2019 Visual Basic for Applications video course. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit LearnIt.com for more details. Please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing LearnIt.